Chapter 13 Human society is in good shape, but more importantly, I want seaweed. The region ruled by Viscount Balchus was experiencing an unexpected period of prosperity. This was because the project to reclaim the Devil's Nest Forest three days journey from the town was proceeding smoothly. Most of the powerful monsters living there had already been hunted down, and even when monsters did appear, it was usually an orc or two wielding thick tree branches as clubs. The hired adventurers had no problem dealing with them. The soldiers cut down the trees and earth attribute magic was cast by mages to make the ground flat and to crush the rocks into smaller pieces, making them easier to transport. It hadn't even been half a year since the reclamation began, but not even a quarter of the original Devil's Nest remained. The reclamation would continue until snow began falling and the rich soil would be cultivated. Water wells, reservoirs and irrigation channels would be dug into the ground and the preparations to set up multiple farming villages would be complete. With the coming of spring, people would immigrate and gather here, houses would be built and seeds would be planted in the ground. Considerable harvests could be expected on the first year cultivating the land of the Devil's Nest so the inhabitants cultivating the land would need little assistance. Once the tax exemption period ended, plenty of taxes would enter the purse of Viscount Balchus. In ten years' time, not only would he have recouped the costs of reclaiming the land, he would have made a profit. It had even been decided that the Viscount's third son would take the position of governing the reclaimed land. Of course, it was not only the Viscount and his vassals that were making a profit here. Those immigrating to live in the farming villages that would soon be built. The inhabitants of slums who were unable to find jobs, sons of farming families who couldn't inherit their families' fields because of the order in which they had been born, adventurers who had been forced to retire due to reasons such as injury or age and other people like these would also benefit. Thanks to this reclamation project they would be able to own their own houses and fields, get married and have families, and building farming villages would mean that guards would need to be organized to protect them, so the budget and number of available positions in the army would increase. Churches for Elder, the god of law and fate, would also be built so there would be more positions available for those involved with the church. The Viscount's region had been reliant on trading with other regions to obtain produce up until now, but if they people could harvest their own crops, they would be able to obtain fresh produce for cheaper prices. And the town closest to the reclaimed land would be supplying the villagers with goods and daily necessities, lining the people's pockets even further. Everyone would be receiving the blessings of this time of prosperity. Even people living outside Viscount Balchus's region were benefiting. Immigrants were being recruited from slums elsewhere in an effort to reduce poverty. The ones not benefiting would be the adventurers and Marshal Palpebeck. However, even though they were not benefiting largely, that didn't mean that they were being set back by this project, either. The adventurers had lost the Devil's Nest Forest as a place they could earn money. But there had always been a larger Devil's Nest that was even closer to Viscount Balchus's town. It wasn't a large problem for a small devil's nest with no dungeons that took three days to reach on foot to disappear. Marshal Thomas Palpebeck had been criticized harshly by the finance minister and resigned from his position of marshal in order to clear away the accusations that he had some kind of illegal backroom deal with the reclamation project. But though the Shield Nation's government couldn't publicly commend Palpebeck due to how things had turned out, it was true that the nation had benefited from these events. And though his failure had been an unprecedented event, it didn't produce any casualties. So it was expected that he would be reappointed to his position after the commotion surrounding the reclamation project died down, or even if it didn't, he would be reappointed within the next ten years. The Palpebeck family of earls didn't have a monopoly over the position of marshal, three families of earls would take turns filling the position in periods ranging from a few years to over a decade. This was because if the position was owned by a single family and that family's head and his heir were to be suddenly assassinated, the army would lose its chief executive. With other families filling the marshal position generation after generation, marshals supported by knowledgeable vassals could be prepared if such a thing were to happen. It seemed like a callous approach, but the nation had been at war repeatedly with neighboring nations since its foundation. 
There was no room for naivety. The Palpebeck family of earls had produced the most exceptional marshals among the three families that filled this role, even now. Thomas was striving to be known as a protective god of the nation. In fact, several vassals of the Palpebeck family of earls were planning to enlist to become guards for the new farming villages that would be built. Even they were benefiting from these events. That was why nobody was at a loss from this reclamation project. Everyone was benefiting. On the surface, at least, has a route through the mountain range still not been mapped out yet? Eleonora, in a room of an inn in the town reserved for the upper class, the red-haired noble-born vampire Eleonora was sitting in a chair with a seemingly, no, a very clearly scornful gaze directed at Sir Crent, who was wearing a sour expression. The wounds on his face and body from the merciless punishment that Burkine had inflicted on Sir Crent had healed completely, leaving no scars behind, however, it seemed that he found the rage induced by the words spoken by the woman in front of him to be more unbearable than the pain of that torture. Do you even understand how difficult the request you are making is? Sir Crent. However, Sir Crent exercised the all of the patience he possessed to control his rage, though this was a high-class establishment. It was still just an inn, not a castle or building owned by vampires. He couldn't raise his voice to be heard in the nearby rooms and corridors. Oh, but didn't the humans accomplish that just two hundred years ago? Eleonora, two hundred years ago is different from now, and why do we even have to avoid monsters as much as possible in the first place? That is where we are different from the humans. Sir Crent. Sir Crent and Eleonora were both noble-born vampires. Their ability in battle surpassed that of lesser dragons, and could even be compared to fire dragons and ice dragons. They also possessed various special abilities that dragons did not have, and as their bodies were in the same shape as those of humans, they were able to move around very dexterously. Of course, they had weaknesses as well. The sun, silver, offensive light attribute spells and anti-vampire magic items created by the followers of the god Elder. However, when crossing the mountain range, the only thing they would have to be careful about was the sunlight. There were monsters that cast light attribute spells, but most of these spells would be flashes of light to blind the enemy, deceiving illusion spells and spells that removed all light from a space in order to create an opportunity for a surprise attack in the dark. These wouldn't be a threat for vampires. Even if they didn't bother finding a route that would let them avoid monsters, they would probably lose a few subordinate vampires crossing the mountain range, but that would be the extent of their losses. However, Eleonora gave an exasperated sigh. Sir Crent, your foolishness is beyond help. Eleonora, what did you say? Sir Crent, how skillful of you to shout while still keeping quiet but it would be troublesome if you don't use your brain more than just for that. Eleonora, Eleonora treated Sir Grant with none of the ladylike behavior that she had displayed in front of Burkine, this was her true self. She was showing that there was no need to keep up appearances with Sir Grant. Did you forget the information that you reported yourself? The target damper is a spiritualist, isn't he? With that being the case, he'd be able to obtain information about us from the spirits of the monsters we kill won't he? Eleonora. Th that may be possible, but that would normally be quite difficult, didn't you conclude that spiritualists aren't capable of anything significant with your own investigations? Sir Crent, there weren't many who possessed the spiritualist job, it is a job that is completely unsuitable for battle, and it does not enable the creation of items or products, either, it only enables communication with the dead fortune-telling and small exorcisms. Because of this, the number and popularity of spiritualists was quite low. That was why Eleonora was planning to use her inherent skills to obtain information about spiritualists from the Adventurers Guild and a spiritualist in person while Sir Grant was to find a route across the Boundary Mountain range. And do you think that the spirits of the monsters would seek the damper of their own accord? Sir Crent. Spiritualists are capable of seeing and conversing with spirits, using necromancy to summon the spirits of the dead and reading residual memories. Though it was impressive that they overturned the rule of dead men tell no tales, it is not as if all spirits are friendly towards spiritualists and they are unable to tame undead. 
Sir Krent thought that a spiritualist wouldn't be such a large threat if caution was taken against them, but Eleonoro had a different opinion. And what will we do if he is capable of something significant? The information I gathered only applies to normal spiritualists. This damp has been accomplishing unprecedented things one after another, hasn't he? Doesn't that make you think that he might not be a normal spiritualist? Eleonora Sir Krend had no response to these words other than to nod. For example, what if he was able to summon only spirits that met certain conditions among a large group of spirits? If the damp was able to summon spirits holding malice against those who meant to do him harm, the Boundary Mountain Range was not only a sturdy wall but a garrison of faithful guards for him. Eleonora did think that such a thing would be impossible, but this damp had already done plenty of things that were considered impossible, and as a result, the man before her eyes was on the edge of a dangerous cliff. If she underestimated the damp, she would be joining him on the edge of that cliff. So make sure you plan our route properly. To think that you wouldn't understand these things if I didn't explain them to you. If you don't understand things, can you at least have the obedience to listen to what I say despite not understanding? Eleonora being reprimanded in a way even worse than simply being told outright that he was incompetent, Sir Grant ground his fangs together, but for the vampires who followed the teachings of the evil god of joyful life, this kind of conversation was extremely commonplace, their personal relationships with each other generally only amounted to whether the others were superior or inferior to themselves, they used words like equals, companions, brethren and siblings, but they only judged and thought of others as above or below them, it was simple when the hierarchical difference was clearly established, like the difference between a pure reed and a noble born or the difference between a noble born and a subordinate, however, things got very bloody very quickly between pure reed vampires or noble born vampires with others in better positions than them. They would take any opportunity they could to bring the others down and raise themselves above with others below them, they would emphasize their superiority and make the others obey, trampling them underfoot to make sure they didn't get any funny ideas, and when those hierarchical differences of who was superior and who was inferior had not yet been decided, they fought in various ways to establish those differences. And though Eleonora was a genius, only several years had passed since she had become a vampire while Sir Krent had spent a considerably long time as a vampire. Though Eleonora was a little stronger than him, the difference between them wasn't a large one. However, Sir Krent had been criticized harshly for his failure by Burkine and almost all of the important figures in the community had seen him in an extremely pitiful state. He had received no protection or support from Gubberman, his parent. There were orders that he was to be killed if he failed again, that was why he was in a vastly inferior position to Eleonora. As long as he was in an inferior position, Eleonora would have to keep kicking him down, if she didn't, then that would mean that she wasn't superior to this fallen man, in short, she would be viewed as inferior to him. All right, I'll make the subordinates work faster, Sir Krent, if it seems that it will take some time. Perhaps you should ask Elder Kibberman for any suggestions, he was involved with the events of two hundred years ago, wasn't he? He might know something that would be helpful here. Eleonora, I'll take that into consideration. Sir Krent Seeing Sir Krent say these words over his shoulder and leave the room, disappearing behind the door, Eleonora whispered, Sorry, but I don't want to be dragged down with you. Eleonora Eleonora no longer felt hunger and had gained the power that would allow her to fight against even a dragon without dirtying her own body in the process, but the color of fear was visible in her eyes, because she understood that if she failed, she would be the next to stand in Sir Grant's position. The final day spent training to acquire the chant revocation skill was the seventh day of training. Ooh, I have finally acquired the chant revocation skill. This is yet another warm gift of generosity from the Holy Son. Nuaza TLN, turns out it really was the undead titans learning the skill. Fixed previous chapter, Nuaza raised his arms that were supposed to be made of skin and bone but were now thick and muscular up in the air as he let out a happy shout. Ha, huh, it seems that I have been beaten to it. Zadiris, ha ha ha, though I am a lesser lich, I am still a lich, after all. Nuaza, well. I am a ghoul mage, 
and I even possess the mage job. Zadirus, Zadirus seemed envious of the proud new Arza. She still hadn't managed to learn the trick behind using the skill. Monsters do gain bonuses and penalties to skills based on their race. They aren't as remarkable as the bonuses a person would get from acquiring a job. It is simply a matter of being suited or unsuited to certain skills. Orcs are strong, kobolds are agile and so on. So the fact that Nuaza had acquired the chant revocation skill before Zadirus meant that he possessed more aptitude for the chant revocation skill than her, or that he possessed more relevant knowledge. Incidentally, it is a fact that talent in this world allows those who possess it to level up more easily, increase their ranks quickly and learn and develop skills more quickly than normal. However, that doesn't mean that hard work isn't important. Both people and monsters level up through training and diligent study, and can increase their rank by meeting certain conditions. They can even learn skills through hard work. However, it was a matter of when. Even if someone with genius talent in wielding a sword were to acquire a level 5 skill in swordsmanship within a year, a normal person might be able to reach the same level with years or decades of dedicated training. Even a particularly unintelligent, weak goblin would be able to become a goblin king, though that would require it to put in tireless effort for almost its entire lifespan. It is possible when an adventurer with a superhuman talent studies diligently and gains experience with various things, he becomes an A-class adventurer capable of defeating dragons and fully clearing high difficulty dungeons. An adventurer with meager talent may only end up as a D-class adventurer even with the same amount of hard work and experience. However, if he puts in ten times or even a hundred times the work of the adventurer with superhuman talent, his hard work and tenacity may be rewarded with the achievement of becoming an A-class adventurer. In the majority of cases, the hard work is interrupted before it can be rewarded. There are few who can obstinately strive for the top while sacrificing everything else in their lives to do so. There are plenty who give up and turn their attention towards other endeavors. In the case of adventurers and monsters, many die or are forced to retire due to serious injury before their hard work produces any results. The law of survival of the fittest applies to everyone. Added like the type of protagonists who overcome genius with hard work when I was on earth, though, as Vandali absent-mindedly made acorn powder while supplying everyone with mana, he realized that to everyone else, he must seem like a genius rather than an ordinary person. Having a vast amount of mana was a great talent in and of itself, he had been an ordinary person on earth and his talent had never been rewarded in origin, so he didn't really get the feeling that this was the case, however. Now then, I think that if you use chant revocation to cast spells the skill will level up, so please return to your normal training. Vandali. Mew. Now that it has come to this, I feel a little reluctant. Nuaza. Fufafu. You can go to the dungeons and devil's nests anytime now. Zadirus, Nuaza seemed disappointed, while Zadirus gave an ill-mannered laugh. It seemed that Vandalie's mana made those under the influence of his death attribute charm feel a very pleasant sensation. Well, since my one week break is over today, I'm thinking of going into a dungeon tomorrow. Vandali. What? Zadirus, Zadirus was surprised, and Nuaza was the one to give an ill-mannered laugh this time. Their positions had been reversed. B-boy, do you not think that it would be wise to rest a little longer? Zadirus, I want experience points, not rest. And there are materials that I want to get my hands on as well. Vandali. The next dungeon Vandali planned to clear was Durin's aquatic cavern. It was a D-class dungeon like Garin's Valley, but it also had many flaws and its monsters were considered stronger than those of Garin's Valley and dangerous traps appeared more frequently. It was also the dungeon that had supplied Taylor Shyam with its marine products. Many of the floors in Drun's aquatic caverns were arranged as caves containing underground lakes with islands of various sizes and underground rivers, but the water of the rivers was salt water and inhabited by creatures that would normally be found in oceans. Vandalie hadn't been particularly fond of seafood on Earth, but right now there was an ingredient that he had to get his hands on no matter what. He wanted kombu, 
wokame one or any kind of seaweed that could substitute for those. I tried making miso soup with the acorn miso, but it didn't turn out well for some reason. That reason is because I don't have dashi 2 TLN, 1 species of edible seaweed 2 Japanese soup stock made from fish and kelp. Vandali had made miso soup for himself as a student on earth, but he didn't use dashi back then either. He had tried to reproduce that miso soup in Lambda, but for some reason it was clearly worse than when he had made it on earth. Perhaps there was a problem with the tools he was using to make the soup, or perhaps the miso made from walnuts and acorns weren't suited to be used in soups. Giving it some thought, he had come to a sudden realization. The miso soup he had on earth had contained dashi, the miso he had used back then contained dashi to begin with, but the miso soup he was making now was handmade, dashi less miso, there was no way that he could create delicious miso soup this way, he had come to the conclusion that to make delicious miso soup, dashi needed to be used as a base, and with dashi, he would also need kachiboshi, dried sardines and kombu. He had to obtain these from Durin's aquatic caverns. The kombu was the most important one. TLN, dried, fermented and smoked skipjack tuna. It was possible that the culture of eating seaweed didn't exist in the continent of Barn Gaia. At the very least, it didn't on the Amid Empire side of the continent. Dasa, Sam and the others had never heard of eating seaweed before, so Vandali wanted to at least try spreading the idea. Even on Earth. Only certain regions and people had the culture of eating seaweed including Japan, so there couldn't be many people eating seaweed in this world. Since it seemed unlikely that he would be able to obtain these ingredients in the Orborn Kingdom, he needed to obtain them and experiment while he could. Kachibushi would need preparations in order for the smoking process, so he wanted to obtain the kombu first. Also, Wakame and Norai won. Norai was a necessity for Sushi, Raymond, Suman 2 and Anagairi. He also wanted Tengasa 3 to make vegetable gelatin. TLN, 1. Yet another kind of edible seaweed, the type that's pressed into flat sheets and used for sushi and stuff. 2. Thin, white Japanese noodles made of wheat flour, often served cold. 3. A kind of algae that is used to make the white jelly stuff used in various Asian foods. Zadiris. I need kombu. I need it to make delicious miso soup. Vandali. No, I think it is plenty delicious as it is. Zadiris. I think so too, but the Holy Sun seems to have a strong ambition to reach new heights. New Uzza. I would say the boy is quite the glutton rather than that he has strong ambitions. Zadiris. It seemed that Vandali's passion for food wasn't shared by the others. However, Everyone's opinions would change once they tasted miso soup containing dashi. In fact, Vandali himself had given a strong reaction upon trying miso soup before he tried making it himself. Ah, I forgot to think about the tools for making it. The next day, Vandali entered Durin's aquatic caverns. The members joining him this time were Sam, Braga, Zran, Kaka and Vigoro. TLN, in case your memory is as bad as mine. Zran is an undead titan scout that initially volunteered to join Vandali in his dungeon adventures in chapter 34. Sam had been brought along because of his ability to carry things and because he wanted to test his new equipment. The black goblin Braga had increased his rank and was joining him to test out his strength. Zran, who had formerly been a rare scout among the titans, was acting as Braga's supervisor. Kaka had been brought along as a frontline fighter and Vigro who was clearly excess firepower to bring into a D-class dungeon, was here for safety reasons just in case anything happened. They entered the first floor to find fish. Catch the fish. Titan. Fish sauce. Fish sailor or Titan. The undead titans catching small fish using nets. I've seen this scene before. Vandali. We can't help it, holy son. It's all for the fish sauce. Titan. The one making it is me, though. Vandali. The hunters of Taylorsheim had originally ignored the small fish. Fish smaller than 50 centimeters in length were incredibly small to titans, had few edible parts and didn't sell for much. They had been better off spending their time catching the big ones that were over 2 meters long. 
That was apparently how they had thought back then. Fish sauce was the thing that had overturned the large fish supremacy movement. Undead titans charmed by its taste had appeared one after another just like they had after being charmed by miso, and there were many who had been farmers while they were alive but had now become fishermen instead. Incidentally, they were still reliant on the rock salt in Grins Valley as a source of salt. The water in Grins aquatic caverns was seawater, so it was possible to make sea salt from it, but unlike the rock salt that could simply be carried off and used after being mined, sea salt would take time and effort to make. If they simply let the water dry off they wouldn't be able to remove the impurities from the salt, and it would be impossible to build salt evaporation ponds inside the dungeon. Sunlight didn't even reach inside the dungeon in the first place. With that being the case, the next logical step would be to carry the salt water outside the dungeon, but that would be difficult. Of course, it would be fine if it were just a few sacks full of water, but transporting the salt water en masse would require containers like barrels, and the titans would be defenseless if monsters were to attack them while they were carrying those barrels, and if the barrels were damaged and the water was spilled, it would all be for naught. That was why the titans of Taylorsheim hadn't used the salt water here for their salt, though there was one occasion in the past in which the second princess Zandia had used space attribute magic to transport seawater outside to turn into salt. With that being the case, I'll collect some salt water before we clear the dungeon. Vandali. Huh. Why was he going out of his way to do this when there was rock salt available? As this question passed through the minds of everyone here. Vandali nimbly rolled the barrels that were loaded in Sam's carriage. Get up. Get in. Vandali turning the pure salt water running down next to the path into Aquagulums. He ordered them to enter the barrels. It was difficult to maintain the shape of gulums made of liquid, but it was possible to have them enter these nearby barrels that were lying on their sides. Now he just needed to carry them, but, get up. Vandali, with a loud rumble. The wall of the corridor began to move and became rocky golems that picked up the barrels. Now then, please head to Taylorsheim. Vandali. And then they lumbered off. Golem transmutation was a truly convenient skill. Vandali. What are you going to do with the salt water? Vigro. Rock salt has a different taste from sea salt. Vandali. Really? Vigro. Vigro gave Vandali a puzzled look, but Vandali assured him that he would notice the difference if he tried both. He was going through this effort to turn the salt water of a dungeon into salt not only because its taste would be different, but also because since salt was such an important seasoning, he thought that it would be better to have multiple ways to acquire it. At any rate, there were many undead titans addicted to miso and fish sauce. It was important to have a steady supply of the salt needed to make them. However, he did wish that he could get his hands on soy beans or some kind of sweet flavoring. I wonder if there's any sugarcane growing somewhere. Vandali. Well, he couldn't expect to acquire it from this dungeon. Name, Braga. Rank, 3. Race, Black Goblin Scout. Level, 7. Passive Skills. Dark Vision. Status Effect Resistance. Level 2. Enhanced Agility. Level 3. Intuition. Level 1. Detect Presence. Level 2. Active Skills. Short Sword Technique. Level 2. Throwing. Level 1. Silent Steps. Level 2. Trap. Level 1. Dismantling. Level 1. Unlocking. Level 1. Chapter 14. Let's take life one step at a time without rushing things. Vandali was finding it difficult to level up. When he had consulted the former A class adventurer, the Sword King Borkus tapped his fingers against his head as he answered. It can't be helped. The death attribute mage job is probably a specialized job. The dungeon you went to is Grins Valley and those guys are the ones you brought with you. With that being the case, I'm sure leveling up would be hard. Borkus. This knowledge wasn't something that had been properly quantified, but anyone who had progressed with their jobs to a certain extent knew certain rules of thumb. You know that each job requires different amounts of experience points to level up, right? Apprentice jobs are easy to level, generic jobs are moderately difficult and specialized jobs are harder. Borkus, as their names suggest, 
Apprentice jobs are jobs with the word apprentice at the beginning of the job title. Bazdia and Zadiris had reached level 100 for these jobs in a matter of days. They are very easy to level up. Generic jobs are jobs such as warrior and mage that give bonuses to a wide variety of skills. And finally, specialized jobs are jobs like swordsman, specialized for swordsmanship, or fire attribute mage and water attribute mage that are specialized for specific attributes. Since your job is a newly discovered one, I don't know the details about it either, but judging from the name, I can tell that it's a job specialized for death attribute magic. Still, it does seem that it provides bonuses to more skills than jobs like light attribute mage and fire attribute mage. Borkus. Apparently jobs such as these required a lot of experience points to level up. Adventurers and even normal people only take specialized jobs when they are aiming to become first class in that field. With a job like that. There's no way you can become stronger faster than a complete novice. Borkus. Apparently, this is how it was. Incidentally, the reason ghouls have a rank like monsters while Vandali didn't as a damper despite both being races created by the goddess Vida is because of the different origins of the two races. Races like ghouls that possess the blood of both a monster and a goddess such as vampires, lamias, silas and centaurs have ranks like monsters while also being able to gain jobs like humans. However, Vandali was a damp born between a vampire and a dark elf, so only a quarter of his blood originated from a monster. Because of this, he possessed a stronger constitution than humans while not having a rank. Borkus and the other titans who had become undead originated from the union between the goddess and the colossus god Zerno, so they hadn't possessed ranks while alive, either. Having decided not to be worried about his level increasing more slowly than those around him after consulting with Borkus, Vandali proceeded through Durin's aquatic caverns. The majority of the monsters appearing here were aquatic species. Past the fifth floor, fish people who possessed pale limbs protruding from the bodies of fish called Swigan, the flying sharks that had been present in Taylor Shime's waterways, big cancers that possessed pincers large enough to cut a human in half and enormous octopuses called killer octopuses would appear. TLN, Cancer, the astrological sign, is represented by a crab. So these cancers are crabs not diseases. Swigan were rank 2 demi-human type monsters that were called the goblins of the sea, armed mainly with spears, but they were small fry. This isn't edible, is it? Vandali. I suppose they aren't, though they might taste good if you haven't had any food or water for three days. Zran. It seemed that even their materials were goblin-like. They had fought flying sharks at the waterways of Taylor Shy many times, so nobody had any trouble dealing with them. Quick slash. Braga. As Braga dodged the jaws of a flying shark, he used a short sword technique martial skill, cutting deeply into the flying shark's neck. Braga had been born with a body built for agility, but it was training that had elevated that agility even higher. Braga had learned the techniques of a scout with Zran as his instructor and gained the short sword technique skill that relied on his speed more than his strength. His agility already matched that of a wild animal. As rank 2 monsters, the black goblins were the weakest among the new races created by Vandali, so even the weakest of the monsters in Gurren's Valley that they used for training were at least the same rank. By fighting the monsters in their they were able to gain large amounts of experience points. As a result, his rank had increased and now he was a black goblin scout, only half a year after his birth. I've raised quite the fearsome monster, if I do say so myself. Zran. I suppose so. The flying shark's head has been half severed. Vandali. No, that's not what I mean. Zran. Zran had a shrewd expression, brown brows furrowed and his mouth turned upwards into a smile. He's a monster scout. He's a monster with stronger physical abilities than a human while possessing human level skills. There are a lot of magical beasts that have special abilities that allow them to conceal their presence and catch their enemies by surprise. But that doesn't mean they're smart. They're just acting on instinct. But Braga would be able to do things like concealing his presence to tail a group of adventurers and assassinate the healer first or infiltrating villages and towns to kidnap women and children. Zran. I see. 
You mean that Braga has a high potential to become a covert operative in the future? Vandali. That was indeed a fearsome prospect. The noble orc Bogogan that Vandali had fought a difficult battle against had trained his skills to high levels. That was why Vandali had been forced to allow his own flesh and bone to be cut in order to win. If Bogogan had nothing but brute strength, Vandali wouldn't have even allowed Bogogan to cut the tip of his smallest finger. Braga had the potential to become a monster as threatening as Bogogan. The possibility of him catching an enemy by surprise and stabbing them in the side instead of attacking from the front was particularly fearsome. No, what was fearsome wasn't just Braga. It was all of the Black Goblins. Braga was the fastest to develop among all of them, but according to Zran, all of them would increase their ranks and become Black Goblin scouts by the end of the year. In other words, all of the Black Goblins had the talent to be assassins and spies. They would be a group of monsters capable of slipping past the defenses of humans to infiltrate their villages and towns, though infiltration for long periods of time would be impossible due to their appearance, but they would at least be able to deal with the guards and open the gates from the inside to allow their comrades in. But you knew from the beginning that they would become fearsome when you were teaching them, didn't you? You were the one who taught them the short sword technique, after all, Zran. Vandali. Ha 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 ha. Zran. Wait, you're a monster as well, aren't you? You're an undead. Vandali. Ha 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 ha. Zran. You really just wanted to act cool and boast about your student, didn't you? Vandali. Ha 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 ha. Very perceptive, holy son. Zran. It's just that I know how you feel because I'm a person who likes boasting myself. Vandali. Though Vandali wouldn't call himself a parent, he felt strangely old as he thought about how that tiny Braga had grown up to be so great. It would be good if Braga became powerful enough to hunt monsters on his own and he would be a reliable ally to have if the MIG Shield Nation ever dispatched another extermination force. What are you talking about, King? Braga. Braga was nimbly returning after retrieving some shark fins and placing the meat in a container in Sam's carriage. We were saying that you're like a ninja, Braga. Vandali, telling him outright would be too embarrassing, so this was the answer Vandali gave. But Braga and even Zran gave him puzzled looks. Ninja? Zran. Eh, you haven't heard of them? Even you, Zran. Vandali. Zakat had tried to spread knowledge and technology from his own world. So Vandali had thought that at least Zran would know what a ninja was. After that, the two of them began to pester Vandali to tell them stories about ninjas every time they stopped to rest. Incidentally, big cancers and killer octopuses were rank 3 and they were simply large crabs and octopuses. So they didn't have any trouble dealing with these monsters. Apart from the marine products that could be harvested in Dran's aquatic caverns, there were also metals that could be mined. Precious metals such as gold, silver and mithril couldn't be found here, but they could mine tin, copper and iron. That was why miners would slay monsters with pickaxes while digging at the walls. Vandali imagined that it might be incredibly difficult to carry large quantities of heavy ores outside the dungeon, but it seemed that the metal originating in the dungeon formed in large lumps. Even the purity was high enough that it could simply be used to make metal goods and armor straight away. Upon learning this, Vandali had thought, other worlds are so convenient. This was why Taylor Shime had blacksmiths but no smelters to turn ores into masses of metal. After greeting the miners who were carrying these lumps of metal on their backs and taking a break to eat food with them, Vandalie's party continued their journey to clear the dungeon. From the sixth floor onwards, rank four monsters began to appear alongside the rank three ones. Squid monsters that could change the color of its own body to conceal itself to attack its enemies by surprise. Chameleon squids, monsters that appeared to be one and a half meter long lobsters that had sharp claws that were like bladed weapons, blade shrimp, monsters that looked like beautiful flowers on first glance but actually secreted paralyzing venom and possessed countless tentacles, shark eating anemones. These were just a little problematic. Braga's intuition and detection skills, as well as Vandalie's danger sense, death let them immediately know where monsters were hiding. And though it wasn't like Garin's Valley, they had more than enough strength to get through. You quick slash Zran. With incredible force and enough speed to cut the air itself, 
Zran sliced the blade shrimp clean in two. He was just like a berserker as he ended its life with his short sword. Gah. Whipax. Vigro. Writhing tentacles were severed by the axe swung by Vigro's arm that was even more flexible than them. And then the shark eating anemone's main body was sliced through as well. It seemed as if Vigro's desire for battle had increased since he had become a goo berserker. Was it just in Vandalie's imagination? Botchin. Might it not be wise to stop those two? If I am not mistaken, they are supposed to be supervising you. Sam. Zran as well as Vigro in particular had higher ranks. Defeating monsters that weren't bosses in a D-class dungeon wouldn't gain them any reasonable amount of experience points. Even if they wanted to improve their skills, their enemies were so far below them that this was nothing but a warm-up exercise for them. The enemies were simply too weak for this to be real training. In fact, since the enemies were so much weaker, their skills and instincts would become duller instead. So the reason the two of them were rampaging around at the front was Dash. Well. They've been saying they're bored. Vandalie. They had grown tired of supervising without participating in the fights. Well, it is rather awkward to have the two of them do nothing. Sam. We can take a break while those two are fighting, too. Vandalie. That's fine, but. Can we really eat these? Kuka. Kuka looked at the killer octopus legs. Blade shrimp and sashimi made of fish and shellfish with a displeasured look on her face. Of course. Do the people of the MIG Shield Nation not eat octopuses and eels? Vandalie. Even on Earth, there had been countries without the culture of eating octopuses. Though he wasn't sure if this was true, Vandalie had also heard that there had even been ancient civilizations who absolutely could not eat it or avoided doing so for religious reasons. With that being the case, it was possible that there was a culture of not eating eels in Lambda. No, there's no eels because there's no ocean and octopuses are just dried meat. Kuka. Apparently Vandali was wrong. The fact that octopuses were used as dried meat meant that they could be eaten normally. So why was Kuka hesitating? Did she simply dislike seafood? Then do you at least eat fish? Vandali. That's not the problem. It's raw. Kuka. Ah, that's what it is. Vandali. It seemed Kuka's apprehension was due to the fact that they would be eating marine products raw. In western countries on earth there had been dishes like Carpaxio where fish and meat would be eaten raw, so Vandalie had thought that it wouldn't be a problem. Did Carpaxio not exist in Lambda? Or had Bellwood told everyone that eating fish raw was dangerous so that Zakat couldn't spread the culture of eating sushi and sashimi? It's alright. Look, Vandalie. While Kaka was still apprehensive, Braga was enjoying the sashimi. Delicious. Delicious. Braga. They ate teals, squid, shellfish and fish with fish sauce and wasabi. Normally soy sauce would be better than fish sauce, but soy sauce created from walnut miso and acorn miso had a questionable flavor, so they had only brought fish sauce with them. Were the walnuts or acorns bad to use? Or was there a problem with the fungus used for the fermentation process? Either way, Vandali really wanted soy beans. It's delicious. Kaka. Have some too. Braga. The combination of this tender texture with the sharp spice of the wasabi is indeed marvelous. Sam. Braga encouraged Kuka with joy on his face while Sam did the same with a report on the food. Why you might say that, but humans can't eat fish raw. Kuka. Kuka, you're a ghoul now. Braga. Ah, that's right. But even ghouls can't eat raw fish. Can they? Kuka. Monsters like goblins and kobolds generally don't cook their food, they feast on meat and anything else raw. Other demi humans might roast meat on a fire at most, but the ghouls had been using primitive techniques such as using skewers to roast meat and baking it in leaves since before Vandalie arrived. Like titans, they were a race of people created by Veda, but it's alright, it's extremely fresh and I've even used sterilization, bug killer and disinfect so there's nothing harmful left in it. Vandalie. Even if fungi and parasites had been present, they were all exterminated now and Vandali had even used the death attribute spell disinfect to remove any poison. With this much treatment done, even poisonous mushrooms would become edible. If you've gone that far, it's delicious. Kuka. 
Cooker's eyes opened wide in surprise, and then she began greedily munching on the sashimi like Braga. Seeing how happy she was, Vandali also felt happy. Incidentally, after Zran and Vigro returned from their monster hunting, Zran said, Raw meat tastes delicious after you've become an undead so I can't help it, as he gleefully dug into the sashimi. Vigro on the other hand rejected the idea like Kuka had at first, saying, Raw, we'll get stomach aches. But then he began to eat after being reassured that it was safe to do so. The mid-boss that appeared on the 10th floor was a rank 4 Sawigan berserker with rank 3 Sawigan pirates as subordinates. Since they didn't yield any valuable materials, they served as training partners for Vandalie to improve his unarmed fighting skill. From the 11th floor onwards of Durin's aquatic caverns, rank 4 monsters began to appear, leading groups of rank 3 monsters. The frequency of traps also became higher. There were pitfalls with poison spikes at the bottom, spears hidden amongst the stalactites in the ceilings and axes that came flying at them from the walls. King, there's a trap here. Braga. That's right. Can you disarm it? Vandali. I'll give it a try. Ah. Braga. Poisonous gas was released with a hissing sound, so Vandali neutralized the poison with disinfect. Sorry. I failed. Braga. It's fine. Do your best next time. Vandali. Why is it that the Holy Son who is at the back is the first to know where the traps are? Zran. Depending on the types of traps, traps could be more dangerous than monsters. However, Vandali could detect traps that would kill with his constantly active danger sense, death. This allowed him to detect traps faster than Braga who was actually searching for them. In addition, many of the traps in Drun's aquatic caverns were poisonous, so he could deal with them immediately with disinfect. With the holy sun here, aren't scouts unnecessary? Zran, don't sulk like that. Aren't materials and training the reasons we came here? Vandali. That was why Vandali didn't say or do anything even after detecting traps, leaving Braga to search for them. And I can't detect traps that aren't deadly. For example, a trap that spits out oil that's hard to remove. Vandali. That would be more of a prank than a trap. Sam. He would probably be unable to detect a trap where a blackboard dust would come falling from overhead, but wouldn't it be fine to not detect those? They won't kill you, after all. Zran. Well, that's true. Vandali. In a dungeon, half of the traps were designed to kill their victims. The other half would either immobilize or apply a status effect, making it easier for monsters to kill the intruders, so Vandali could detect most of them. But you know, it's not like I'll be around every time. Vandali, I suppose you're right. Zran. And so they continued and set up camp. The next day, they finally arrived at the lowest floor. There were apparently only ten floors two hundred years ago, but like Garin's Valley, the number of floors had increased after being abandoned. There were now 18 floors to journey through. Vandali was able to obtain the seaweeds and skipjack tuna that he had come here for on the 15th floor, so this was a happy surprise for him. When he returned to Taylorsheim, he would make a room for smoking food and the make kachiboshi. If that was too difficult, it might still be good to use the fish after drying it like it had been in the Warring States period. TLN. 475 BC. By the way, does this turtle spit fire or anything? Vandali. It doesn't. Vigro and Zran. As Vandali asked this question with no signs of nervousness, Vigro and Zran almost shouted in response. The boss of Durin's aquatic caverns that was waiting for them was a rank 5 crusher turtle accompanied by six rank 4 bullet turtles. Bullet turtles were turtles with one meter long shells at first glance but they were problematic monsters that could withdraw their limbs into their shells and use wind attribute magic to spin through the air at high speeds in order to perform ramming attacks. Their shells were harder than iron. Their ramming attacks would be dangerous even for heavy warriors. The crusher turtle was five times larger than a bullet turtle, but its ramming attack wouldn't be only five times as powerful. There were apparently numerous incidents in history where stone walls of towns were destroyed by the ramming attacks of giant turtles such as these, and it had a powerful defense as well. They were monsters that were difficult to defeat among rank 4 and rank 5 monsters. In fact, 
not only Braga and Kuka, but even Zran and Vigro were having a hard time dealing with them. Knew it's fast. Vigro and their coordinated, too. Zran, with their heads withdrawn into their shells and spinning at high speeds, the turtles had begun to move in a coordinated fashion. As Vigro made an attempt to reduce their number by one first, others attacked from the side and above him to interfere. Half-hearted attacks would simply bounce off the spinning shells that were harder than iron. This is where magic would come in handy, but Vigoro, Varan and Kuka couldn't use magic. Leave it to me. Kuka. But Kuka raised her sword and stepped forward. Kuka. It's impossible. Braga. It's not impossible. Rapid reaction. Kuka. Taking no notice of Braga as he tried to stop her, Kuka increased her reaction speed with a martial skill dodged a bullet turtle's attack with the bare minimum required movement and released a deadly thrust into the side of its shell. Pierce. Kuka. A swordsmanship technique that increased the speed and power of a thrust. Now that Kuka had become a ghoul, she had a more physical strength than she had possessed as an adventurer. Her attack pierced the bullet turtle's shell. There was a sound of breaking metal. Eh? Kuka. Kuka's plan fell apart along with her sword as she opened her eyes wide, dumbfounded. Another bullet turtle closed in on her. She noticed it, thanks to her rapid reaction. But though the pierce she used was fast and powerful, it also left a large opening. Even though she had seen it, her body couldn't keep up. I'm done F. Kuka. I won't let that happen. Don't worry. Vandaly. Though Kuka thought she was doomed, the bullet turtle crashed into the ground. Well, if I erase their mana, they're just huge turtles. Vandaly, the bullet turtles that were using wind attribute magic to fly through the air like bullets lost their ability to fly as they were engulfed in magic absorption barriers. They crashed with full force into the walls and into the ground. If they had wings, perhaps they might be able to glide through the air. But all they had were flipper-shaped legs. The amount of experience points gained will decrease if I interfere, but it can't be helped. R. Everyone, please finish them off. Vandaly. Yeah. Vigro. Sorry about that, holy son. Zran. They dealt with the turtles by thrusting their short swords and claws into the gaps in their shells. The crusher turtle resisted a little by attempting to bite them, but it joined its subordinates in death with one swing of Vigro's axe. Let's have a new sword made for you when we get back. If there's anything nice in the treasure room, you can simply take it. What's wrong? Vandaly Kuka, who was sitting down with the broken sword still in her hand, had tears in her eyes. Should Vandaly have helped her quicker? Had he spent too long waiting to see what would happen? As he panicked, her tears began to fall from. I. I'm sorry. Kuka. Why was she apologizing to him? Vandaly wanted to ask her this question, but decided to console her instead for now. I felt my limits even before being captured by the orcs. You and then I became a ghoul. But even so. Kuka. I see, so you were impatient. Vandaly. Kuka was a fast learner. She had grown strong rapidly after becoming an adventurer, catching up to her seniors. And then she had hit a wall. It wasn't a hard iron wall but a soft one made of mud. It gradually became harder to level up and no matter what kind of training and battles she went through, her skills were improving at a snail's pace. She couldn't even imagine when her skills might level up. I don't need to worry about it, the growth period for my strength has just passed. I just have to become stronger one step at a time from now on. Even though she told herself this. She could only see the backs of the seniors that she was supposed to have caught up to and those who started training in the same year as her left her behind. Even her juniors were catching up to her. She suddenly felt that the stories of retired female adventurers that spread throughout the Adventurers Guild were real. If Kaka had earned enough money, she might have retired in the same way. However, she had only just become a D-class adventurer and all her money was going into her equipment living costs and paying off the debt that her parents had left her. Though she didn't live extravagantly, the amount of money she had was only several months worth of living expenses. She didn't have the connections to be hired as an exclusive escort. The MIG Shield Nation didn't employ female soldiers to fight on the front lines, though some were used for office work. That was why she had no choice but to continue as an adventurer. 
putting in hard work without knowing when it would produce results. It wasn't that Kaka had become weak. However, the adventurers around her had become strong and left her behind. She was unable to find decent requests to accept. The monsters in devil's nests whose materials would sell for high prices were too much for her to handle and there were many cases where more skilled adventurers were already hunting them. Perhaps it would simply be better to find a suitable man to run away with and marry. She had been captured by orcs while thinking this and fell into despair. She thought that she would be giving birth to a noble orc's children until she died. She would have been better off dying during her adventures, even when she still had dreams to accomplish. However, Kaka was rescued by the ghouls and decided to become a ghoul at Vandalie's suggestion. After becoming a ghoul, Kaka thought that she had been reborn. She gained the superhuman strength and pain resistance skills and her attribute values increased. She was clearly more powerful than she had been as a human. She could finally become stronger. She would regain her pride and her dreams. That was what she thought. But because everyone else was becoming stronger faster than you, you grew even more impatient. Vandalie. That was why she had grown impatient and done something like that, believing in herself. Are you? Kuka. These were Kuka's circumstances. Hearing this, Vigro and Zran thought that this was where Vandalie would scold her. After that, Vigro and the others went to retrieve the items in the treasure room. And all of them began the journey back to Taylorsheim. Kuka and Vandalie were sitting together on top of a golem that Vandalie had created. This was because Sam's carriage was full with the harvested materials. Braga looked jealously up at them. Vigro didn't understand the circumstances of humans, but he knew how it felt to be frustrated with one's own lack of progress. However, allowing that to cause reckless behavior was not good. His death would cause the village to lose strength. That was why Vandalie had to scold her. Even if he understood how she felt, he had to scold her and teach her so that she wouldn't become impatient again. That was his job as a leader of the village. I understand how you feel. I really do. Vandali. But Vandali's words faltered. V. Vandali? Vigro. Vigro called his name out, wondering why he wasn't continuing, but the words that came from Vandali's mouth weren't scolding or reprimands. I've thoroughly experienced that. Vandali. It was sympathy. Vandali knew all too well why Kaka had felt impatient, no matter how hard he had worked on Earth. His grades were just a little above average. He had always been scolded at his part-time job and he had been unable to make any friends. When he had finally participated in the school trip with the money he had saved, everyone else was having the time of their lives and he had to mask his feelings of being alienated by trying to enjoy the view. His own worth shouldn't change. But as others rose above him, he had felt that his own worth was decreasing relative to them. I still feel impatient among my mother's enemies, Gordon is an old man, but judging from the sound of his voice, Heinz was still young, he'll have grown stronger by now, but meanwhile, this is how I am. Vandalie, Heinz had been B-class back then, it had been three years, so he might have become A-class by now. Even while Vandalie was doing this. Heinz was undoubtedly becoming even stronger, and Amemia Hiroto and the others who would be reincarnated here were likely undergoing high-level training and fighting in origin right now. They wouldn't have the experience gained in previous life not carried over curse, so they would be able to make use of that training fully once they reincarnated in Lambda. Vandalie didn't know whether they were serving as soldiers or agents in origin so he could only make vague guesses as to what kinds of things they would experience, but there was a high chance that they would possess first-class skills even without their cheat-like abilities. So how can you stay so calm? Kuka, I intend on using any method available to me. And no matter how strong they become, they won't be immortal. Vandalie, he would kill them, even if he had to use poison spread diseases or catch them by surprise. He would have no qualms about making thousands of undead ingulums to crush them to death with the strength of numbers. He wouldn't care if he was called a coward. In the end, he just needed to be the one to stand victorious. As for those who would reincarnate here, well, if they insisted on killing Vandali no matter what, then he had no choice but to deal with them in the same way. They wouldn't be immortal, either. However, he still wanted to avoid having to fight all 100 of them. He didn't like them. Emotionally speaking, he couldn't forgive them. 
But if he couldn't defeat them in the end, all of it would be meaningless. He would talk to them if they apologized. He would keep his distance and watch them work hard to develop this problematic world while enjoying a comfortable life eating delicious food with everyone else. That would be more than enough as revenge for him. So what should I do? Kuka Kuka seemed to have calmed down. Vandali took a moment to think before replying. How about leaving swordsmanship aside for now and trying some magic training? Ghoul women are supposed to have a high aptitude for magic, after all. Vandali. She might just end up as a jack of all trades and master of none. But she was currently not making much progress so it wouldn't be a bad thing to have more options. Yes, I'll give it a try. But what if it doesn't work out? Kuka. If it doesn't work out, I'll be there to listen to you again if that time comes. Vandali. Vandali felt that he was responsible for Kuka. He was the one who had suggested that she and the others become ghouls. He had known that their previous lives would come to an end and this would be a step down a one-way road that they would never be able to turn back on. That was why he thought that taking care of them was the obvious thing to do as a person, if he wanted to be considered a person. Wanting to help others in need was how a person should act, wasn't it? He got the feeling that everyone said that the character for person was one person supporting another. TLN, the kanji for person is. I don't think this font shows it. But when it's handwritten, the left stroke is longer, taller so it looks like the right stroke is supporting it. I see. You'll be there to listen. Kuka. If magic doesn't work out either, there are other options like becoming a specialist in making fish sauce and acorn miso. Vandali. Try again. Kuka. Then how about becoming a maid with Saria and Rita? Vandali. A maid, huh? Well, let's go with that for now. Kuka. Why did she add, for now? Could it be that she wanted to be a maid in the past? Was her childhood dream to become a maid leader? MHMM. I've found my motivation. I don't know how far I can go, but I'll do my best with magic as soon as we get back. Kuka. Leaving that aside. It was a relief to see that she had recovered. Bazdia has a rival now. Vigro. This is good, isn't it? Heroes are supposed to be popular with the women. Zran. I want to be popular too, like Berg. Braga. Had Vandali raised some kind of flag? Vandali didn't care, since he was looking forward to making miso soup with kombu and dashi. Name. Kuka. Rank. 3. Race. Ghoul. Level. 24. Job. Warrior. Job level, 77. Job history. Apprentice warrior. Age, 19 years old. Passive skills. Night vision. Pain resistance. Level 1. Superhuman strength. Level 1. Paralyzing venom secretion. Claws. Level 1. Active skills. Swordsmanship. Level 3. Armor technique. Level 1. Shield technique. Level 1. Dismantling. Level 1. As a human. Kuka possessed moderate strength for a D-class adventurer, but she had the flaw of having no skills other than swordsmanship, and hitting a wall in her growth made her feel even worse about not making progress. She has gained passive skills after turning into a ghoul and her attribute values have increased under the effect of Vandali's strength in followers, but the way she fought as a human is unable to make use of them and display her strength. Chapter 15 Shadows of Unrest Approach Unseen Hogia, Hogia, the thing that was crying like a baby was no normal baby. It had blonde hair that looked as if made of pure gold, and skin as white as the rock that this royal castle of Taylor Shime was built from. It had pink, triangular ears and there was a short tail growing from its bottom. Incidentally, pig beast people apparently didn't exist in Lambda before we knew it. The live dead had turned to ashes and this child was crying. Bazdia, I see. Vandali. Vandali came to check on the live dead after returning from Durin's aquatic caverns to be greeted by Bazdia holding a baby in her arms. It seemed that while Vandali was in Durin's aquatic caverns, the fetus had developed sufficiently and the live dead had run out of mana. Well, I don't really care about the live dead. I was planning to bury it after it served its purpose anyway. Vandali. Vandali turned the ashes into a golem to gather them up. The live dead had simply been a creature with a beating heart but no soul. It had existed only to nurture its reborn self in its uterus. So this child was born safely, but, I've been troubled because it won't stop crying. Bazdia. Hogia. Hogia. 
Baby, can I see the baby for a bit? Vandaly, of course. Bazdia Vandaly took her in his arms. She stopped crying and stared at Vandaly. Vandaly observed her as she gazed at him. MHMM. It does resemble her. Vandaly. Its face resembled that of the live dead and its spirit, and it had a human's nose, and it was definitely a girl. It was not a noble orc whose race only had males. I'm going to have a good look at you, so bear with me for a moment. Vandaly. You baby using spirit form transformation to turn a part of his body into spirit form vandaly examined the inside of her body her organ count the shape of her bones and the like were different from orcs they were close to a humans it was still impossible to tell whether her body would function the same as a humans but she was clearly not an orc or noble orc but it couldn't be said that she was completely human she had the same golden hair as the noble orcs and her eyes were blue and her ears and tail made it very clear that she wasn't entirely human, she was still just a baby, it was possible that she might develop more inhuman characteristics as she developed, was she a half noble orc, can you see your status? Vandaly, Amu, baby, for now, it seemed that she wasn't going to angrily shout, this isn't what you promised me, because of her strange appearance, um, could it be that you're hungry? Vandaly, Van. I don't think a baby would be able to understand what you're saying. Bazdia, as Vandaly turned to face Bazdia, or tried to, the baby put him in a headlock. She was unbelievably strong for a child. With his head being held in place by both her arms, he couldn't move at all. I had my memories from quite early after I was born. I thought that she might be able to understand. Vandaly, I see. But I don't think she understands. If she did. She would have listened to me and stopped crying. But she showed no signs of listening and kept crying until you arrived. Van. Bazdia. Then it might take some time before she regains her memories. Vandaly. Vandaly's memories had returned relatively soon after being reborn in Lambda. But that was because it had been the work of Rod Corti who was a god, while Vandaly had used a new technique for the first time to carry out this baby's reincarnation. It might take several months or even years for her memories to return. Well, several months had passed after her death before Vandaly used her spirit for the reincarnation. So it was definitely possible that her memories and consciousness might have parts missing, however. Well, I've asked Bildu and the others to provide milk in advance, so let's head over to them. You still can't produce any, right, Bazdia? Vandaly, me? Bazdia, yes. You're pregnant. Please make sure you wear the magic item that protects the baby. Vandaly. Is that true, Van? Bazdia. It's true. Congratulations. Make sure you come to me regularly so I can check its progress. Vandaly. Yeah. Bazdia. And so two auspicious events were celebrated at once. Vandaly dried kombu in the clear winter air and weak sunlight with the reborn girl. Now then, I'll begin the experiment. Vandaly, A.I. Baby. He slowly applied with airing on the kombu to remove its water content while also slowly applying aging. If he made a mistake it would dry out too much and fall apart, and if he took too long, it would turn into powder. So he needed to be very careful. He continued controlling his spells for just a minute while enduring a headache and fever. It turned out perfect, so he stopped his spells and retrieved the dried kombu. Now then. Time to actually taste it. Vandaly. A.I. Baby. He threw the kombu into a pot on a magical stove he had found in the ruins and turned the stove on. Dashi began to come out steadily. He removed the kombu when enough dashi had come out before the water started to boil and scooped some out with a ladle that the blacksmith Tatara had made for him. He placed it onto a small plate, cooled it and tasted it. MHMM. That's good dashi. Vandaly, satisfied. He added ingredients like wakame and vegetables and then dissolved miso in it to make miso soup. It's turned out well. Vandaly, you, you, baby. I think it's a little too early for you to be drinking miso soup, poor Vina. Vandaly, oh. Poor Vina, poor Vina. The live dead who had been reborn as a half noble orc seemed dejected, so Vandaly comforted her as he felt satisfied at having successfully made kombu dashi.
applying the aging spell that was originally intended to age living things to kill them through old age to the kombu and drying it, he was able to apply 25 years worth of drying in a single minute to produce high quality dried kombu. It was a groundbreaking discovery. It was a process that shortened a 25 year long process to one minute. Incidentally, the reason it was 25 years was because Vandali remembered that kombu that had been dried and fermented for that long had been treated as a much higher quality product than normal kombu on earth. If he recalled, it was because the process changed the amami content in the kombu. He had no spell that could confirm whether the amami content had really increased and Vandali had never tried miso super made from high quality kombu dashi so there was no denying the possibility that Vandali was just making an assumption here. Oh! Poor Vina. Though Vandali had originally thought that poor Vina hadn't regained her memories yet, she had in fact regained them to some extent immediately after her birth. But as Vandali had feared, they were very broken memories and she hadn't even been able to remember her own name. She only remembered that her corpse had been turned into a live dead and that Vandali had saved her. The latter could be referred to as Vandali using her, but she felt thankful towards him and was emotionally attached to him. Ma. Poor Vina. But even after regaining some of her memories, her mental age was still that of a child. Unlike people who had been reincarnated like Vandali, she was simply a child who remembered a little about her previous life. She would develop and become an adult for the second time. She would surely grow to be large. At three months of age, her height was almost the same as Vandali who was three years old. Even taking into account the fact that Vandali had a small build, she was growing incredibly quickly. Was this because she had some noble orc blood in her? As poor Vina lifted Vandali into the air, he wondered, am I trying to be some kind of mad scientist who creates new species? Nuaza and the other titans seemed happy about it. However, saying things like, it is just like how the goddess Vida gave birth to us. It is truly divine work. He would soon become unable to ever get rid of the title of prophesized holy son. Vandali thought that if he wasn't the holy son, it would be nice if the goddess could give another prophecy or something to say so. So far, everything is going well. Vandali, you, poor Vina, MHMM, everything but the catcher bushy, I suppose. Vandali, poor Vina was developing well. Vandali didn't know how long it would take for her to become an adult but it would likely be 10 years at most. She didn't seem to have any problems with her health, and they were getting along well. Since he had used her and reincarnated her, Vandali had to take responsibility for her new life, so he planned to take good care of her. Bastia's pregnancy had been discovered at the same time as poor Vina's birth, and that was also progressing well. She had only been pregnant for three months so Vandali had been carefully examining her but the magic item had been exhibiting its effects with no problem. It was even better that she liked the piercing. Vandali had once again put a halt on his dungeon clearing so he could take care of poor Vina and Bazdia, but he was still going into the devil's nests that were close enough to make a day trip into with everyone to continue his training. He assisted those training to acquire the chant revocation skill, played reversi and jenga and made fish sauce and miso. Everything was going well. The only thing he was struggling with was making kachibushi. It seemed that the concept of smoking food didn't exist in Lambda. There was dried meat so Vandali had assumed that smoked foods existed, but this wasn't the case. Not even bacon, ham, sausages or wieners existed in this world, let alone roast beef. He had asked Kaka and the others. But dried meat in this world was meat that had been salted and dried in the sun. Because of this, Vandali had been forced to build a food smoking facility using only his own knowledge. Darsa had finally given Vandali permission to use fire, but the first real cooking that he was doing himself, using smoking tools based on his limited knowledge to make kachabushi, was difficult. In origin, I learned things from the spirits of Western people who were knowledgeable about Japanese food, but they weren't experts in making kachibushi. Vandali. He dried the fish and charred it to make smoked fish. This process simply produced a burnt product or left the center raw. All of his attempts had failed to make fermented food. All Vandali had to do was prepare the ingredients and use fermentation. It seemed that Vandali would struggle to make bacon or wieners as well, 
even though he had ingredients for them in the form of orc meat, no, he still lacked the spices to make them. First of all, put me down now. Vandali. You. Poor Vina. Poor Vina refused. Vandali spent the fourth winter of his life being held in the air. The search was extremely difficult. A relatively safe route across the mountain range had been planned out, but in the end, a third of the subordinate vampires had been wiped out. And the search for the dam craft crossing the mountain range was proving difficult as well. I didn't think that it would be this troublesome. Eleonora. The objective of Eleonora and her party was to murder the damp, but they didn't have any convenient magic items like a damp radar or spells like detect damp. That was why they had decided to first find the village of ghouls that he led. The ghouls might have lost about half of their numbers while crossing the mountain range, but there would still be at least 200 left. A village of 200 ghouls would be quite large, and ghouls weren't particularly adapted to living at high altitudes, nor were they good at navigating steep cliffs. There was no doubt that they would choose flat ground, similar to the Devil's Nest forest that was undergoing reclamation now. Under those assumptions, they released familiars to search for them but not a single ghoul had been found. Geez, just where have they gone? It's not as if they could have disappeared like mist. Eleonora, Eleonora sighed as she poured holy water that they had brought with them over the defeated subordinate vampire at her feet, they were truly useless. Their master was useless as well. But just where was every single one of the subordinates gathered here so useless? They might have gone underground, I suppose we should search the caves as well. Sir Krent. Sir Krent had a look of exhaustion on his face as well. He didn't care about some of his useless subordinates dying. But he was desperate because if he couldn't complete this mission, his life would be forfeit. But even then, the ghouls would need to gather food, so it would be a cavern system with multiple entrances. Or perhaps, the ghouls already served their purpose in helping him cross the mountain range, so he disposed of them? Eleonora, leaving aside whether that was really possible, if it was true. That would explain why the search using the familiars that had even cost a third of the subordinate vampires lives have turned up nothing. That damp had stayed hidden from the search of that renowned religious fanatic Gordon when he was less than a year old. If he was on his own, he would obviously not need much food and living underground would be simple. More importantly, isn't there a possibility that the spirits of these guys who have just died have gone to give the damp information about us? Sir Krent. Eleonora and Sir Grant were conducting their search with a policy of not killing or dying any more than needed in order to deal with the damp who was apparently a spiritualist. But even so, the devil's nests of the Boundary Mountain range weren't easy to deal with. Unlucky encounters with dragons and such had cost them another third of the subordinate vampires. They poured holy water on the dead bodies to prevent their spirits from lingering in this world, but they couldn't actually see spirits. Only those with the spiritualist job can see spirits that haven't become undead. That was why they couldn't tell whether the spirits were in the vicinity of their dead bodies. The spirits could have rushed off towards the damper and they would have never known. Even if the damper is a spiritualist, he wouldn't be able to summon the spirits of people whose names and faces he doesn't know. The possibility of him being able to do that is low. I want to believe that. Eleonora, I see. But what will we do? Where do we search from here? Sir Krent. Let's see. How about we go to where the city of Taylorsheim once stood? Eleonora, the nation of titans that the Amid Empire used the Mig Shield Nation's army to destroy. The pure reed vampire Gilberman had used the Amid Empire to do this, and Tanisha had been partially involved as well. It would certainly be a ruin by now, swarming with undead titans. Even though they're ruins, there might be some usable buildings left, and it would be easier to establish a village there than to build a new one from nothing. Eleonora. Though it was unlikely that the damp was aware of this, there were dungeons near Taylorsheim. If he used those, he would be able to gather food efficiently. However, Sir Grant looked doubtful. No, Taylorsheim should be overflowing with undead. It would be impossible to build a village there. Sir Krent. Looking at Sir Krent's face, Eleonora was overcome with an urge to kill him on the spot. The reason Sir Krent didn't want to go to Taylorsheim was an extremely insignificant one. 
he didn't want Eleonora to gain leadership, for Sir Grant to erase his past failures and return to his original position in vampire society, he of course needed to successfully kill the damp, but it also needed to be his own achievement rather than Eleonora's. Even if he completed his mission, doing so under Eleonora's command would mean that he had stooped low enough to become her dog, and it could even be interpreted as proof that he was an incompetent fool who couldn't even exterminate a single damp without having instructions spelled out for him. Those living in the society of the vampires who obeyed the evil gods constantly tried to gain the favor of those who were on the rise while striking down those who were falling. If Sir Grant simply prioritized the completion of his mission, his social position wouldn't move an inch. However, even though he understood that, there was a reason Nora couldn't allow him to have his way, because that would mean that she, a member of Burkine's bodyguards, had considered obeying Sir Grant, which her peer read master wouldn't accept. She would be subjected to indescribable punishment and unhealable wounds would be inflicted upon her. She didn't want that. That is why Leonora had decided that she would have the pitiful Sir Krent fall as far down as it was possible to fall. I see. Then I'll go and scout out the ruins on my own. Leonora. Leonora had only been working together with Sir Krent up until now because she had needed the numbers. Burkine hadn't given her permission to create new subordinate vampires, so the only pawns that she could use were her familiars. However, it wouldn't make any difference not having such useless pawns whose numbers had even been decreased by the journey. She didn't mind separating herself from Sir Grant to work on her own. What? Sir Grant. Sir Grant was greatly confused. If Eleonora disposed of the damp while separated from him, that would be the same as him having failed his mission. On the other hand, this was a chance to take the achievement all for himself. But Eleonora was superior to him in ability and the subordinate vampires who had been useless up until now were unlikely to suddenly become stronger. Very well, let us search Taylorsheim. Sir Krent taking no notice of the vampire who had lived many times the number of years she had as he meaninglessly pretended to give his permission for the search of Taylorsheim. Eleonora flew up into the night sky. However, Upon reaching the site where the ruins of Taylorsheim should have been according to the 200-year-old records left by the Migshield Nation's army, Eleonora opened her eyes wide, dropped her jaw and stood stock still. Even before she became a vampire, she had never imagined that she would be making such a foolish-looking face. I am possible. Eleonora, isn't this some kind of illusion? Sir Krent. However, she had no need to worry about Sir Krent and his subordinates seeing her like this. They were standing still with the same dumbfounded expression on their faces. They were dumbfounded by the enormous walls illuminated by the light of the moon and stars. As vampires, they could see the majestic walls as if they were in plain daylight. There was not a single ivy branch growing on the white stone walls and not a single crack in the stone. What does this mean? The MIG Shield Nation's army and Mikhail destroyed the walls, didn't they? Eleonora. That's right, if I recall. Back then, the gate was broken and the wall had collapsed in two different places. Even if what we were told is a mistake, there is nobody repairing or maintaining them, so how are they so? Sir Krent. Sir Krent continued whispering, still astonished, but he slowly regained his composure. I see, it was the undead. The undead of Taylorsheim repaired these walls, the undead don't tire, so I'm sure they could do it, given two hundred years. Sir Krent. However, Eleonora couldn't imagine that the conclusion he had arrived at was correct. The undead, repairing and maintaining the walls? Eleonora. Undead were generally unproductive and didn't form societies. They did organize themselves in ways where the weak simply obeyed the strong or used the hierarchical relationships established while they were still alive, but in the majority of cases, they were simply disorganized groups of undead individuals. Even if the undead had 200 years, they might be able to sweep, clean and wash dishes, but would they be able to perform such advanced, large-scale work as repairing the city's walls? It was difficult to imagine that this was possible. If it was, every haunted building and ghost ship in this world would be sparkling clean. Nobody could blame Eleonora for staring at Sir Krent as if he had gone mad. What other explanation is there? Sir Krent. But even Eleonora couldn't answer that question. 
These walls were clearly not the work of monsters, and they hadn't received any information that the Orborm Kingdom had occupied the ruins of Talishheim to build a new city. Eleonora reminded herself that their objective wasn't to take back or occupy Talishheim, it was to kill the damp. We're going to look inside. Eleonora, fortunately, it didn't seem like there were any guards posted on the walls, it looked like there were several undead titans at the gate, but for the noble-born vampires who could fly through the sky, it wasn't a problem, they could simply fly over the walls and the subordinate vampires could climb over the walls with their claws. However, the surprises continued even after Elinora and Sir Grant passed the walls. The dark, silent Taylor Shime had a loneliness drifting from it that made it look like a ghost town. However, one glance was all it took to notice something abnormal. There aren't any collapsed buildings. Sir Grant, the buildings of Taylor Shime were lined up neatly against each other, though they were large, stone buildings built from stone. They had been abandoned for two hundred years. After a terrible war, even, are you going to tell me that this is the work of the undead as well? Eleonora th then who could have? That's it, I'm sure it's the damp, he made his ghoul subordinates. Sir Krent, are you trying to say that the ghouls simply repaired all of those houses as they were originally, in titan size? Eleonora, Sir Krent. Sir Krent fell silent at Eleonora's words but even she had no idea who could have repaired the city. Two hundred years ago, several hundred titans had actually escaped from the Mig Shield nation. The possibility that crossed Elinora's mind was that those surviving titans had returned and spent the past two hundred years restoring Taylor Shyam with the Hartner Duchy's assistance. But even that was hard to imagine. If that was the case, then why was the city so quiet? Sir Krent's armor? It's very faint, but I can see a light. Subordinate. What? The direction of the royal castle. Ha, huh. all right, let's go. Sir Krent, the vampires couldn't help but to tremble as they thought about how strange all this was. But even so, the mission took priority. They renewed their resolve, but as they approached the plaza in front of the royal castle, they were surprised three times. It's not really going well, is it? Saria, but we can't really have Botch and build this as well. Rita, Jaya, Nuaza Dono and the others said that it will be finished by spring. Let us wait and look forward to when it is complete. Bone Man, strange looking living armors and a skeleton were looking at what appeared to be a half finished stone statue. I'll definitely win this time. Young Titan, no, no, I cannot lose to a youngster. Old Titan. Undead Titans were playing a game on a board the vampires had never seen before with click clacking sounds, eating baked sweets. Fuga, it's cooked just right. Orcus, I want miso with mine. Black Goblin. Fish sauce for mine. Black Goblin. Black Corks and black colored goblins were cooking skewered meat on frying pans and eating it. This shark fillet has no flavor. Ghoul woman, but I heard it does wonders for your beauty. It tastes good when you use it to make soup, too. Ghoul woman. Ghoul women were walking together with their arms linked. Paper, scissors, rock. Anubis. Face away, there. Anubis. Monsters that appeared to be humans with the heads of dogs were playing some kind of game that the vampires had never seen before. What exactly is the meaning of this? I can understand the ghouls being here, but orcs and goblins in colors I've never seen and monsters with dog heads, and they're living in such a carefree way in the same space as the undead, it's just as if it were a human town. Eleonora, she knew that Sir Krent wouldn't give her any response worth listening to, but she simply couldn't remain silent. That was how much the sight before her defied everything she knew. Monsters as well as humans built societies that included multiple races but almost all of them were systems where the strong dominated and the weak obeyed. For undead, even those kinds of societies were impossible to form. Excluding some special cases, undead were generally either superior individuals who had maintained their personalities from when they were alive or inferior undead that indiscriminately tried to kill and consume any living thing, whether it was a human or a monster. Such undead were living calm, quiet lives. Were all of them superior undead? That was impossible. Even if their personalities had been preserved, 
they should still be ferocious. I I don't know. What does this mean? Could they have been tamed by someone? Impossible. It should be impossible to tame undead. Sir Krent. Like Sir Krent whispered, undead were impossible to tame. That was true whether the tamer was a vampire or a human. In the past, many individuals with superior tamer type jobs had attempted to tame undead, but they weren't even able to tame the most inferior rank 1 living bones and living dead, let alone superior undead such as elder lishes. As a result of these unsuccessful attempts, it became known in this world that like insect type monsters, undead were impossible to tame, but the vampires knew that there was an exception, could it be that there's someone who has gained the divine protection of the evil god, no, the goddess, Eleonora. It was possible that those with the divine protection of the goddess Veda who had revived Zakat as an undead or evil gods like High Hirish Hukaka could create and command undead. A vampire from another evil gods? No, it's Veda. There is someone with the goddess Veda's divine protection. Eleonora. Eleonora could see the church of Veda that had been restored if they possessed the divine protection of an evil god. There was no way that the church of the goddess would be restored. Impossible. Sir Krent. Sir Krent trembled. His eyes opened wide. If the one who possessed the goddess Veda's divine protection was one of the pure reed vampires they feared, the ones who worshipped the goddess Veda, then. Sir Krent's armor, we should escape while we still can. Subordinate. Nobody has noticed our presence yet, let us retreat. Subordinate. Still hidden. The subordinate vampires began to talk about retreating. It was clear what would happen if they were discovered in a place where a pure reed vampire who worshipped Veda was present. A one-sided annihilation at the hands of that vampire's overwhelming power. The noble-born Sir Grant and Eleonora being here would make no difference. That was how great the difference between a pure reed and a noble-born was. If that wasn't the case. There was no way that pure reed vampires like Burkine and Tarnisha who possessed personalities that would make them enemies very easily could have ruled hundreds of noble-born vampires for a hundred thousand years. Sir Krent who had been tortured by Burkine and Eleonora who had been directly appointed by him understood this better than the subordinate vampires. The two of them wanted to retreat immediately, but at the same time, they discovered the reason they couldn't do so. Wait. There are ghouls among the undead and goblins. The damper is definitely here. Eleonora. They had searched everywhere other than Taylorsheim and hadn't found a single ghoul, but there were numerous ghouls here. Considering that, there was no doubt that these were the ghouls the damper had led across the mountain range from the Mig Shield Nation. In that case, it was only natural that the damper would be here. You know what will happen if we run away without dealing with the damper, don't you? Eleonora. The already pale faces of the subordinate vampires who had been suggesting a retreat turned even whiter. We'll look for the damper. If I recall, his name was Vandali. Eleonora, capture one of the ghouls and make them talk. Sir Krent. I don't need you to tell me what to do. Eleonora. They would quickly dispose of the damper and escape before they were noticed by the superior being who possessed Veda's divine protection. Casting aside her exasperation and disgust towards Sir Krent, Eleonora began to act in order to accomplish that difficult goal. Chapter 16 Something that cannot be run from, cannot be disobeyed, that doesn't exist. Tara was walking back home from the bathhouse, wearing a fur coat to keep out the cold of the winter's night. Fa -ha. It has become cold as of late, hasn't it? Terra, despite being known as the capital of the sun, Taylor Shime's winter was colder than the Devil's Nest forest that she had lived in previously. It wasn't that Terra had become weaker against cold temperatures over the past few years. Nevertheless, as Terra watched the ghouls and undead entertaining themselves and eating food, it occurred to her just how affluent Taylor Shime had become. Many would object to Terra's opinion. In fact, the ghouls' lives might not seem affluent at a glance. Very few of the clothes they wore were made of cloth, the majority of them were made from tanned leather and fur that had been stripped from monsters, making them look like a tribe of savages, because the economic environment consisted of primitive bartering. There were no stores of any kind, there were no resplendent theatres, bookstores selling tomes containing knowledge, restaurants offering delicious foods or anything of the sort. 
but the various things that Vanderlei had created surpassed these. Though board games were considered as entertainment for the wealthy in human cities, Vanderlei had created the simple yet interesting reversi and distributed it freely. He had created numerous seasonings that were even more valuable than the reversi boards, the walnut sauce and acorn cookies that he had been making since when he had lived in the Devil's Nest forest weren't anything unusual other than the fact that he was making them in a Devil's Nest. However, the fish sauce and miso that he had created, no, invented after arriving in Taylorsheim, were astonishing. In addition, he had turned ginger that had only been used as medicine and an unknown plant called wasabi into additional seasonings. He had created these and then distributed it in significant amounts. Those who wanted more could trade for them at the remains of the Adventurers Guild. Vanderlei himself wasn't aware of how astounding these feats were. Even Terra wasn't confident that she understood just how incredible it was. However, in human cities, adding seasoning to food had been a luxury that only the wealthy could afford. Poor commoners would use salt sparingly at most, they almost never tasted sugar. It seemed that things had improved in recent times, but two hundred years ago, when Terra had been a human, that was how things were in the city she lived in. But these seasonings were being offered at exchange rates that anyone could afford. There was no doubt that miso and fish sauce would sell for soaring prices if sold in human cities. Recently, Vanderlei had even started to make kombu dashi and kachabushi, though the latter was still incomplete. Of course, the fact that he had solved the fertility problem that affected the entire Gu race couldn't be forgotten. Personally, Terra was most happy about the fact that he had repaired every public bathhouse in Taylorsheim. For commoners, being able to submerge their bodies in hot water up to their shoulders while bathing was as much of a luxury as seasoning their food. As long as Van Sama is here, the ghouls will prosper for a thousand years. Terra Vanderlei had performed deeds that made her believe this with confidence, but that was also why she was feeling anxious. How should I close the distance between myself and the great Van Sama? Terra, Terra was not a combatant, but an arms smith who created equipment using monster materials. When Vanderlei spent time clearing dungeons and training himself in unarmed fighting, the amount of time that she could spend with him inevitably decreased. Vanderlei's body was small so the only armor he could wear was clothes made of leather or fur, and he was using his own claws as weapons so Terra didn't even have any opportunities to create equipment for him. He had said that he would refrain from venturing far from Taylorsheim until poor Vina had developed to a certain extent and Bastia had safely reached the three-month mark in her pregnancy, but he would be going into another dungeon before spring. I feel the distance, the distance between myself and Van Sama. Terra Even while Terra remained in the city, Bazdia and the others were spending significant periods of time with him, fighting for their lives together. Kaka, a ghoul who had formerly been an adventurer, had recently shown strange movements as well, and it seemed that Zadarus would be accompanying Vanderly on his next journey into a dungeon. How unfortunate. What an unfortunate turn of events this was. If I had daughters, everything would be fine, but I have only had sons up until now. Would it be better for me to start having a daughter now? I am only just over 260 years old, so it might be. Ah, it is impossible, I cannot give birth to another man's child in front of Van Sama. Terra Vanderly was currently acting as something like a maternity doctor. Because of that, if Terra were to attempt to get closer to him by having a daughter, she would surely be found out. That would be an unbearable shame. She had no idea how Bazdia had been able to do such a thing. When she had asked Bazdia herself, Bazdia had replied with a straight face, It's not like I'm letting him see me during the act, so it isn't something to be concerned about, is it? Perhaps this was one of the differences between a natural-born ghoul and a ghoul who had once been a human. So should I do it personally after all? But it would be meaningless if it causes Van Sama to withdraw from me. Are? Terra, just as Terra passed by an alleyway between two buildings, a pebble rolled in front of her feet with a small noise, and as she turned her face towards the alleyway, there was a woman there. Ghouls could see even in this darkness where the only light was coming from the moon, so she could clearly make out that woman's crimson pupils. Could you tell me more about this Van Sama? 
Eleonora, a woman with crimson eyes, red hair and white skin. This appearance was enough to tell Terra with a single glance that this person didn't belong in Taylorsheim, but the emotions that Terra felt right now were not caution or fear, but affection. Of course. Terra, thank you. Let's talk over here, shall we? Eleonora, with a drowsy look on her face, Terra was led into the alleyway by this woman. By Eleonora among the ghouls walking along the streets. Eleonora had chosen the ghoul woman who had been speaking the name Van Sama. She hadn't appeared to be particularly strong and the fact that she was adding Sama to the end of his name indicated that she was referring to the Dambr. Both of these guesses turned out to be correct. She had been successfully lured and captured by the effects of Eleonora's charming gaze without showing any signs of resistance and Eleonora was able to learn information about the damp from her. Van Sama is inside the castle. He is in a room that was originally used by a cabinet minister or general or someone of that sort. He should be sleeping in there. Terra, now we've learned the damp's whereabouts. He lives in the royal castle, but he isn't using the king's room. Is this because there is indeed some superior being that commands the undead? I see. So is there someone with the divine protection of the goddess Veda in this city? Eleonora, divine protection? Terra, Terra gave a puzzled look in response to Eleonora's question. Under the effects of the charming gaze, she treated Eleonora as if the two of them were close family members, but she was unable to answer what she didn't know. But this was a question from someone close to her. Her mind worked in order to answer the question as much as she could. I am sure that would be Van Sama. Terra, that was why it was only natural for her to give this response. As Terra had ceased to be a human over 200 years ago during her teenage years, she was unaware that undead could not be tamed. For her, it was only natural that Vandalie was able to tame the undead. He had undead among his companions ever since she met him so she had no reason to inquire further about it, and when she remembered that New Arsa and the other undead titans showed respect towards him by referring to him as the prophesied holy son, it seemed even more obvious to her that Eleonora was asking about him. Where dash that damper is? Eleonora. This statement made a huge impact among Eleonora and the other vampires. The damp that they were trying to dispose of already possessed the divine protection of the goddess Veda. In that case, not only the ghouls, but every single undead titan in Taylor Shime were the damp's pawns. Not good. This is not good. We must dispose of him at all costs. Sir Krent, one of the only things that the vampires who worship the evil gods feared, a damp building up an organization, had already come to pass. With the countless undead added to the ghouls, their numbers would easily exceed a thousand. Such great numbers were located in a sturdy fortress city. Their defense was still full of holes, but a defensive net that even vampires could not easily sneak through would be complete once the number of undead under the damp's control increased. If Burkine learned of this, Sir Grant would not be able to avoid harsh punishment even if he completed his mission as he was the one who had given the damp enough time to build such an organization in this location. This was a huge failure that even Gibberman, who was normally indifferent to the activities of his subordinates, might simply purge Sir Grant immediately. So Eleonora could understand why Sir Grant was making noise, but she silenced him with her hand. Dispose? What are you disposing of? Terra. Terra had heard Sir Grant's voice and reacted to it. Eleonora's charming demon eyes weren't powerful enough to instantly brainwash their target permanently. We've learned everything we wanted to, but it would be unfortunate if this woman were to become restless now. You don't have to worry. He's just talking to himself. Thank you for telling me all these things. You have been of great help. Eleonora. You fufu. -fu. I am glad to have been of use to you. Terra. Fortunately. Eleonora was able to successfully divert Terra's wandering attention back to herself. You're tired now, aren't you? Stay in my room for tonight. Here, lie down. Eleonora, now that you mention it, my eyelids have grown rather heavy. Well then, excuse me. Terra, Terra gave a yawn as she lay down and quickly fell asleep in this vacant stone house. And then a subordinate vampire drew his sword and swung it down at the defenseless Terra. Gudja, Eleonora Sama, what are you dash? Subordinate. But before his blade reached Terra's body, 
Eleonora broke his arm with her slender hand. What is the meaning of this, you bastard? This ghoul has already served her purpose, what is wrong with disposing of her? Sir Krent. Of course it's wrong to do so, Sir Krent. What have you been listening to all this time? Eleonora. If this is about her spirit, we simply need to pour holy water on her after we kill her. Sir Krent. As Sir Krent expressed his rage, Eleonora put a hand to her forehead and let out a sigh. She could no longer become ill or feel physically weak now that she was a vampire, but talking to him gave her endless headaches. You know, this is different from when your subordinates were the ones dying. The ghoul adores the damp. If she dies, she will happily rush off to the damp. If we pour holy water on her and purify her spirit before that happens, we can prevent her from telling the damper about us, but that damp can tame the undead, how can you be so sure that another spirit will not inhabit her body to turn it into an undead, there are hundreds of undead here, possibly even more than a thousand. Eleonora Even if they poured holy water on the ghoul's corpse to purify her spirit, there was no guarantee that the corpse wouldn't become an undead unless they held a memorial service or destroyed the body thoroughly. The body could be taken over by other spirits and become an undead. It is easy for dead bodies to become undead when there are other undead nearby. That is true. But there would be no problem even if it were to become an undead. It would be a living dead at most. What is a puppet that cannot even speak capable of doing? Sir Krent. If the spirit inhabiting Terra's body is not Terra's, it would not be able to warn anyone about Eleonora and Sir Krent's presence. However, Eleonora already knew this. What do you think will happen if this living dead were to be discovered by the other ghouls and undead? As far as I can tell, even the goblins seem to be able to speak and seem quite intelligent. Eleonora. They had learned through the questions they had asked that Terra was a ghoul with a prominent position in this community. It would cause a large commotion if such an individual was seen wandering around as an undead. They might be able to use the confusion caused by this to find an opportunity to kill the damp. However, it was questionable as to whether they would be to escape the city alive afterwards. Of course, there was also the option of burning the body so that it could not become an undead and then pouring holy water on it. But there was another reason that this was out of the question. Neither Sir Grant nor Eleonora knew of a technique that could silently burn a body without producing any smoke. Being discovered through the smoke produced by burning the body would defeat the purpose of burning the body in the first place. As for the holy water, they simply didn't have much left. Either way, by the time the schoolwoman woke up, they would already have escaped. With that being the case, they needed to save it in case they needed it after killing the vampire and escaping. TCH, hurry and fix your arm. Sir Krent. As if he had finally realized this, Sir Krent clicked his tongue and spat these words towards the vampire who was groaning and clutching his broken arm. I was considerate enough to break your arm instead of your sword which would have been irreparable, so you could at least thank me, but I'll stay silent for now. I can't expect anything from you anyway. We're leaving. Eleonora, leaving behind the peacefully sleeping Terra, Eleonora and her party headed towards the royal castle in which their target resided. They were certain that by the time Terra woke up, everything would be over and they would have already made their escape. Getting into the royal castle was a simple task. There had been nobody acting as guards. Was the damp that confident in his own ability, or did he simply have no sense of caution? How are we going to dispose of him? Sir Krent, if we make any noise, we will be noticed by the undead outside. And now that we have come this far, we need to confirm whether the Sword King Borcus's remains are here. I will use my demon eyes to charm him, and lead him here, and you will decapitate him. Eleonora, Eleonora needed to maintain eye contact with her target while using her charming demon eyes. If eye contact was broken for a moment, their effects would be undone. To guarantee success, it was best to have someone else deal the finishing blow. And Sir Krent's parent, Gubberman, had a habit of gathering the corpses of those known as heroes, raising them as undead and adding them to his collection. Even during the war in which Taylor Shine was destroyed 200 years ago, numerous corpses of heroes had been gathered. 
However, the vampire assigned with the task of retrieving the sword King Borcus's corpse had unfortunately encountered the divine spear of Ice Mikhail. So he had failed. Eleonora didn't really have any reason to help the woman with his hobby, but he was not someone that she wanted to put in an ill mood. She at least needed to put some thought into the task. I think there is a high possibility that he has already turned into an undead, though. Eleonora, I agree, but we still must confirm that. Even though he was defeated by Mikhail, he is still an undead hero. He should still be of a considerably higher rank even after becoming an undead. With that being the case, he shouldn't be serving as the subordinate of a mere damp, but the damp may know where he is. Sir Krent. I know, I will ask the damp while I'm luring him out. Eleonora, if Sir Grant was able to obtain even a fragment of one of Borcus's bones, he may be able to avoid being purged by Gibberman. Perhaps as if holding on to that hope, Sir Grant's eyes had the dangerous glint of someone who had been driven into a corner. If I grow desperate, I might be joining him. It's best to cooperate with him. Eleonora slipped through the completely unguarded door silently and entered the room. Question mark Eleonora. And in the next moment, her eyes met the dams. She opened her eyes wide in surprise, but now that she thought about it, this was convenient. She had activated her charming demon eyes before entering the room just in case, so the damp had been put under its effects immediately. As proof. His own will had faded away from his eyes and become like those of a dead fish. You are Vandaly, aren't you? Eleonora. Yes, I am Vandaly. Vandaly. He answered honestly to her question. He had white hair and odd colored eyes that were a manifestation of his mixed lineage, and his name, too. There was no mistake that this child was the damp the vampires had been targeting. However, Eleonora felt like something was out of place. She wondered whether this damp was really under the effects of her charming demon eyes. Those under the effects of her charming demon eyes normally loosened their face muscles as if drunk, and their tone of speech became relaxed. However, this damp's face was completely expressionless and his tone was normal, and she could feel some kind of strange power in his eyes that were supposed to be hollow and vacant. Looking into them made her feel a chill as if she were peeking into the depths of some abyss, and yet she experienced some kind of mysterious feeling. Could it be that my demon eyes have been resisted? That should be impossible without a high level in the mental resistance skill. Even with the damp status effect resistance and the magic resistance skill of a dark elf, the mental corruption skill is a possibility as well, but if he had that, it's strange that he hasn't become some kind of madman who can't even hold a conversation. He doesn't appear to be insane. But I suppose it's best to be sure. Eleonora had absolute confidence in her own demon eyes, but this damp was someone who possessed the goddess Vida's divine protection. He was an opponent that warranted caution. Hey, what do you think about me? Eleonora. Huh. I think that you're a beautiful person. Vandaly. I see. That makes me happy. Will you be my friend? Eleonora, if you're fine with me being your friend, it would be my pleasure. Vandaly, well then, would you praise the evil god High Hyrish Hukaka that we worship? Say that he is a wonderful god. Eleonora, sure. Vandaly, as Eleonora requested, the damp pressed his hands together in prayer and said, The evil god High Hyrish Hukaku is a wonderful god. And then he looked at Eleonora in silence. It seems that I was worrying needlessly, thought Eleonora. If the damp was conscious, he would have immediately realized that I'm a vampire and been on guard. And there is no way that someone with the divine protection of Vida would praise an evil god in a normal state. The damp would definitely not have complied with my last request if not for the effect of the demon eyes. This damp is still an infant, but according to the information we have, he's supposedly intelligent and is referred to by his subordinates as king and holy son. He should be a proud individual. Eleonora had initially thought that he looked ominous, but now she smiled, thinking that he was rather adorable. Now all she needed to do was question him and then bring him to where Sir Krent and the others were waiting. You have tamed the undead, haven't you? How did you do it? When did you receive the goddess's divine protection? Eleonora. That's right, but even if you ask me how I did it, well, in any case, I'm able to tame them. As for the divine protection, are you talking about the prophecy? Vandaly. What a surprise. 
Not only has he received the goddess's divine protection, but her prophecy as well. There's no doubt that the goddess had taken notice of him and is watching over him even now. Wouldn't it be dangerous to dispose of him? This thought occurred to Eleonora, but she couldn't go against Burkine's orders even if that was true, so she drove it out of her mind. I see. Well then, I wonder if you know about the Sword King Borcus? Can you tell me where he is right now? Eleonora. Borcus should be in the audience chamber. Vandali should be? Has he turned into an undead? Eleonora. Yes. Vandali. TLN, in Japanese. Slash Aru is used for inanimate objects while slash Ayu is used for people when saying something, someone is, be somewhere etc. Eleonora uses the former when asking the question, referring to Borcus's remains as an inanimate object, but is surprised when Vandali replies with the latter, implying that Borcus is a person. As expected, it seems that the Sword King Borcus has turned into an undead. But judging from the fact that he's still in the audience chamber where his body should have been, it's likely that this damp hasn't managed to tame him. I suppose an undead hero is beyond even this damp's abilities to tame after all. It would be best on giving up on retrieving his remains. If Sir Grant wants to attempt it, I'll just have to let him do what he wants on his own. Also, how did you repair the castle and the city? It should have been considerably damaged. Did you make the undead repair them? Eleonora. No, I made Gillums to repair them. Vandali. Gillums? Is he saying that possesses not only the spiritualist job, but the alchemist job as well? It would be best to question him in more detail. Dash. Oi. How much longer are you planning to take? Sir Krent. Sir Krent had entered the room without Eleonora noticing. The subordinate vampires were behind him. You have asked him everything that needs to be asked. There is no more use for him. Sir Krent, I believe we decided that I would lead him to you. Eleonora, silence. We came because you wouldn't come no matter how long we waited. Sir Krent, how impatient of you. Eleonora, in the corner of her vision, Eleonora could see Sir Krent grinding his fangs without even trying to conceal his irritation. Is he trying to threaten me? I would appreciate it if you don't do such unpleasant things, considering that I have to maintain eye contact with the damp so that he stays under the effect of my charming demon eyes. This child might be beneficial to us. It would be useful to ask him how he tamed the undead and how he used Gillums to repair the ruins. Eleonora, if this damp is indeed using the goddess's divine protection to tame the undead, Killing him could incur the goddess's wrath and cause movements from the pure reed vampires who worship Veda hiding in the far depths of distant devil's nests. And if I can find out how he used Gillums to repair the ruins and this method could be applied elsewhere, it would definitely be useful. Not even one year has passed since this damp came to Taylorsheim. If this method could repair an entire fortress city in that short period of time, it might be possible to build small towers and castles in the space of a single month. The strategic value of such a method is immeasurable. Surely even this man would understand that. Eleonora, have you gone insane? The mission we received was to kill the damp. That takes priority, and everything else can come after we have accomplished that. Any secret knowledge or rare skills he might have are irrelevant. Sir Krent. However, what Sir Krent was advocating was that they uphold the rule of their society, the rule that the commands of the pure reeds must be obeyed without question. And that was also correct, as Sir Krent said, what both Burkine and Gibberman emphasized above all else was that their orders should be carried out, anything other than that was unnecessary, praise would not be given if their orders were not carried out, I wonder what you mean when you ask whether I've gone insane? Eleonora. Those words mean exactly as they sound. Could it be that you have developed some affection for him? To me, it looks like you are hesitating to kill him and repeating your questions in order to delay the inevitable. Sir Krent, there is no way that is true. You dare ridicule me? Eleonora. She raised her voice unintentionally, but that was not because of anger but because she was trembling. And as Sir Grant made this accusation that was supposed to be completely off the mark, she was surprised by her own trembling. Impossible. Are you saying that I'm feeling guilty only now, after all this time? 
I was supposed to have discarded these emotions when I swore loyalty to Burkine Sama. She had been abandoned by her family, captured by the lower members of Burkine's society and raised by them. She had received training while witnessing those with poor results being drained of their blood, many of them being her friends. She had endured being forced to kill her comrades who were raised together in the same environment, being encouraged to betray them and repeated torture conducted for absurd reasons in order to finally become a vampire. Listen, Eleonora, there are only two kinds of people in this world, the rulers who stand at the top and the weak who are trampled underfoot. If you want to become a ruler, you have to trample someone beneath your feet. After all, a ruler only becomes a ruler when there is someone beneath them. There is no such thing as a king who doesn't even rule a single commoner, is there? So if you don't want to be oppressed and exploited, you have to oppress and exploit someone else. Burkine. Those words that Burkine had spoken remained in her ears. Steal if you don't want to be stolen from. Persecute others if you don't want to be persecuted kill if you don't want to be killed. This was the only way that Eleonora had been able to protect herself. This was supposed to be an absolute truth. So there's no way that I can hesitate to kill the damp before my eyes. I've killed countless people up until now. I've been betrayed by friends and comrades, almost killed by them and then I killed them in return. Considering that, why would I hesitate now of all times? If you're willing to say that much, then you and your subordinates can just do it, can't you? Are you just going to stand there like scarecrows while making me do all the work on my own? Eleonora, as Eleonora provoked them, the subordinates began to tremble, looked at each other and then took a step, a step backwards. Nobody tried to approach the dam. It was as if they were being overpowered by something. Eleonora, you do it, if you don't. I will report to Burkine Sama that you refuse to kill the damp. Sir Krent! Exclamation mark you bastard! Eleonora! It was only through great strength of will that Eleonora resisted looking at Sir Krent. What was he playing at? Trying to brush aside his numerous failures in the past. She felt an urge to tear his throat out with her claws. But it's just a matter of killing the damp. That's all I need to do. Can you come here? Eleonora! She called out to the damp who had been staring at her the whole time, his eyes were endlessly empty, she would kill this child, it was simple, once he came closer, she simply needed to stab him with a sword or swing her claws at him, it wouldn't even matter if she kicked and tore through his soft belly with the claws of her toes, Eleonora was strong enough to kill even a heavily armored knight with brute strength alone. Killing this child is like crushing an insect. The damp approached her at a brisk, casual pace. Eleonora couldn't stop her heart from throbbing violently, and her breathing was becoming irregular. He was within range for her to kick him. She felt a painful sensation in her chest. That's right, I won't finish him with a kick. My claws. I'll dispose of him with my claws. He was within range of her claws. My hands are trembling. He needs to be a little closer. But if he walks any closer, we'll break eye contact. Sir Krent and the others are in the way behind me, so I can't step back. Eleonora decided that there was no other choice but to lift the damp up. She would simply need to grab hold of his head, thrust her fangs into his neck and drain his blood until he died. And then Eleonora was staring into Vandalie's eyes at point-blank range. There had been no change. There was still no light in these eyes. They were empty, devoid of anything. But she sensed something that existed inside that emptiness. Something that Eleonora couldn't run from no matter how much she tried. Something she couldn't disobey no matter what she did. Something that didn't exist. No, I must not disobey this person. Instinctively. Eleonora became unable to move. She stood completely still, still breathing heavily, unable to pierce the damp with her fangs. At this moment, Sir Grant shouted, Do it, you bastards. Dispose of the damp and Eleonora as well. Just like we did to that piece of trash, Valen. Sir Grant. Wadash. Eleonora. Swords were pointed at Eleonora and the damp. Before they could pierce her back, she flew as if pulled forward by something. She dived onto the bed that the damp had been sleeping on and rolled forward. TCH, she avoided it instinctively, as to be expected of one of Burkine's bodyguards, even if she is rotten. But with that wound, 
it's now impossible for her to defeat us. Sir Krent, there was a wound in Eleonora's back so deep that it might have grazed her heart. Even though she was a noble-born vampire who wouldn't die so easily unless her heart was completely destroyed or her head was cut off, her movements would be slowed from taking damage. If I kill you along with the damper and seal your mouth, Burkine and Gibberman will never know about my failures. Die. Sir Krent. Sir Krent could feel that the damp was emitting an unusual presence. Though it wasn't as powerful as his or Eleonora's, the reason he had been talking so much might have been to shake himself and his followers free of that presence. However, those words would lead to Sir Krent meeting the most terrible of fates. What did you say just now? Vandaly. Ah, the demon eyes weren't having any effect after all. Even as she stared at the damp, petrified with fear. Eleonora forgot the pain of her wound and felt a strange sense of relief. Relief at the fact that those eyes were not looking at her. Chapter 17 I will end you completely. There is no future for you. A little while earlier, Vandaly suddenly woke up. The spirits are making a lot of noise. Vandaly, has something happened? It doesn't seem like there's a large influx of monster spirits coming from the dungeon where Borkers his party is crushing everything in their path. Now that I think about it, Borkus returned from the dungeon today so he should be in his usual spot. So then, what was it? He couldn't get an idea of what it was even when he asked the spirits directly. Well, it would probably be best to stay awake. I don't feel the presence of death. So it doesn't seem like there's a disaster level high rank monster closing in on Taylorsheim. At least, let's relax and wait for now. It could be that poor Vina has just woken up and will be coming here any moment now. Mom is asleep, huh? Vandaly, the small box on the bedside table that contained the enshrined fragment of Darcy's bone was silent. As he started to wonder what to do while waiting, Vandaly felt a presence. Detect life. Vandaly, casting a detection spell with quite a wide area of effect. He discovered that numerous life forms had entered the castle. Who would visit at this time of night? The fact that there are reactions to this spell means that they aren't undead. So just who are they? Excluding people who visit the bathhouse. There should be nobody coming to the royal castle other than me, poor Vina and Borcus. Zadirus is away in a dungeon today, and Bazdia visited Bilda and the other mothers to ask them about childcare and is staying with them. I invited Tara to live in the royal castle as well, but she needs to live in the same building as her workshop as she's busy with work. She seemed very disappointed, so she'll likely come to live here once she's less busy. Leaving that aside, who are these people? I'll use Detect Life one more time. They're coming here instead of going to the audience chamber? Vandaly, which meant that they perhaps had business with Vandaly. So he got up. He waited. Wondering something as silly as whether it would seem villain-like to greet them with, Yo, I've been getting tired of waiting, or, about time. And then he felt a fairly strong presence of death in front of the door. This meant that someone on the other side of the door had murderous intentions towards Vandaly. Who is it? He wondered as he took the fragment of Darcy's bone from the small box on the table and placed it into his breast pocket to keep it safe. Judging from the presence I can sense, it's not such an urgent situation, but just in case. But living people who hold murderous intentions towards me, it's far too early to be one of the people reincarnating from origin. Other people who could have a motive to kill me would be people related to Evbigia or its bandits, or humans from the MIG Shield nation, but that's unlikely as well. It would be difficult for them to cross the boundary mountain range, and even if they wanted to hire an assassin, nobody would accept the job. The most likely answer was monsters, but there were no species intelligent enough to do something like sneak into the castle living near Taylorsheim. <laughs> Could it be spies or something from the MIG Shield Nation? It was possible that there was a squad of highly skilled assassins, as Vandaly considered this possibility. The door opened slightly and a woman slipped inside the room. A woman? And she's not concealing her face. A woman who didn't look like an assassin or monster at first glance had entered the room. She was wearing clothes that looked easy to move in, but she didn't have any kind of armor or weapon on her. She was a beautiful woman with red hair and white skin, only a year or two into her twenties. And then, without pulling a knife from a pocket or reciting an incantation, 
the beautiful woman raised her face question mark Eleonora, and then she opened her eyes she seemed surprised he couldn't blame her for being surprised to encounter the owner of the room that she had just sneaked into but wasn't she a little too surprised but the beautiful woman recovered from her surprise quickly she stared at vanderly intently what powerful eyes even as this thought ran through his mind Vanderly didn't take his eyes off the beautiful woman. She was a trespasser in his room, after all, and strangely enough, he could feel the presence of death coming from her, and he thought that this was some kind of contest where the first person to break eye contact was the loser. With gazes that seemed like they could pierce holes in a surface, they stared at each other, and then the woman's eyes and the mouth suddenly relaxed. You are Vanderly, aren't you? Eleonora. Yes. I am Vanderly. Vanderly. She asked his name, so Vanderly answered honestly. As he answered, he became more and more unsure of who this woman was, but the presence of death. The reaction from danger sense, death is growing weaker and weaker. Hey, what do you think about me? Eleonora. For some reason, she asked a question like this. Huh. I think that you're a beautiful person. Vanderly. I'll give a non-committal response for now. She's actually beautiful, too. I see, that makes me happy. Will you be my friend? Eleonora, in addition to being happy, she's asking me to be her friend. If I were on a street corner, I'd think that she was trying to pick me up. If you're fine with me being your friend, it would be my pleasure. Vanderly. It's exceptionally questionable as to whether being friends with a beautiful woman who has trespassed into my room is a good idea but I'll answer with a yes for now. If I refuse and she gets angry, I'd be scared. Well then, would you praise the evil god High Hirish Hukaka that we worship? Say that he is a wonderful god. Eleonora, for some reason, she's asking me to praise the evil god that she seems to worship. Since everyone in this world knows about the existence of the gods, maybe it's some kind of etiquette in human society to show respect for the god that the other person believes in before introducing yourself? Well, I don't really care. Since it isn't Trud Corti or Elder, I don't mind giving some insincere praise to this high Hirish Hukaka god. The evil god High Hirish Hukaku is a wonderful god. Vandali. But just who or what is this beautiful woman? She isn't showing any signs of wanting to cause further harm to mum, nor is she doing anything to try and kill me. And she probably isn't here to invite me to join her religion. Is there a possibility that she's a spy or something from the Orborn Kingdom side of the continent? When Taylor Shime was destroyed. The first princess and around 500 citizens escaped to the Hartner Duchy of the Orborn Kingdom. They would naturally wish to restore their homeland one day, and the Orborn Kingdom that welcomed them would surely wish for Taylor Shime's restoration as well. They would have set up a political marriage or something with the first princess to make the nation's ruler their relative, and turning Taylor Shime into one of its vassal nations would surely be profitable for them. There's no longer a route through which the MIG Shield nation can send their troops. They could maintain the nation as long as they have walls and soldiers to keep the monsters at bay, and adventurers would come swarming in large numbers as there are four dungeons nearby. Could this woman have set out to investigate Taylor Shime's current state? But when she arrived here, the walls, the city and even the castle had been restored and there were undead and monsters living here. And there was even an unknown king present. So then has she come here to contact the king who currently leads the group who has taken over Taylor Shime? She'll negotiate if possible, and if not, she'll have the guys outside the room dispose of me. I still don't get why she made me praise the evil god, though, they got me. I didn't expect to spies or humans to sneak in, so the security is full of holes. Without an ability like Vandalie's Glam transmutation to create roads among the cliffs, crossing the mountain range with hundreds of people or more would be difficult, and the tunnel leading to the Orborn Kingdom was still sealed. He had never imagined that humans would come in from the outside. The monsters couldn't climb the walls, and they wouldn't even approach since they could sense the presence of the undead titans. That was why there had been no guards on the high sturdy walls and it would have been easy for someone to sneak into the city or castle with a little knowledge. Vanderly hadn't even thought about the security situation. He cursed himself for his own carelessness, 
but felt grateful that he could talk to this person more than the people who were trying to kill him with no arguments such as the adventurers of the MIG Shield Nation or the religious fanatics who worshipped Alda. For now, I should ask for the woman's name. You have tamed the undead, haven't you? How did you do it? When did you receive the goddess's divine protection? Eleonora, before he could ask, he was asked a question. And the question asked was something that he'd never even thought about. How did I tame the undead? She says, I'm not really doing anything special. Is it really something that you'd go out of your way to ask? I haven't thrown special balls to capture weak and undead, nor have I defeated them to have them stand up again and want to become my friends. I made Bone Man and the others myself, and the ghouls and the undead titans of Taylor Shima under the effect of the death attribute charm. I had to negotiate with Borkus. I don't really feel the sense that I've tamed them. I didn't think it would be that strange considering that there are tamer jobs in this world. Could it be the sheer number of undead? From her perspective, it might seem like I've tamed over a thousand undead, so maybe she wants to hear whatever secret or trick I'm using. Unaware that it was common knowledge that taming the undead was impossible, this was how Vandalie interpreted her question and the goddess's divine protection. Ah, is she talking about the prophecy that Nuazo received? That's right, but even if you ask me how I did it, well, in any case, I'm able to tame them. As for the divine protection, are you talking about the prophecy? Vandali. I asked a question in response, and even though she seems surprised, she also seems to understand. Even though gods exist, prophecies are probably rare. I ended up asking her a question in response but I'm relieved that she isn't bothered by it. Oh, I can feel her murderous intent returning a little. I see. Well then, I wonder if you know about the Sword King Borkus? Can you tell me where he is right now? Eleonora, I was lost in thought and missed my chance to ask her name. She's asking about Borkus this time. I don't know why she's interested in Borkus, but... Maybe she wants to know how much military strength is present here. Borkus should be in the audience chamber. Vandali should be? Has he turned into an undead? Eleonora. Yes. Vandali. TLN. Same dialogue as last chapter. Same TLN. In Japanese, slash Aru is used for inanimate objects while slash Ayu is used for people when saying something, someone is, be somewhere etc. Eleonora uses the former when asking the question, referring to Borkus's remains as an inanimate object, but is surprised when Vandali replies with the latter, implying that Borkus is a person. Neither Borkus's location nor the fact that he had turned into an undead was something that needed to be hidden, so Vandali answered both questions. When he did, the woman seemed to ponder something. The murderous intent coming from the woman has disappeared again, but I can still feel a response from danger sense. Death on the other side of the door. I should call Borkus and the others here just in case. I have to awaken my undead insects, ask them to come to the room below and also, how did you repair the castle and the city? It should have been considerably damaged. Did you make the undead repair them? Eleonora. And then the woman asked about the castle and the city. She might have been surprised after seeing the restored Taylor Shine that had previously been a ruin. No, I made Gillums to repair them. Vandali. Repairing things by making Gillums is definitely extraordinary. Even now, it costs thousands of mana to make a single Gillum, sometimes even more than 10,000. Even if it's theoretically possible, it's definitely impossible for ordinary alchemists to do in practice. The Gillum transmuter job was undiscovered so only someone with over 100 million mana could possibly use such a method, as Vandali had no proper knowledge regarding Gillum's, that was how he interpreted the woman's surprised reaction when he mentioned Gillum's, and then the door behind the woman opened and several people stepped inside, led by an irritated looking man, <laughs> things have changed, for now, I'll turn the floor into a Gillum, the men who have entered aren't hiding their faces and don't have weapons drawn, though they are armed. They're shooting dangerous glares in this direction. Come to think of it, including the beautiful woman, all of them have crimson pupils. Oi, how much longer are you planning to take? Sir Krent, the man is saying something dangerous, that I should be disposed of since there's no further use for me. 
he's not even making an attempt to conceal his murderous intent and malice, despite that, he seems fully concerned about the woman, not me. Is the battle finally beginning? Vanderly thought, but the woman began arguing with the man, still maintaining eye contact with Vanderly. This child might be beneficial to us. It would be useful to ask him how he tamed the undead and how he used Gillums to repair the ruins. Eleonora, I'm happy that you acknowledge my value, but it'd be really helpful if you could try and stop the man. Still, saying things like this while looking into the eyes of the person you're referring to is quite questionable, isn't it? Eleonora, have you gone insane? The mission we received was to kill the damp. That takes priority and everything else can come after we have accomplished that, any secret knowledge or rare skills he might have are irrelevant. Sir Krent, this was the response the man gave. Vanderly had finally learned the beautiful woman's name, but he had also heard something that he was far more concerned about. Killing the damp takes priority. Does that mean that these are believers of Alda? They're not spies from the Orborn Kingdom? Was everything about the evil god a lie? It seems like all of my guesses up until now have been wrong, but why is this man saying these things calmly right in front of me? He's either very confident in his own abilities or simply underestimating me. Either way, it's unpleasant, Eleonora. You do it, if you don't. I will report to Burkine Sama that you refuse to kill the damp. Sir Krent! Exclamation mark you bastard! Eleonora! And at the end of it all! Eleonora is being threatened to kill me, it seems that this Burkine they mentioned is a really fearsome person, but this Eleonora person hasn't broken eye contact with me during all this talking, don't her eyes hurt mine sting a little. While these thoughts ran through his mind, Vanderly decided how he was going to deal with these people, for now, I'll capture all of them alive, I could question them after killing them, but if they were dispatched by the Orborn Kingdom. I could use them in the future if I capture them alive. Eleonora's murderous intent rose a third time, did she intend to kill Vanderly as she had been ordered to by Burkine? Can you come here? Eleonora, it seemed that she had steeled her resolve. She asked Vanderly to move closer, it can't be helped. I'll approach her, and at the timing at which she tries to kill me. Vanderly approached her while thinking this. He entered the range of a possible kick but Eleonora didn't move. Her murderous intent faded rapidly. He approached close enough that he could reach out and touch her, but she still didn't move. He couldn't feel her murderous intent at all anymore. Even consciously using the danger sense, death that was always active, there was no response. It seemed that she had either decided not to kill Vanderly or become unable to. With this, she was no longer an enemy. However, he could feel a remarkable response from the men behind her, unlike the response he could feel from Eleonora, the response he felt from them was growing larger, and it was pointed at not only Vanderly, but at Eleonora as well, a conflict within their organization, well, unlike me, she's not in enough danger to be killed suddenly, ah, this isn't good, as Eleonora took Vanderly's head in both hands and lifted him up, the men moved, do it, you bastards, Dispose of the damp and Eleonora as well, just like we did to that piece of trash, Valen. Sir Krent, the proud looking man shouted with bloodshot eyes, and his subordinates drew their swords to kill Vanderly and Eleonora. Their movement was faster than he had expected based on the response he felt from danger sense, death, and he reacted a moment too late. Using telekinesis, Vanderly flew backwards together with Eleonora. The bed creaked and blood sprayed from her wounded back. However, it seemed that the wound that almost reached her lungs wasn't enough to kill her. That was to be expected. She and the others were all vampires, after all. Having finally realized this, Vanderly looked at the men, still being held in Eleonora's arms. They were shouting something, but he didn't care about that. What did you say just now? Vanderly. That piece of trash, Valen. These men had called Vanderly's father who had been killed before he was born, Darsa's husband, a piece of trash. The effect of the charming demon eyes has been cut off. Kill him before he summons the undead outside. Sir Krent. Sir Krent drew his own sword as he spat orders at the subordinate vampires whose movements were slowed as if they were in awe of the damp. 
he had no intention of exchanging words with Vandalie, no matter what he said, if Eleonora heals herself and becomes able to fight, I will not be able to defeat her, if the damp summons his undead, we will be overwhelmed by their numbers, the two of them joining forces would be the worst possible turn of events, they have to be killed now at all costs, the subordinate vampires bared their fangs and rushed in to tear the two of them apart with their swords and claws drop. Vandalie, however, the floor disappeared from beneath their feet, the floor that Vandalie had preemptively turned into a golem changed shape with the golem transmutation skill, turning into a makeshift pitfall. A pitfall? Vampire impossible. Vampire, the vampires and the bed fell down helplessly, only the floor below the bedside table remained as it was, but the vampires who had rushed in towards Vandalie and Eleonora hadn't noticed that. Th this is? Eleonora, on top of the bed that defied gravity to float downwards gently, Eleonora was astonished. Too many things had happened in a single instant, her mind wasn't processing all of this new information quickly enough, as she blinked, seemingly unconcerned about the wound on her back. Vandalie thought that she looked quite adorable with this expression now that her former ability was gone. It would have been good to be able to say such cool sounding words but there was someone that he was more concerned about than her right now. Please wait a moment. Vandalie. He wasn't really concerned about Eleonora. She wasn't an enemy. She had appeared before him with murderous intent, but that murderous intent had vanished without Vandalie having done anything to it. Even if she was one of his father's enemies, he would deal with that when it came. Vandalie turned his eyes towards Sir Krent. Q, such impudent acts. Sir Krent. The noble-born vampire Sir Krent who possessed the ability to fly had fallen for a moment, but now he had regained his stance and was floating lightly in the air. There were none among the subordinate vampires foolish enough to land on their backs or heads, as to be expected of vampires. Hurry up and kill them. Sir Krent. Yeah, we'll do that. Borcus. Question mark Sir Krent as Sir Krent turned to look in the direction that this unfamiliar male voice had come from. He heard a slashing sound and then in the corner of his vision, he saw his own arm that was still holding his sword and his leg that had been severed above the knee flying away. G Gah. Why you bastard? Sir Krent, the bald titan who possessed only half a face with finely chiseled features responsible for the sky rend attack laughed and said, Don't scream so loudly. Oops. My bad. Are we taking them alive? Borcus, change of plans. Borcus, please kill everyone except for this person. But I would be happy if you let me kill that one. Vandalie, yeah, roger that. Just when did you manage to charm such a pretty lady? Borcus, no, no, I'm the one who has been charmed. Vandalie, are you serious? At this rate, things will start to look bad if we don't find Zandia Jouchin soon. Borcus, seeing an undead with extraordinary blood thirst emanating from his entire body, Eleonora whispered in wonder. Th the Sword King Borcus, it can't be, you tamed him? Eleonora, the titan hero who was said to have cut off the head of a dragon in a single attack, defeated in the war two hundred years ago, and even now, he had simultaneously severed the arm and leg of Sir Krent, a noble-born vampire. It was impossible that such a powerful undead could be tamed. The difficulty of taming a monster is proportional to the monster's rank and intelligence. Borkus possessed strength exceeding that of lesser dragons, and was intelligent enough to hold conversations even with the goddess's divine protection. The difficulty of taming such a being should be beyond comprehension. However, there were many vampires who, unlike Eleonora, didn't have the time to notice and be surprised by such facts. Sir Krent's armor. Vampire, you bastards, keep the undead busy. I will kill the damper in the meantime. Sir Krent, as you will. Vampires, the ten or so remaining subordinate vampires faced Borcus while Sir Krent turned to Vandalie, who had slipped away from Eleonora's arms, and began reciting an incantation. Though subordinate vampires were lesser beings among vampires, their power posed a threat to humans. Even though they didn't possess magical abilities like noble-born vampires, they possessed immense physical strength, sharp reflexes, 
claws that could tear through iron and tremendous vitality and regenerative abilities that prevented them from dying as long as they weren't decapitated or had their hearts destroyed. And they also possessed the human-like trait of receiving bonuses to their skills from jobs. Facing ten such vampires was utter madness. Jaya. Vampire. A. A. Dragon from the Wall. Gaha. Vampire. S. Sir Krent's armor. Please save. Gai. Vampire. But such vampires were trampled down without being able to resist in the slightest. Ga. Jai. The one responsible for this wasn't Borkus, but the undead dinosaurs that had been created from the dinosaur corpses Vandali had received on his third birthday. There was a large banquet hall on the unoccupied floor beneath the cabinet minister's office. Vandali had already turned its walls into gillums. That was why they had changed shape to form a corridor through which the undead dinosaurs had charged in from the dining hall. Apart from those who had been taken by surprise, the subordinate vampires attempted to deal with them. But Vandali had also turned the floor that they were standing on into a gillum. As their legs were caught by the arms that had sprouted from the ground and their movements were stopped by holes that had suddenly appeared beneath them, the undead dinosaurs pierced them with their teeth and horns. They had the upper halves of their bodies shredded by the teeth of a zombie Tyrannosaurus rex, their heads smashed like ripe fruit by a direct hit from the tail of a zombie Ankylosaurus and thrown around in the jaws of a zombie in the shape of a mysterious one-eyed cat with scales. Every time they attempted to counterattack, fists would extend towards them from the walls and floor to hinder them. And then they were overwhelmed by the undead without being able to move properly. Meanwhile, only three of the subordinate vampires faced Borkus as they had been ordered to. Here, single flash. Borkus, with an unenthusiastic voice, Borkus swung his magic sword towards them and released the most basic of martial skills. You fool. Iron wall. Iron body. Vampire. A subordinate vampire quickly readied the shield that was on his back and used shield technique and armor technique martial skills. Both of them were skills increasing his physical and magical damage resistance that he had finally become able to use after his skills had reached level 5. There was no way that a sword swung with a technique such as single flash could touch even the vampire's pinky finger through such a defense. However, Borkus's magic sword cut through the subordinate vampire's shield, arm and entire body like a hot knife through butter, come on, you have to survive at least one hit. Borkus, the martial skill's power was proportional to the user's skill level, the level 5 shield technique and armor technique skills couldn't possibly stop the single flash of Borkus, whose skill had reached level 10 and granted him the superior version, sword king technique. Hi hi Vampire. Sir Krent's armor. It is impossible for us. Please assist us. Vampire. The last two finally understand the difference in our strength, but are they stupid? Borkus wondered as he swung his magic sword once more. Look out, triple slash. Borkus. Borkus released three sideways slashes at high speed. They cut a subordinate vampire's neck. Below the chest and the base of his legs, blood scattered everywhere as his legs and head went rolling across the floor. R, R, vampire. But the other one was saved by the fact that he's only had both legs cut off just above the knees. Well, I'll kill him soon as well anyway. W, wait. I surrender. I'll tell you anything. I'll tell you about Sir Krent's armor, Gubman's armor, and even Burkine's armor. So please spare me, vampire. Sorry. But I've been told we don't need any prisoners. Borkus, I've been told to kill everyone but that pretty lady, and I have to do what the boss says. Oh, I've grown up quite a bit, haven't I? And it's an old saying that you should kill goblins no matter how pitiful they look. Borkus, saying an old proverb spoken amongst adventurers since old times, Borkus swung his sword three times, scattering blood everywhere. The three small fries had turned into masses of meat giving off a delicious smell. Well, you can blame yourself for becoming that kid's enemy. Borkus. Borkus picked up one of the legs rolling around and began munching on it raw. Delicious. Subordinate vampires taste better than they look. I suppose I'll try their brains and organs next. Ah, uh, I should have at least brought some salt with me. With fresh meat as a snack, Borkus watched the execution die. You damn damn bruh. 
Sir Krent. Shouting these words, Sir Krent unleashed a lightning attack. The lightning that was writhing through the air like a snake was probably very powerful. There was no doubt that being grazed by it would stop Vandalie's heart and taking a direct hit would turn him into ash. However, it vanished upon coming into contact with the magic absorption barrier surrounding Vandalie's body. Wad Ash. Very well. I will slaughter you personally with my claws. Sir Krent. Swinging his claws, Sir Krent closed in on Vandalie with the speed of the wild beast. His movements were unexpectedly sharp for someone missing an arm and a leg. I'll have your head. I ain't here. Sir Krent. Such wonderful speed. To Vandalie, it appeared as if Sir Krent had vanished in one moment and appeared in front of his eyes in the next. However, the impact negating barrier and magic absorption barrier had both been set up. After what had happened during the battle against Bgogan, Vandalie had decided to make them extra thick. What? My mana, my strength. Sir Krent. Sir Krent felt as if the air had been replaced by a heavy, viscous substance. The moment he touched Vandalie's barriers, his arm had stopped moving. His arm should have been strong enough to destroy a castle's walls. But Sir Krent felt an incredible amount of resistance from trying to move it just a single millimeter. It was as if it was submerged in an impossibly viscous liquid. Sir Krent thought that this was some kind of special defensive spell. And he understood how he could pierce through it. Phew ha ha ha. This simply means that I must attack with an attack powerful enough to overcome your spell. Sir Krent. Laughing loudly, he once again unleashed his high-level unarmed martial skill. I ain't here. His arm began moving towards Vandalie again, one centimeter at a time. He was less than 30 centimeters away now. The moment my claws reach him, I will crush the damp's fragile skull and scatter its contents across the floor as he dies a terrible death. You're right about that, but you can't do it. Vandalie. Sir Krend had thought that the damp's expression was empty due to despair, but the damp said this proudly. Quite the bluff. Sir Krend was inferior to Eleonora, but his mana and martial skills were worthy of being called those of a noble born vampire. It will take some time, but even with one arm, breaking a barrier like this would be. One arm? Sir Krend's arm and leg haven't regenerated? Eleonora. Eleonora noticed that Sir Krent's wounds were simply continuing to spill blood. With the regenerative ability of a noble born vampire, the wounds should have stopped bleeding and begun to regenerate by now like the one in her own back, unless cut by a sword made of silver or a magic sword of the light attribute. However, there were no signs of this occurring at all. I've used a spell called Healing Negation that nullifies self-healing abilities. It only works while I continue casting it, but it's enough to kill you. Vandali. It took a moment for Eleonora and Sir Grant to understand the flat-toned words that Vandali spoke. Ah, I, I, I. Sir Grant. The moment he finally understood what Vandali meant, Sir Grant let out a shout that didn't quite sound like a scream or roar. He tried to break through Vandali's barrier at all costs, before he died from losing too much blood. Vampires have incredible regenerative abilities. Noble-born vampires in particular can lose limbs and regrow new ones. And after some time passes, the limbs return to normal. That was why Lenora and Sir Grant never bothered learning healing spells. They didn't even carry potions with them. You, Sir Grant. Sir Grant attempted to use lightning and fire spells as a last ditch effort to cauterize his wounds and stop his bleeding, but they faded away as they had their mana absorbed by the magic absorption barrier. And the more he struggled, the more blood poured out of his open wounds. You, oh, Sir Krent. Sir Krent's movements grew remarkably weaker, and his originally white skin became deathly pale. Why, you bastard! I, I am there, subordinate of the pure reed vampire Gubman, who has received the divine protection of the evil god of joyful life, High Hirish Hukaka. If you kill me, hundreds of vampires will. Even the MIG Shield Nation is our puppet. They'll send their forces here, if you don't want that to, Sir Krent. And then he started begging for his life. But it was partially true. Vandalie seemed to think that his words had some merit to them. He looked not at Sir Krent, but at Eleonora behind him. What this guy is saying, is it true? Vandalie, on the other side of Vandalie, 
Eleonora could see Sir Grant's face tensing up. No, this man who killed your father is indeed the subordinate of a pureed vampire, who does have connections to the Mig Shield Nation, but they will not move for the sake of this man. Eleonora, you bastard, wagging your tail for a damp, Sir Grant, your breath stinks. Vandaly, Vandaly plunged both of his arms into the angry Sir Krent's chest. Gaga? Sir Krent, with spirit form transformation applied to his arms, he moved them around inside and extracted his spirit while he was still alive. I've never met my father, so I can't say that I love him. I don't even know if I respect him. So even if you ridicule my father, even if you're the one who killed him, I can't hate you on his behalf. Vandaly, and I've learned the hard way on earth and in origin that blood relatives aren't always your allies. And then Vandaly began to tear the spirit that he had pulled out. Jaya, I, 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 Sir Krent, but my mother loved my father, and the fact that you have connections to the Mig Shield Nation means that you're not entirely unrelated to her death. I'm sure you were involved with the extermination force that was sent into the Devil's Nest Forest, too. That's why I hate you bitterly. I'll never forgive you. I don't want to be liked by you. You make me sick. I'm not going to let you have another life. Vandaly, his spirit form arms found a shining sphere, the size of a marble that he could pinch between his fingers. And then he seized it. S stop. Anything, anything but that. Sir Krent. This sphere was a soul, the core of a spirit, covered in spirit form. If compared to a cell. This was the part that would contain genetic information. Sir Krent understood this instinctively and pleaded with Vandaly, but Vandaly wasn't listening. He crushed Sir Krent's soul with all of his strength. Ga, Jaya, Jaya, Sir Krent. With a cracking sound, it crumbled and fell to the floor. The base fragments that made up Sir Krent danced in the air like particles of light. Sir Krent, who had been screaming for his life, stopped moving at that moment. His heart was still beating and he was still breathing, and if there were machines available to perform electroencephalography, they would probably be able to detect brain waves. However, Sir Grant would never move again. What a nice sound, I've always wanted to do this. Vandaly, he had broken a soul. In Mango and Light novels, Vandaly had occasionally seen spells or items that could break or destroy souls. But he had always wondered ever since his time in origin whether it was really possible to do it. Because in this world, and even on earth or in origin, there was no hell to punish the dead. It was impossible to imagine that Rod Gorty, the god of the circle of transmigration, would make the effort to create one. If the guys who have taken everything from me were to simply die, pass on and be reincarnated, it wouldn't be worth it. But those who had their souls broken would have only oblivion awaiting them. Their souls would never find their way to Rod Corti. There would be no new start for them. But it takes a bit too long. It's not something I can do during a battle. I have to do it after immobilizing them or killing them first, I suppose. Vandaly. Vandaly put Sir Krent on the floor. He turned to see Borkus staring at him with his jaw dropped, half-eaten subordinate vampire legs still in hand and the petrified, wide-eyed Eleonora. What are they so surprised about? Just now, what? Did you do to him? You broke something of Sir Krent's. What was it? Eleonora, I'm an undead, and even I could see it. If my eyes aren't playing tricks on me, that was his soul. The kid went and broke that vampire's soul. Ha ha, he really did it. Borkus, his soul. Eleonora, Eleonora's expression was one of dumbfounded awe while Borkus gave a nervous laugh. Vandaly consciously used the muscles in his cheeks that normally never moved to smile at them. Um, I'll be the one questioning you now. Ah, you don't really have to praise Vida or anything. Vandaly, for some reason, the two of them remained petrified. You have acquired the soul break skill. Chapter 18 Apparently I'm her number one and only one. After breaking Sir Grant's soul and having his dinosaur zombies eat the body so that he would gain experience points, Vandaly brought Eleonora to the dining hall. He did this so that he could gather all of the important people here to listen to what Eleonora had to say. I'm terribly sorry. Terra, the one apologizing while kneeling on the floor was not Eleonora, but Terra. To think that I was charmed so easily spilled all of Van Sama's secrets and then carelessly went to sleep. 
how can I apologize for such a thing? Terra, no, please don't worry about it. Vandaly. Vandaly had panicked after Elinora told him what happened to Terra, but considering that she had fallen asleep on a stone floor in the middle of winter, she seemed quite healthy. Vandaly didn't think any more of the incident than that, so he felt that Terra didn't need to apologize so fervently. It could not be helped, Terra. Even if you had high levels in skills such as status effect resistance and magic resistance, you would likely have been unable to resist the demon eyes, Zadiris. And if you apologize any more than that, you'll only cause trouble for Van. Bazdia. You, thank you very much for your words. But, why have things turned out this way? Terra, Terra directed this question at Vandali who was sitting right next to her, the two of them were sitting on a single titan-sized chair, not only could they hear each other breathing, their bodies were in contact, I heard that you were worrying about how there was distance between me and you, so I decided to try shortening that distance to zero, Vandaly, W who did you hear such a thing from, Terra, Eleonora, Vandaly, you were, what does this woman think she's doing, blabbering such things so freely, Terra, 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 your tone is becoming unpleasant and do not squirm so much, your elbow has been hitting the boy. Zadiris, as Terra had moved around with her head in her hands, realizing that Vandaly had been told everything she had said before she lost consciousness, her elbow had inflicted considerable damage to him. So why is this woman here? Terra, after quick recovery, Terra glared at Eleonora. She seemed to be looking not at Eleonora's face, but at a spot below Eleonora's neck, seemingly wary of the charming demon eyes. Eleonora sat quietly in her chair. Her hands and legs weren't bound, nor had she been gagged or blindfolded. It seemed that she might fly away and escape if they tried to place such restrictions on her. I am here to tell Vandali Sama everything I know. Of course. Eleonora, for some reason, Eleonora was adding Sama to Vandalie's name and acting as if she were his vessel, trying to stop her after those events was difficult, Eleonora had praised the goddess Vida despite Vandalie having told her it wasn't necessary, and after that, she had kissed his hand and sworn loyalty to him, if he hadn't stopped her, she would have likely gone on to kiss his feet, on top of that, Eleonora addressed him with an incredibly formal tone and he had to put a lot of effort into asking her to return to her original, informal way of speaking. She had said, I would never dare to, and Vandalie had only managed to convince her by telling her that this was an order, gesturing with his hand by forming a fist. For some reason, she had made an expression that made it impossible to tell whether she was scared or happy. Um, can we have a discussion of what comes next after we listen to what Eleonora San has to say? I woke up to find that lots of things have happened, so I still don't know what's going on. Darsa, these are Darsa Sana's words. So perhaps we should accept her suggestion? Sam. Sam, who had recklessly brought his carriage inside the royal castle's dining hall, relayed Darsa's words. And then Eleonora began to speak about the reason she and the other vampires had come here, and what the vampires who worshipped the evil god of joyful life, High Hirish Hukaka, had done to Darsa and Vandali. Incidentally, Eleonora, Sir Krent and their subordinates hadn't been haunted by the spirits of those they had killed up until now because they had preemptively poured holy water over their entire bodies numerous times as an anti-spiritualist method. They had endured full body burns in order to prevent any spirits from informing Vandalie of their whereabouts. It was a very effective method against Vandalie, but quite a radical approach. Things are on a much larger scale than I thought. Vandalie. Vandalie sighed as he listened. The vampires who had killed his father Valen had never become directly involved with him after he regained his memories up until now and he could never learn anything more about them so he hadn't really had strong feelings towards them. They had been hiding their existence behind High Priest Gordon and Hines, after all, the Mig Shield Nation was a nation of the Amid Empire that worshipped his enemy, the god of law and fate Elder. he had never even dreamed that its strings were being pulled by a greater power, if they were going to advocate that vampires were evil. They should have at least prevented vampires from gaining control over them. Well, 
the MIG Shield Nation and a MIG Empire were always my enemies to begin with. Vandali, the truth appears to be stranger than fiction. Sam, it was a truth that shocked even Sam, who had once been a citizen of the MIG Shield Nation. The pure reed vampires, Burkine, Ternisha, and Gibberman, the noble-born and subordinate vampires who served them, and Marshal Thomas Palpebeck. Even though Vandali had destroyed one enemy, it was as if his enemies had explosively increased in number. And they were even involved in the war 200 years ago? You guys instigated that? Borkus, on top of that, the vampires who worshipped the evil god of joy for life were considerably malicious. They had apparently been behind the war in which the MIG Shield nation destroyed Taylorsheim. Nobody could blame Borkus for exuding rage from his entire body. I, I hadn't been born at that time, so I don't know the details. But I've heard that Gubberman used the war to have his subordinates collect the dead bodies of Taylorsheim's heroes. Eleonora, Eleonora spoke hastily, perhaps scared of Borkus, the rough outline of the teachings of High Hyrush Hukaka, the evil god of joy for life, was that in this world, there were those who had their lives toyed around with and those who toyed with others' lives, by toying with others' lives, one could become a superior being with the divine protection of such a god, it was apparently possible to tame undead who would normally be impossible to tame or at least create undead and turn them into servants. And one of the three people who had attained that evil god's divine protection, the pure reed vampire Gibberman, apparently had an interest in turning the dead bodies of those praised as heroes into undead and adding them to his collection. That was why he sent his subordinates into wars and large-scale monster hunts in which heroes lost their lives in order to retrieve the heroes' bodies. He had dispatched his subordinates in the war 200 years ago, too. I see, so that's why Gina and Zandia Jouchin's bodies aren't here anymore, but why didn't they take my body? Borkus, perhaps because your body was terribly damaged with your dominant arm severed and your magic sword broken, it would not be strange to think that they would have thought you would not be a powerful asset even after becoming an undead. Nuaza. Nuaza. Are you trying to say that I'm not a powerful asset? Borkus, it is not me who thinks this. I am simply saying that the vampires might have thought this way. Nuaza, this is just something I overheard, but apparently the other bodies were carried out first because yours was terribly damaged, and then Mikhail returned before your body could be taken. Eleonora, and then Mikhail and the vampires who had encountered each other had apparently done battle. It was likely that the vampires had thought that Gubberman would reward them if they simply killed Mikhail, who had wounds all over his body and had lost his precious spear, and then retrieved Borkus's body afterwards. However, as an adventurer who was said to be destined to become S-Class, Mikhail was powerful even without the spear that was the origin of his title, he succeeded in repelling the vampires, however, as a result of the stamina he expended in doing so, his wounds deteriorated and were treated too late, causing him to perish. To think that something like that happened right next to me while I was dead. So I guess he set up the dice so that the vampires wouldn't be able to get inside. Borkus, what had finished Mikhail off wasn't the dragon golem that had been carefully crafted by the goddess, but the vampires who had come to retrieve Borkus's body. It was quite the questionable story. But it seems like we won't find their bodies even if we defeat the dragon Gillum. Vandali, all right, kid. We'll pillage them. Take back the ladies from that Gibberman vampire. A man becomes an adult for the first time when he steals a woman from another. Borkus. Ah, but what about Eleonora San? Doesn't this mean I've stolen her from the vampire called Burkine? Vandali, this one doesn't count. Borkus. A. Eh, well. He is someone I want to destroy in the future, but please wait a decade or two. Vandali, I don't like situations where love is stolen. Whether I would be on the stealing side or having love stolen from me, no, it's questionable as to whether this falls under the category of stolen love in the first place. Still, no matter what Vandali said, he would still end up doing deadly battle with the vampires worshipping the evil god of joy for life. They were a group that was even more necessary to exterminate than the high priest Gordon and Hines in order for him to survive and live a happy life. Since they were vampires, they were immortal. If he left them alive, 
they would continue coming up with plans forever until Vanderlee died. Because of this, he felt no opposition to retrieving Gina and Zandia's corpses and turning them into undead, and if they were already undead, stealing them away was the obvious choice. But, also, can you stop trying to put me on a throne? Vanderlee. For some reason, Borcus was trying to marry Vanderlee to Zandia, who had been second in line to the throne while alive, and place him on Taylor Shime's throne. What, you're already a king, right? What's the problem? Borcus, the boy doesn't know when to give up. Zadiris, well, perhaps it can be considered practice for becoming a nobleman? Sam Botchin, there's no need to worry, you don't need knowledge about laws and taxes. You're not taxing anyone now, are you? Saria, Taylor Shyam isn't really a proper nation right now, so it'll be more like pretending to be a king. Rita, you might be able to gain a new title and make Borcus and the others even stronger, you know? Basdia, the thing that was most troubling was that everyone other than Vandali seemed to agree on the idea. Um, everyone. It isn't that Vandali is against it. He is just holding himself back because of the first princess and her descendants in the Orborn kingdom. Darsa. Darsa relayed her son's thoughts in his place. It was possible that the first princess who had escaped to the Orborn kingdom and her descendants would make a claim to the throne and try to restore their royal lineage. Vandali had mistakenly thought last night that Eleonora was a spy who had come from the Orborn kingdom for this very purpose. The war had taken place 200 years ago. With the titans' lifespans of 300 years, the same as the ghouls, it was cutting it close, but there was still a chance that she was alive. If that were the case, if Vanderly sat on Taylor Shime's throne for even a moment, it would become very troublesome, wouldn't Princess Lavia and her descendants praise the Holy Son who restored Taylor Shime and gladly give up the throne? After all, the Holy Son has restored Taylor Shime's castle, walls and cityscape to its past splendor. Nuaza. As Nuaza said, these are things could all be called Vandalie's achievements. Even though the removal of the trees and extermination of the monsters had been carried out by the undead titans and ghouls, it was his Gillum transmutation skill that had restored the city's structures. Even if the first princess and her descendants had returned to Taylorsheim, without Vandalie, it would have taken decades of time an unimaginable amount of labor and an equivalent amount of funds to return the city to normal. Vandalie had rebuilt the city, so this wouldn't be necessary. But I don't think they'll hand over the throne. And no matter how good a person the princess is, the people of the Orborn Kingdom will have their own expectations of her. Vandalie. It was even possible that assassins would be sent to kill Vandalie. In the worst case scenario, an extermination force with high-class adventurers might be dispatched. Other than the damp Vandali, none of those currently living in Taylor Shime were of races that the Orborn Kingdom recognized as people. There would be no legal repercussions if the Orborn Kingdom forcibly removed them and occupied the city. So because of that, I can't do anything careless while we still don't know how the Orborn Kingdom will act. Well, maybe I should have thought about this earlier. From now on. We'll have to think about defenses against not only monsters, but people as well. Vandali. Only while they didn't know how the Orborn Kingdom would act, Vandali had no intention of relinquishing Taylorsheim. It was a place that he had made great effort to obtain and arrange. A place for everyone to live. He wouldn't simply give that away. There was a piece of magical equipment that was capable of resurrecting Darsa underground as well. Even the Orborn Kingdom would become his enemies if they were to try and steal it from him. Now then, I think we should get to discussing plans to deal with various things. Vandali. Vansama, before that, you must decide what we are going to do with this woman. Terra, Terra interrupted Vandali as she pointed a finger at Eleonora. It seemed that she felt great humiliation because of the fact that she had been misled by Eleonora's charming demon eyes, but Eleonora turned her gaze towards Terra without moving a single eyebrow, and Terra lowered her head. I am very sorry about what happened last night. Eleonora. Eh? You are apologizing willingly? Terra. Of course. I am the one at fault, after all, I simply do not want to become Vandalisama's enemy. 
that would be more terrifying than anything. Terrifying enough that if I have to cast away my pride as a noble-born vampire to avoid it, then so be it. Eleonora, as Tara expressed surprise at Eleonora's apology. Eleonora smoothly explained the reasons behind her apology. After destroying Sir Grant's soul, Vandali had briefly spoken to Eleonora and the spirits of the subordinate vampires. And then Vandali had broken and destroyed all the subordinate vampires' souls. It was not because they had tried to take Vandali's life, he did that because they had directly ended the life of his further Valin, and because they had tried to kill Terra. The reason Eleonora was sitting here unrestrained and unharmed was because Vandalie had decided that she was not an enemy. She wasn't involved with Valen's death. Though she had initially come to kill Vandalie, she had lost the will to do so before she could attempt it, and she had stopped the subordinate vampire who tried to kill Terra. With those three points in mind, Vandalie acknowledged that she wasn't his enemy. Um, why are you saying all these things about me? the goddess's divine protection and all that was just a misunderstanding. Vandali, no, in a way, you possess a power even more fearsome than that of the gods. Eleonora, this was Eleonora's response to Vandali's question, destroying a soul is something that only the legendary demon king was capable of. Even the evil god of joyful life could not do such a thing, let alone my previous master. Eleonora. I heard about things like that when I was a kid as well, but... Well, that's why I was surprised when you destroyed that guy's soul. My body froze unconsciously. I suppose that's what you call... Rigor mortis. Borcus. Leaving Borcus's joke aside, there are none in Lambda capable of destroying souls. The reason for this is that the circle of transmigration for people is the domain of Rod Corti, not one of the gods who exist in Lambda. Rod Corti is the god who governs the circle of transmigration system that applies in multiple worlds, including Earth, Origin, and Lambda. That is why no god or evil god, no matter how powerful, can destroy a soul. No matter what kind of gruesome torture someone is subjected to, no matter what kind of disgusting manner in which they may die, no matter how many hundreds or even thousands of years their souls are bound for, they will find their way back to Rod Gorty eventually, and then they will be reborn as a new life form. Including Eleonora, the people of Lambda are unaware of Rod Gorty's existence, but everyone believes in the circle of transmigration. Because the circle of transmigration is a guaranteed thing, the people have hope after death. One day they will be reborn and walk a new life, as long as the soul is safe. There is a chance that one will be chosen to be a god's follower after death. Many heroes and great individuals have been chosen in this way to become subordinate gods and followers, and their deeds are praised even after their deaths. And as long as the soul is intact, there is hope that the god they follow will revive them. The thing that denies all of that hope is the destruction of the soul. The only one who has been able to do that up until now was the demon king and it was this power to destroy souls that made the gods fear him and evil gods obey him. So now that the demon king is gone, you are the one with the most fearsome power in this world, neither Burkine nor Hihirish Hukaka can even compare to you. That's why I don't want to be your enemy. Eleonora. Eleonora was and always had been a slave of fear. Her parents, who had ruled her through fear sold her as a slave and the slave merchant who purchased her saw no value in her body that was thin and dark colored back then, he treated her roughly without caring if he caused her injuries, and the mine owner who bought her after that treated her like an expiring product that should be exploited to its fullest. And then she was purchased by Burkine who had spotted her quality by coincidence, and then she was ruled by even greater fear, but unlike her treatment up until that point. Burkine treated her well as long as she produced favorable results. When she produced results superior to those of the other children, she would be given praise instead of a hard fist. When she obeyed his commands, she would receive soft, pretty clothes instead of cold chains and collars. If she carried out filthy, gruesome tasks, she would be able to eat extravagant food instead of soup containing half-rotten vegetable scraps. If she flattered her master and wagged her tail, her body would be decorated with beautiful pieces of jewelry instead of scars, and so Eleonora developed into a beautiful woman, was accepted as a noble-born vampire, acquired the charming demon eyes and received Burkine's favor.
However, at the same time, she feared losing that favor above all else. Burkhine did acknowledge Eleonora's excellence, but she understood that he didn't consider her to be a unique existence to Burkhine. Eleonora was a recent favorite, but given a thousand years, anywhere between one and a dozen vampires of her quality would come by. Yes, just a thousand years for Burkhine, who had lived for a hundred thousand years, this wasn't a long time. That was why Eleonora continued wagging her tail for Burkhine. However, she met someone even more fearsome than him. That person was Vandali. If Burkhine discovered that his pet dog had gone over to the damp's side, he would likely tremble in humiliation and rage. If Eleonora was ever caught by him, she would have to be prepared to be subjected to horrendous torture. But her soul would not be destroyed. Are you really sure? Vandali. It was not only Tara, but Vandali who also gave Eleonora a puzzled look. I'm sure you will get paid better on Burkine's side. They have more resources, too. In fact, his side is stronger than ours, overwhelmingly so. Vandali. That's not true. You tortured Sir Krent and killed him in a one-sided manner, didn't you? Even in perfect condition, it would be impossible for me to defeat him in such a ruthless, cruel way. Eleonora. I'm starting to question whether you're complimenting me. Vandali. Even Eleonora seemed to think that Burkine's side has more resources. She didn't seem to think that this was particularly important, however. The one from yesterday, Sir Krent, was it? I was only able to kill him so one-sidedly because he was so careless. Vandali. Vandali himself didn't think that Sir Krent had been a weak enemy. He was simply careless, or rather, very unlucky in various ways. As he hadn't possessed accurate information regarding Vandali, he had been separated from his subordinates when Vandali removed the floor. In addition, one arm and leg had been cut off by Borkas who Vandali had discreetly summoned and then Borkas and the zombie dinosaurs had slaughtered all of his subordinates. The finishing touch was that he had chosen to engage in close quarters combat with his claws before sealing his wounds, thinking that magic wouldn't work against Vandali. Because of this, he had his arm caught in the impact negating barrier, become unable to move and panicked at the prospect of dying of blood loss due to having his regenerative abilities nullified by the healing negation spell. It would have been better to use a weapon like Bgogan had. With his arm directly caught inside the impact negating barrier, kinetic energy had been directly drained from his muscles and he had become immobilized. And Vandali had learned from his past mistakes and poured a huge amount of mana into the barrier this time. Because his skills level had increased, the performance of the barrier itself had increased as well. With so many disadvantageous circumstances working against Sir Krent, it could only be said that he had been unlucky. From what I heard from you before, Eleonora, it seems that he was being driven into a corner in various ways even before you arrived here, so maybe he was panicking because of that, but if he had kept his distance and engaged in long-range combat, he might have at least been able to escape. Vandali, the reason Vandali wasn't saying that he could have put up a decent fight was probably because Borkas had been present while Vandali remained inside his barriers. A superior foe behind him and an untouchable target in front. Under those circumstances, there had been no hope for Sir Grant to win that battle. Even if he ran away, only execution would be waiting for him. Eleonora. Vampire society is rough, isn't it? Well, leaving that aside, I'm still not powerful. I'm just specialized in defense. Vandali. I don't have offensive power like Borkus's ability to slaughter enemies with a single swing of a sword. No, I do, but I can't aim mana bullets too accurately and they're slower and have short range than arrows. But one day you'll kill Burkine and his vampires. You will destroy them, won't you? Eleonora. Of course. Vandali. Even if he is a vampire who had lived for a hundred thousand years. It would probably be easier to defeat him than the people who will resurrect here from origin with cheat-like abilities. Even if he does possess an evil god's divine protection, he isn't an evil god himself, after all. But if this Burkine person steps into the fight directly before I become strong, what will you do? Vandali. That won't happen. They would never cross the boundary mountain range personally. Eleonora. Eleonora declared this with confidence. There was a basis for that confidence. 
Burkine and the other Pyrrhid vampires were indeed powerful, but it could never be said that the Pyrrhid vampires were on good terms with each other. If Burkine were to act personally, the other two Pyrrhid vampires, Ternisha and Gibberman, would promise to help, saying, I see, do your best, we'll lend you our subordinates. However, they would then seize the vampire organization in his absence. The king of the hill can only be a king because there is a hill to be a king of. If he stepped down from the hill, making it back up would be next to impossible. Eleonora, as to be expected of a community that worshipped an evil god, the idea of kicking each other down instead of cooperating was deeply ingrained in its roots. So you're saying that's why it's fine for you to be on my side? Vandali. That's right. There is nobody more fearsome in this world than you. Eleonora. So you'll put in as much effort as you can to get along with Terra and everyone else? Vandali. Of course, their enemies are your enemies, are they not? I will beg for their forgiveness even if I have to lick their feet. Eleonora. In fact, if Terra had been killed, Vandali would have likely killed Eleonora, so this was the correct response. I get the feeling that she's being too brave about it, though. Well then, if Terra forgives you, then that will be fine. Let's get along from now on. Vandali. And so Vandali quickly moved on. V Vandali? Are you sure it's all right to believe her so easily? Darsa. Boy, what this person is saying is equivalent to saying that if there is ever someone she fears more than you, she will betray you. Zadiris. Darsa and Zadiris expressed their objections. Vandali waved both of his hands to calm down the flustered ladies. As to whether I should believe her, it's all right because at her request, I'm going to apply a method of insurance, and what you say is true, Zadiris, but that's how the world is. Vandali People gather beneath those who can provide them with the most benefits. On Earth, Vandali had seen news reports of trouble caused for factories and businesses because their employees were readily leaving to work for other businesses that paid better. What Eleonora was doing was equivalent to that. The criteria that Eleonora is using is fear, so as long as nothing like the Demon King's resurrection happens and I'm the only one who can destroy souls, I'm sure she'll never betray me. Vandali. There's also a chance that someone with that ability might be among those reincarnating from origin, but I probably don't need to worry about it. It's difficult to imagine that Rod Corti would give someone a power that infringes on his domain. Mutilda. Well, the method of ruling through fear is something that has existed in the past, but... Zadiris, other reasons for accepting Eleonora as one of our companions. She wasn't involved in the incident with my father, so she's not an enemy. I can gain information about the vampires who worship the evil god from her. She can fight for us. Also, Vandali. She's a pretty lady, I suppose. She has a nice body, too. Borkus. Yeah, that's right. Vandali. Borkas interjected, and Vandali nodded in agreement with his words. A few seconds later, for some reason, there was a strange atmosphere in the room. Really, why was that? Van Sama, didn't we agree that you should hastily deny this fact? Terra, I don't believe in telling unnecessary lies. Vandali, how can this be? Then does that mean you prefer this woman over me? Terra, no, no. You have a nicer body, Terra. Vandali. After all, Terra has more muscle, particularly in the upper arms. And her abdominal muscles are quite splendid to touch as well. Oh my Tilda if that is the case. Terra. Terra held her face in her hands as if blushing. No, I am sure he is referring to her muscles. Zadiris. There's no other explanation. Basdia. Zadiris and Basdia whispered to each other and they were entirely correct. So, Botchin, what did you mean by method of insurance? Sam. Sam returned the derailed conversation to its original topic. I will make a golem in the shape of a piercing and apply it to her. With that, I will know where she is at all times, and if anything happens, I will make the golem attack her body from the inside. Vandali. Vandali thought that this was a harsh method of insurance for Eleonora, but this was something that she herself wanted. It was Vandali who had deliberately suggested a harsher method in order to make it easier for everyone to accept Eleonora as a companion, however. 
Incidentally, Vanderly planned to put mercury on the inside of the piercing and apply preservation to prevent corrosion. If you're going that far, I don't have any complaints about it. But where are you going to have her put that piercing? Her belly button? The grow botchin likes belly buttons, after all. Fa ha muscles, wrists, all parts that we don't have. Rita the grow, Rita, I'm sure you know this, but other than muscles, everything else is a misunderstanding. And anyway, what parts do you have, Rita? Vandaly, lovely Nastilda, Rita. I'll have her put it on her tongue. Vandaly, as Rita made a joke. This was Vandaly's serious reply to Vigro's question. Her tongue. Vigro. Vandaly, that's a little. Darsa. For some reason, everyone drew away from him. Whether it is one or two piercings or as many as you wish, I will accept them. Eleonora. Eleonora poked out her red tongue as if asking Vandaly to pierce holes in it. Um, I want to discuss Taylor Shime's defenses, so can we leave this topic here? Vandaly. What was important was what they would do next. Incidentally, Vandaly had decided to leave the inspection of his newly acquired soul break skill until later. Name, Ilinora. Rank, 8. Race, noble-born vampire baroness. Level, 47. Job, demon eye user. Job level, 70. Job history, slave, servant. Apprentice mage, apprentice warrior. Mage, age. 6 years old, 20 years old at time of vampire transformation Passive skills Self-enhancement Subordination Level 3 Superhuman strength Level 5 Rapid regeneration Level 2 Status effect resistance Level 5 Intuition Level 3 Mental corruption Level 3 Automatic mana recovery Level 3 Detect presence Level 3 Active skills Mining Level 1, Time Attribute Magic. Level 5, Life Attribute Magic. Level 5, No Attribute Magic. Level 2, Mana Control. Level 3, Swordsmanship. Level 1, Unarmed Fighting Technique. Level 1, Silent Steps. Level 3, Steel. Level 1, Housework. Level 2, Unique Skills. Charming Demon Eyes. Level 7. Chapter 19 Preparing defenses while desperate and out of my mind. Now then, I want to set up Taylor Shime's defenses. Vandaly, using the contents of the discussion that had taken place on the daily Noro had been accepted among his companions, Vandaly and the others set to work. From Eleonora they had learned that the vampires worshipping the evil god had subordinates in positions of power within the Mig Shield nation including the, currently ex-marshal, and they even had subordinates in the Orborn Kingdom. It was uncertain how much strength the pure reed vampires would invest into the task of killing Vandaly, but in the worst case scenario, the vampires among the Mig Shield Nation's army could send troops to Taylorsheim. The only thing sturdy about Taylorsheim right now was its appearance, it wouldn't hold out against an army of thousands, and with the vampires among the army making hidden movements, escape might be impossible as well. If Vandaly was on his own, he would have the option of escaping while he could, but if the enemy's reach extended even as far as the Orborn Kingdom, there was no place that he was completely safe on this continent. Of course, because Vandaly needed to ensure the safety of the undead titans and ghouls who lived in Taylorsheim, the option of separating himself from them was non-existent. There aren't any cowards here who would drive you out for their own safety. Borcus, that is correct, holy son. We will continue fighting, even if we quite literally have our flesh and entrails severed and our bones broken. Nuaza, I'm a bit late in having a say in this, but I agree. Vandaly, we'd be in trouble without you. Vigro, indeed, if the magic items we are using now were to break. We would once again face problems with fertility. Even if we leave that matter aside, what is the use in driving out our own king in order to achieve temporary safety? Zadirus, Borcus, Nuaza, Vigro, and Zadirus made it clear that this was not an option. It wasn't as if Vandaly didn't want to protect Taylorsheim, the place where he belonged. He planned to go to the Orborn Kingdom eventually but he planned to at least return for a visit once a year or once every few years. Even if he moved away to chase his dreams, he wanted there to be a home for him to return to. 
That was how he felt. Thank you. Well then, we will set up a system that will hold just fine even if we're attacked by an army of 10,000, including vampires. We'll achieve this by spring or early summer, or midsummer at latest. Vandaly, are you insane? Everyone, no, I'm desperate and out of my mind. Vandaly, Burkine and the other vampires who had sent Eleonora's party here will be suspicious at the sudden lack of contact, realize that they had failed and take the next step. Well, it was unlikely that they would suddenly manipulate the MIG Shield nation into sending its troops here because of that, but they would at least try to gather more detailed information about Taylorsheim. And once they learned about Taylor Shime's situation, it was highly likely that they would realize that dispatching a few vampires would be ineffective and begin to make a greater effort to crush the city. Fifth, Visculum transmutation. Nobody can use it except for Vandali Sama. Leaving aside the minor problems, it's impossible for alchemists to create them in an instant and have them change their shape freely. The same goes for taming the undead. Eleonora. This was what Eleonora had said, if the pure reed vampires discovered that Vandaly possessed these abilities, they would try to kill him at all costs, that's a bit of an overreaction. The three pure reed vampires can tame undead as well, can't they? Vandaly, as Vandaly asked this question, Eleonora, who was having trouble pronouncing words because of the new piercing in her tongue, shook her head. Berkheim's group can't tame them. Tanisha and Gibberman are the ones who mainly use undead, and they can turn corpses into undead and control them, but they can't control creatures who have already turned undead. Eleonora. It seemed that the undead controlled by the pure reed vampires were those created themselves, they would not be able to tame even a rank 1 living dead if it had already become an undead without their intervention. So if they discovered that Vandali Sama can tame undead, they would be outraged, especially Gibberman. Eleonora, I see. Vandali, the Sword King Borcus was one of the heroes that Gibberman had wanted, but now he was already an undead. Vandali had even gathered the scattered bone fragments of his right arm and used corpse healing to restore it, so claiming even a single bone fragment of Borcus would be impossible. Vandali didn't know what kind of personality Gibberman had, but it did seem likely that he would be outraged to learn that a mere dump had stolen one of the heroes that he had wanted in his collection. Vandali found it satisfying to know this, but felt that it would be unreasonable for Gibberman to get so serious over it. He wanted to go on the offensive so that he wouldn't lose to such an unreasonable person, but that was difficult. Like the vampires, Vandali and his companions would find it difficult to cross the boundary mountain range now. In addition, the vampires who worship the evil god possessed numerous spaces and Eleonora didn't know the locations of all of them. After coming to the conclusion that going on the offensive wasn't a realistic plan, Vandali set out about addressing the problem of not having enough numbers. Taylor Shime had originally been a fortress city nation of 5,000 titans. Of course, this meant that the city was plenty large enough for a population of 5,000 to live inside the city's walls. However, there were only a thousand undead titans, even including the ghouls and monsters of the new races Vandali had created. There were less than 2,000 of them. Creating a flawless defense with these numbers would be impossible. As undead didn't feel fatigue or need to sleep, it was possible to have them keep permanently keep watch, but Vandali didn't want to ask them to do this. The undead needed riches and pleasure in their day-to-day -day lives as well. So the first thing he did was increase the number of gillums he had at his disposal. Get up, go. Vandali, he went to Gurren's valley and mined the stone. The method he used was to directly turn the stone walls into gillums and let them walk themselves back to Taylorsheim. Other than requiring a lot of mana, this method was very easy. Amazing, holy sun. Titan, doesn't that mean we're losing our jobs? Titan, because there's no time. In any case, I'm going to be mining here today until this place becomes known as Grin's Pit instead of Grin's Valley. Vandali, we're actually going to lose our jobs. Titan, no, we're actually going to have more work. Titan, really? Titan, as the undead Titan stonemason said, their workload had sharply increased because they would be turning these new gillums into ornaments. I'm going to attach these gillums to the outer walls and the walls of the stone buildings. 
I want you to work on them so that they look like decorations at a glance. Vandaly, that's quite fancy. We don't mind, but is there a reason you're doing that? Will it make the golem stronger or something? Titan, no, it won't. They'll just look like decorations. Vandaly, the stonemasons looked puzzled. But once the decorated golems were actually set in place, the effect would be clear. Simply stationing golems near the walls and buildings would be sufficient as a defense against intruders. But golems decorating the walls and buildings would look like simple ornaments, and golems embedded into the walls which had also been thickened would look like mere sculptures. If an enemy army tried to close in on the defenseless walls, they could be taken by surprise by the enemies springing forth from the walls and I can do things like have the sculptures keep up their act, wait for the enemy to set up ladders to climb the walls and then make them destroy the ladders. Vandaly. Th that's dirty. Titan. Holy son, will the fortress and buildings not become more fragile once the golems start moving? Titan. I'll add more stone to the walls to compensate when setting up the golems, so it will be fine. Also, the golems on the houses and buildings will be just for scouting so they'll be things like faces and eyes. Vandaly. With that, it will be unlikely that the enemy will destroy them. Titan. Vandaly had thought of the idea from security setups used on Earth where security guards and cameras would be positioned in inconspicuous places. And I don't have to pay any attention to the golems acting as security guards and cameras, so it's not mentally taxing on me. It would improve Taylor Shime's scenery as well so there were only benefits to this method. Furthermore, Vandaly discovered that taking too much of the stone cliffs in Gruen's Valley would cause them to become unable to mine any more stone for a while. It was as if there was a transparent barrier that created a dead end, preventing him from going any further. It looked like he could continue forward, but the background scenery might as well have been painted on a solid wall. But the dungeon would return to normal in a few days' time so there was no need to worry about the stone running out. The others weren't taking it easy while Vandaly and the stonemasons worked busily. I'm going to request something a little dangerous. I want everyone to place the golems and undead that I made to keep watch in the places that I tell you. Vandaly, they were strengthening their defenses, but the fact that they didn't know when enemies would come would be a source of insecurity and inconvenience. That was why Vandaly requested that golems be stationed to keep watch. There were three possible routes that enemies could take. Leave it to me, Vandaly Sama. Elinora. The first was the route that Elinora had used to cross the mountain range. This route was relatively safe, but many of Sir Krent's subordinate vampires had been defeated along the way. Only noble-born vampires and beings stronger than them would be able to use this route safely. Eleonora declared that this route would be absolutely impossible for normal humans to use, considering that, Eleonora realized just how abnormal Vandaly was to have crossed the mountain range with 600 ghouls and not sustained a single casualty. Is there a need to watch this area as well? Zran. Zran. There are vampires worshipping the evil god in the Orborn Kingdom as well. Vandaly. The second was the tunnel that led to the Hartner Duchy in the Orborn Kingdom. It was collapsed for now, but it could be reconstructed from Hartner Duchy and vampire underlings might be sent through it. If the first princess was still alive on the other side, there was no guarantee that the vampires wouldn't utilize her feelings for her home country. And the third route was the most difficult. So you want us to look for a tunnel that connects to the MIG Shield Nation? Does such a thing even exist? Zran. I can't rule out that possibility. Vandaly. There were no legends that said there were tunnels in the mountain range leading to the MIG Shield Nation, but since there was one that led to the Orborn Kingdom, there was a high chance that there was one that had not yet been discovered. It would be a tunnel over a hundred thousand years old, after all. Back then, the Amid Empire and Orborn Kingdom hadn't existed, and it might have been constructed even before the goddess Veda created the vampires. If that were the case, it made sense to think that tunnels would have been built to the west as well as the east, who could have built such tunnels was still a mystery, however they would have to traverse lands full of devil's nests with uncontrolled monster populations to search for ruins that could be anywhere. Borcus would lead Vigro and Zadirus in performing this task, 
and even Bone Wolf and the other undead would be dispatched so that they would be fully prepared. I don't mind, but make sure you have miso, fish sauce and especially Katsuboshi waiting for me. If you're going to make adventurers work, you have to reward them. Borkus, do you like Katsuboshi? Vandali, yeah, it makes the soup taste nice if you boil it, and it makes a good ingredient. Don't need to put any effort in. Borkus, the Katsuboshi was an unfinished product that was simply dried without being smoked, but as Borkus said, it made a good addition to soups. I want to perfect Katsuboshi by the end of the year, too. Vandali, it's imperfect? I'm looking forward to the finished product. Borkus, leaving that aside, I'll be having you place goblin skeleton skulls, rock golems disguised as rocks and wood golems disguised as dead branches. Vandali. All of them were objects that could be held in one hand, they were also things that would not be strange to find lying around anywhere. If the appraisal spell was cast they would be discovered, but surely nobody would go around casting this spell on every rock, branch and goblin skull lying on the ground. The mountain range was a place where monsters struggled violently to survive, nobody would have the time to do that. Well, there was a chance that a golem or undead would be unfortunate enough to be destroyed by a stray monster, but that was why they would be placed in sets of three. If one of them were to break, they simply needed to be replaced. Incidentally, Vandali had decided to abandon the route used by the MIG Shield Nation's army 200 years ago. According to Eleonora, a pair of hurricane dragons inhabited the area surrounding that route. In order to simultaneously battle against two dragons above rank 10 and win in an environment where the only footholds were precipitous, fragile cliffs, a party of S-class adventurers would need to be formed. This would be difficult for the current Amid Empire, even if they expended all of their resources to do so. It would be difficult for the vampires as well. Eleonora had said that it would be possible for a pure reed vampire like Burkine to defeat them, but the signs of such a battle would likely be visible from Taylorsheim. Bright flashes of light, explosions and the sound of parts of the mountain range grumbling would be very noticeable. It was also possible for enemies to make a detour into the southern regions of the Ban Gaia continent and then pass through the Boundary Mountain range from there, but apparently it would be suicidal for even a pure reed vampire to journey into those regions. Those regions contain dragons and giants of even higher ranks than those found in the mountain range, and there is even apparently a palace of demons. Eleonora there were also countless unexplored devil's nests and large organizations of monsters such as noble orc empires. They weren't exactly Vandalie's allies, but they served as a very effective protective wall. Well, because of them, it was impossible for Vandalie to go and look for the vampires who were shipped Vida. Well then, please get to work, Vandalie. It took less than a month for all of these tasks to be completed other than the discovery of a tunnel leading to the MIG Shield Nation. Vandali would have Eleonora and Zran's party join up with Borkus's and continue searching for this 100,000 year old tunnel. While they're doing that, we're going to build a second and third outer wall. Also, we will be developing weapons. Vandali. Botchin. Are you planning to work yourself to death? Saria. It's alright. I'll rest properly on my days off. Vandali. The only ones who had visited Taylorsheim in the last 200 years were Vandali and the ghouls, and the vampires led by Eleonora. And apart from Eleonora, all of the vampires were now dead. It wouldn't be easy to immediately tell that the number of Taylorsheim's walls had increased from the city's slightly different appearance. The second wall would be built sturdy like the first. Golems would be set up on it and slots through which arrows could be fired would be included. The third wall would be tall enough to conceal the first and second walls, but constructed in a way that would make it look fragile and easily collapsible. I was thinking that if I put mud all over them and have undead vines crawl over their surface, it would have the appearance I want. Vandali. If the MIG Shield Nation came. They wouldn't see the holes in the wall that should be there according to their records of past events, but they might let their guard down because the wall looked so fragile. Of course, Vandalie would build the whole wall out of Gillums so that the wall would maintain itself without actually crumbling, so the wall itself will turn into soldiers when the time comes. Sam, 
but vampires that are noble born or greater can fly through the sky, can't they? Like Alina or Asan. Saria. That's why I'll be making anti air weapons. Creating undead that can fly would take time, after all. Vandali. It would be a different story if he only needed a few, but to make dozens, hundreds of undead like Bone Bird from Bone Remains and raise them until they were able to fly, he would need a lot of time. There was the option of turning fresh corpses of monsters such as Wyverns into flying undead, but getting those numbers would still take time and if they were completely destroyed, it would take time to replace them. He did consider making hundreds of undead from small creatures like small birds and insects, but in this world, becoming an undead didn't necessarily make the creature stronger. Even if he turned winged insects and beetles into undead, there was a high chance that they wouldn't even be able to bite through the enemy's skin. And since noble-born vampires were proficient with magic, they could easily be wiped out in an instant by a single wide area attack. And turning that many insects and small birds into undead would actually be likely to cause Vandali to work himself to death. I could probably use the corpses of insect-type monsters, but, well, I suppose once I've set everything else up, I can take my time gathering them. Vandali. More importantly, Van Sama, what about the new weapons that we will be assisting you with? Terra. If it's working with metal, leave it to this old man. Daytara. I'm planning to have you build some crossbows. Vandali. Terra and the undead titan blacksmith Daytara gave Vandali odd looks. Crossbows? Ah, you mean those. Terra. What are you going to do with something like that? Daytara. Crossbows already existed in the world of Lambda, however, they weren't very popular or in demand. Crossbows are accurate weapons with a slow rate of fire, but with their strings wound back, even frail women and the elderly can use them. However, skills and martial abilities exist in this world. A high level in the archery skill increases accuracy and power with a bow, and with increased attribute values from gaining levels, even a woman with slender arms can draw the boatstring of a large bow. And with martial skills, it is possible to achieve superhuman feats such as rapid consecutive fire and firing with enough precision to thread a needle. Crossbows receive a bonus to accuracy from the archery skill, but martial skills cannot be used due to their structure. One does not physically use one's hands pull the string back, so increased attribute values make no difference to their power. Because of this, even soldiers do not use them, let alone adventurers. As they are easy to use, ordinary people sometimes purchase them to have just in case, but even then, it is more common to buy regular bows and arrows as this is the cheaper option. Thus, crossbows are known as weapons only used by the eccentric in the world of Lambda, and apparently it is common for weapon stores in even larger cities to not have them in stock. It would be better to hand out good bows and arrows rather than crossbows. Daytara. No. No. I'm not going to hand out the crossbows to everyone. I'm going to turn the crossbows themselves into undead. Vandali. Vandali would make spirits haunt the completed crossbows, creating cursed weapons. Cursed weapons are weak, rank 2 monsters consisting of weapons possessed by spirits that move on their own. Normally, they would be unreliable even against normal soldiers, let alone vampires. However, crossbows fire projectiles capable of piercing through plate armor with a pull of a trigger. They are also highly accurate because cursed weapons don't use martial skills to begin with. There are no drawbacks. The problem would be making sure they were loaded. But if Vandali installed each of them with a golem arm responsible for reloading and placed them on the walls, the city's rooftops and the royal castle, that problem would be solved. Once this was complete, he would have tireless archers that would shoot enemies to death until running out of projectiles to fire undetectable through detect presence and capable of seeing in the dark. Vandali planned to have projectiles with silver-plated tips for the anti-vampire crossbows installed on the upper walls and rooftops. Normally, technology would be required for this plating process, but Vandali could perform it easily by manipulating the shape of the silver with gillum transmutation. Let's make ballistae and catapults as well. Vandali, you really are planning to fight a war. I cannot wait to get to work. Terra, I can make ballistae, but I can't make things like catapults. Daytara. Yes, 
I'll be in charge of making the catapults. Vandaly. Of course, Vandaly had no prior experience in catapult building either. However, he had once seen a documentary on Earth that described how catapults were built. If he recalled, it had been a documentary in which weaponry of ancient civilizations were recreated through modern technology and then inspected in detail. It was the kind of program that would have caused Uncle to have a fit from his luxury allergy, so I remember it well. That program hadn't described every part of the building process of a catapult in detail, but it had showed the overall shape and structure of a catapult. All Vandaly needed to do was recreate it with Golem transmutation. And on his days off, he played with poor Vina and the other children, checked Bastia's condition and busied himself with the aging reversal of Terra, which he had been procrastinating doing. Before he knew it, it was summer already. The levels of the rapid healing, status effect resistance, death attribute magic, chant revocation, automatic mana recovery, surpass limits, glum transmutation, no attribute magic, mana control, carpentry, engineering and alchemy skills have increased. You have acquired the multicast skill. The ranks of Zadiris, Nuaza, Bone Man, Bone Wolf, Bone Monkey, Bone Bear, Bone Bird, Braga, Zendo, Memadiga, Ritu and Seria have increased. Name, Vandali. Race, Damp, Dark Elf. Age, 4 years old. Title, Ghoul King. Job, Death Attribute Mage. Level, 39. Job History, None. Attributes, Vitality. 69 mana 144,596,652 strength 52 agility 31 stamina 56 intelligence 157 passive skills superhuman strength level 1 rapid healing level 3 level up death attribute magic level 5 level up status effect resistance Level 5, Level Up, Magic Resistance, Level 1, Dark Vision, Mental Corruption, Level 10, Death Attribute Charm, Level 4, Chant Revocation, Level 3, Level Up, Strength in Followers, Level 5, Automatic Mana Recovery, Level 3, Level Up, Active Skills, Blood Sucking, Level 3, Surpass Limits, Level 4, Level Up, Glimp Transmutation, Level 4, Level Up, No Attribute Magic, Level 3, Level Up, Mana Control, Level 3, Level Up, Spirit Form, Level 2, Carpentry, Level 4, Level Up, Engineering, Level 3, Level Up, Cooking, Level 1, Alchemy, Level 3, Level Up, Unarmed Fighting Technique, Level 1, New, Soul Break, Level 1, New, Multicast, Level 1, New Curses. Experience gained in previous life not carried over. Cannot learn existing jobs. Unable to gain experience independently. Chapter 20. Let's launch things with a high amount of bloodthirst. The bathhouse was currently the only functional facility in the royal castle of Taylorsheim. As there was no functioning national government, this was the only facility of any use. That was a good bath, ghoul woman. The massage items that the king made for us were good too, weren't they? Ghoul woman. Really? I found the jacuzzi thing that made bubbles come out to be better. Ghoul woman. The ghouls who had only ever bathed in cold water before coming to Taylor Shyam were totally engrossed in submerging themselves in hot water. There were some golem products that Vandaly had come up with, but the hot baths seemed to be the most pleasurable thing after all. Oh yes. Have you heard? The rumors that Chief Tero has been summoned into the king's bedroom every day recently. Ghoul woman. I've heard about it. But doesn't he just want her company? The king is only four years old, after all. I've heard that he gets lonely easily, too. And she's not the chief anymore. She's the foreman, right? Ghoul woman. That's right. But I'm more used to calling her chief, ghoul woman. As the two ghoul women walked along during their conversation, Tara. The subject of their discussion, ran across in front of them. Huh? Foreman, ghoul woman. Immediately afterwards, Vandaly passed across them as well. For some reason, he was crawling across the ceiling silently using all four limbs. Ghoul woman. As the two of them were rendered speechless at the sight of the ghoul king, 
terror came back. She had been captured by Vandali. No, please let me go for Teneged. Terror, no, no, we have to test the catapults firing tomorrow, so let's do ten more today. Vandali. Vandali walked away, holding the teary-eyed terror in the air with telekinesis. Watching him leave, the two ghoul women swallowed before speaking again. It's not because he's lonely? Ghoul woman. Vandali was next to Terra, who was lying in an unladylike, spread eagle position while breathing wildly. The youth transformation will be complete in a few more days. Let's do our best. Vandali. Hoot. Terra. Seemingly exhausted and unable to get up, Terra let out a strange sound. Terra had experienced many things in the past, but the youth transformation caused sensations she had never felt before to run through her entire body. The unpleasant feeling of something foreign crawling around inside her body, and the pleasure of having her entire body massaged, causing her muscle tension to vanish. She was in an incomprehensible state where her body was full of energy, but at the same time, it felt as if she had just run a marathon. The fact that she had learned a secret that was only between Vandali and Zadiris up until now made her feel younger as well. These were only good things for Terra, but you, it's true that I don't get tired easily, run out of breath or get blurry eyes anymore. And my back no longer hurts, but... Terra, Terra's aging had progressed further than Vandali had initially thought. As to be expected of someone over 260 years old. Should we reverse another 10 years of age? Vandali. Hi. Let me go for tonight. Terra. The pure reed vampires who only gathered together once every few millennia had assembled in one of the numerous meeting places for the vampires who worshipped Hi Hyrush Hukaka, the evil god of joyful life. Something that hadn't happened for tens of thousands of years was taking place. A crooked seven-pointed star had been drawn on the floor using special, freshly drained blood. The three pure reed vampires raised their arms towards the center of this star, curling their hands into fists. I, Ternisha, pour my sacred blood. Ternisha. A drop of blood fell from in between Ternisha's fingers. Her eyes were shining like those of a child about to open a box containing a present. I, Gubberman, pour my sacred blood. Gubberman. Gubberman. An old man who looked like a withered tree, rolled his large eyes. A drop of blood fell from in between his fingers as well. His unknown desires were showing unpleasantly in his eyes. I, Burkine, pour my sacred blood. Burkine. And then red blood also fell from Burkine's white hand. His eyes were ominously empty. His lips that normally gave a gentlemanly smile were pressed together tightly, as if he were enduring something unpleasant. These are three pure reed vampires gathering in one place and cooperating to carry out a task was something that had not happened in tens of thousands of years. A single pure reed vampire possessed enough power to defeat a party of adventurers made up of superhuman A-class adventurers alone, as well as acting as the rulers of this vampire community. They had received the divine protection of High Hyrish Hukaka, the evil god of joy for life, and were equivalent to being his subordinate gods. Just what kind of ritual were they carrying out? It seems that the ritual has failed. That damn Sir Krent, has he betrayed us? Gubberman. Gubberman looked at the seven-pointed star that showed no response whatsoever and raised the ends of his lips in a smile, exposing his pointed fangs. Well then, next is Eleonora. Get on with it. Ternisha. Yes. Burkine. As Ternisha pressed Burkine to perform the next step, he took an unconscious child from a noble born vampire who had been waiting nearby and cut off its head, using the side of his hand as a blade. Blood gushed onto the floor, glowing mysteriously and crawling around as if alive to form another seven pointed star. The three of them each gave a drop of their blood as they had done earlier. However, the result was the same. Nothing happened. It seems that Eleonora has betrayed us as well. Ternisha. Kukaku. If they were dead, they would have been revived here as undead, after all. Gubberman. This ritual was one that summoned the souls of dead noble born vampires and resurrected them as undead. It required the decapitation of a child born to a woman who had only ever known one man, 
and all three of the pure reed vampires needed to contribute a drop of their own blood to the seven-pointed triangle drawn with that child's blood. Even though this ritual would revive a noble-born vampire as an undead, the resulting undead would be vastly weaker than the live vampire, so it was hardly worth the trouble. The reason this ritual was being carried out was because a major incident had occurred a month ago. Slay the damp born between the subordinate vampire Valen and the dark elf Darsa. That was the divine message that had recently been given to the pure reed vampires by High Hirish Hukaka, the evil god of joyful life. They had given the task of slaying the damp in question to Sir Krent and Elinora around a year ago, as vampires' sense of time was different from that of humans. They had thought that perhaps Sir Krent and Elinora were having some difficulty with the task, so it hadn't really occurred to them that they should investigate the situation. As the problematic pure reed vampires who worshipped Vida had showed no signs of movement, there hadn't been anything to get impatient about, either. However, things changed when the evil god sent the divine message directly. Even though the evil god had given the pure reed vampires his divine protection, it was unusual for him to send them a divine message. The evil god had given them a direct order to slay the damp. It was a significant enough event that even Gibberman, who normally refrained from attending these meetings, had stopped admiring his collection to come out here. They had then tried to contact Elinora and the others who had been sent to slay the damp, but it was already too late. That was why this ritual had been carried out. If they had killed the damp but lost their lives in the process, they would be revived as undead and be able to report the fact. If they could not be revived, it would be clear that they had betrayed the vampires. It seems that we've been underestimating this damp. Perhaps he has captured his would-be assassins alive and is now tormenting them. But either way, they have failed. Ternisha Sir Grant was not a particularly excellent individual, but he was still a moderately useful man. If the damp has made him betray us, he must possess a considerable amount of power. Gubman. Gubman nodded in response to Tanisha's words, excited about the fact that his subordinate might have betrayed him. Either the damp had prepared something that forced Sir Grant to obey him even if it made his own parent and every noble-born and subordinate vampire his enemy, or he was powerful enough to convince Sir Grant that doing so was the better choice. Phew ha ha, the corpse of such a damper is something that I would like to acquire. I cannot help but be excited by thoughts of what kind of undead I will turn him into. Kai hi 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 hi. Gubberman, for Gubberman, who had made it his life's hobby to collect the corpses of heroes and use them to create undead, it appeared that the evil god of joyful life had given him an indication as to which corpse should be added to his collection next. A damp so dangerous that the evil god personally wished for his demise. Wouldn't that be an even more valuable addition than some A-class adventurer? It was unclear as to what made him so dangerous, or perhaps he had simply incurred the evil god's wrath, but he had caught High Hirish Hukaka's attention. Do your best then. I'm not really interested. No, I am a little. That damp was leading hundreds of ghouls, wasn't he? Making undead from ghouls sounds interesting. Ternisha. Ternisha was also interested in creating undead but she did so to create works of art. Unlike Gubberman, she wasn't particularly concerned with the strength and fame of the materials used to create the undead. The theme of her creations in the past few centuries had been families, so she had no interest in a damp whose father had already been disposed of and whose mother had been burned at the stake, but it was possible that the grey-brown skin of the ghouls would look attractive once they were turned into undead. That was what her twisted inspiration was whispering to her. And as for Burkine, shit. Burkine, he quietly whispered a single word. Hearing a word that Burkine wouldn't utter with his usual demeanor, the noble-born vampires who had been standing by with empty cages in their hands opened their eyes wide in surprise. Burkine Sama, Hijyach, vampire. Burkine unconsciously seized the head of the noble-born vampire who had spoken his name and raised this thing into the air. Burkine Sama, whatever are you doing? Guggy. Vampire. Burkine swung the panicking thing around wildly. Damn it, Miley Nora. My toy that I chose from among dozens of humans. He stole her from me. That accursed damp here. Burkine. Being shaken in every direction, the thing in his hand struck the floor and walls numerous times, 
causing various pieces to break off and scatter everywhere. I was going to toy with her for centuries to coo I was going to convince her that she was special, make her conceited and then break her by scraping off her flesh piece by piece. How unfair of him to take her from me before I could get to the good part. That damned, accursed, unforgivable dampia. Burkine W what? Ha! <laughs> Burkine Sama? Vampire Please stop. Burkine Sama. What is there, Jo? Vampire Hi! <laughs> Burkine Sama has gone mad. Run away, run away. Vampire. No. Vampire. Burkine went into a frenzy with disheveled hair, bloodshot eyes and a foaming mouth. His appearance was no longer that of a young nobleman or even that of an angry beast, but that of a broken madman. He swung his fist wildly, destroying a pillar that had barely avoided destruction up until now, and then stopped, breathing heavily with his shoulders heaving. Ha! Ha! Fa! Ha! Burkine. He looked up into the sky to see the beautiful, blue-white glow of the moon and the sparkling stars that accompanied it, as Burkine threw away the thing. The head of the noble-born vampire, which was already in a poor enough state to make it impossible to tell whether it was even a man or a woman, he calmly spoke to Tanisha and Gibberman as if nothing had happened. So that brings up the question of what we will do next, Tanisha, do you have any ideas? Burkine, he took a silk handkerchief from his breast pocket, cleaned his mouth and hands with it and quickly adjusted his hair with his fingers. Ah, you're back. It didn't last very long this time, did it? Ternisha, the last time, you were in that state for days, I was considering whether Ternisha and I needed to stop you. Gubberman, Fufu, my apologies. Burkine, Burkine had completely reverted to his usual self, but his surroundings were in a pitiful state. The meeting chamber that previously looked as if it were from inside the large mansion of a nobleman had now turned into a mountain of rubble. Other than two circular areas roughly a meter wide around Gibberman and Ternisha, blood and severed limbs sprawled over the rubble. Heads and fragments of heads littered the ground. Half of the noble-born vampires and the majority of the subordinate vampires had been turned into silent corpses. Well, it's fine. I thought that this would happen, so I didn't bring my servants to today's meeting other than some subordinate vampires to fill the numbers. Ternisha. Kakaka. Well done. But all of my noble-born vampires were present today. Gubberman. I have done a terrible thing. How many of them did I crush? Burkine. Don't worry. Don't worry. I was thinking of cutting down those that were below average so that I do not end up with another individual like Sir Krent. You have merely made the selection for me by cutting down those who could not survive your temper. Gubberman. I see. How terrible of you to use me like that. Burkine. By the way, why are you asking me? I did say that I'm interested, but I'd be happy as long as I can skin the ghouls when the damp is dead. Ternisha. It's simple. First was Gibberman's subordinate Sir Krent, then my Leonora. So you're next, aren't you? Burkine. You're right. I suppose I won't look very good if I don't make any moves. Ternisha. Ternisha took a moment to think. Well then, I suppose we can mobilize the army. There's a guy in the Amid Empire's army that wants eternal life. A convenient guy who will do anything we tell him as long as we turn him into a vampire. Ternisha. We'll exert our influence on him, and a few other noble families and high officials. If we do that, we should be able to set the army after the damper in about two years. An average noble-born vampire, another noble-born who was quite exceptional for her age and a few dozen subordinate vampires. Was it? The damp predisposed of that many of our forces. I don't know what methods he used to fight them, but it was enough for the evil god himself to send a divine message. I'm sure he used a very abnormal method. So let's try attacking with numbers. Things will surely go well if we use thousands of soldiers, knights, adventurers and the high priest that burned his mother at the stake. If we hide our subordinates among such an army, there will be no chance for him at all. A hundred noble-born vampires would be too many, but a few dozen should be enough. Can you give me that information? I'm sure those who worship Vida can't make use of it if I break it with my own hands once I'm finished with it. Ternisha. I do not mind, said Burkine in response to Ternisha's request. 
It was information that the guys worshipping Vida are fairly likely to know anyway. Burkine. Yes, if Ternisha destroys it, we can be certain, but it is a serious matter to mobilize the army, you were quite poor at utilizing humans, were you not? Gubberman. What? You don't consider yourself good at it either, do you? Ternisha. Hi he. That is right. I am also poor at using them. Gubberman. In any case, it seems that you have an idea. I want you to let me know when your plan begins to progress. Now that our God has given us a divine message, there is a need for us to cooperate. Burkine. That is right. High Hirish Hukakus Armor's punishment would take a toll on our bodies, after all. Gubberman. The three of them laughed in agreement as the other vampires who had somehow managed to survive staggered to their feet and then they began the journey to the next meeting location. They were all thinking the same thing about High Hirish Hukaka's divine message. Why would the evil god, the only existence who certainly possessed greater power than them, make the effort to send a divine message instructing them to kill the Dambr? For him to have done that meant that High Hirish Hukaka's attention had been drawn to the Damp, a Damp that was not one of his followers. In other words, couldn't this be a sign that the Damp possessed something that would be a threat to High Hirish Hukaka? Some kind of power or information? In that case, if we could somehow get our hands on it, wouldn't it be possible to rule and conquer the evil god himself? High Hirish Hukaka knew that the pure reed vampires would think this. It was only natural. They were only applying the teachings that he himself had given them. That was why High Hirish Hukaka had given them no information regarding Vandali in his divine message. A human-sized boulder flew from the catapult with a whoosh. The boulder fell accurately on top of a wooden target set up in the firing area, destroying it. Bazdia, who was sitting in a chair with a monster leather parasol protecting her from the sun much like a human lady let out a sigh of amazement as she rubbed her expanding abdomen. These catapults are amazing, they look very promising. Bazdia, this is still just the test firing phase. Vandali, this was the response of Vandali, who was being thrown into the air by poor Vina next to her, but he seemed not entirely unsatisfied. He was generally expressionless, had the eyes of a dead fish and a flat-toned voice, but once one got accustomed to it, it was possible to tell his emotions from his manner of speech, the slightly more carefree tone of speech he was using now was proof that he was in a good mood, the results of firing with normal projectiles are excellent, next, I'll begin test firing with Gillum projectiles, Vandali, yes, ready, poor Vina, as poor Vina gave this vague order, the catapult moved on its own and prepared to fire. This catapult was essentially a catapult-shaped gillum that Vandali had created through gillum transmutation. It was no ordinary catapult. It possessed arms and wheels made of stone. It was possible to make it load projectiles, take aim and fire all on its own. And as intwood had been used in the construction of its body, it had the sturdiness of metal and excellent resistance to fire. Fire. Poor Vina. The loyal catapult Gollum fired the next boulder, it flew through the sky in a trajectory similar to the previous one, but towards a different target, which had wooden dummies lined up around it for some reason, and landed on top of it, you and then the projectile let out a groan and stood up, did the catapult launch a Gollum? Bazdia, the sight of the projectile turned Gollum destroying the wooden dummies around it took Bazdia by surprise. The golem seemed to have taken some damage from the impact of landing, but it caused no problems in combat as golems didn't feel pain or anything. This would likely be incredibly effective in a real battle. The main weakness of golems was their slow movement. This method would provide the golems with a way to attack the enemy while removing that weakness. A golem fired at the enemy this way would easily break down the front lines and then run rampant among their ranks. This would not be an easy attack to deal with. Yes, and since we might be fighting subordinate vampires, I've put silver plating on its fists and toes. Vandali, you've got attention for detail. It's exciting to see. Bazdia, thank you, but it seems that the Gollum projectiles still have room for improvement. Vandali, do they really? Bazdia, it's destroyed all the wooden dummies set up as enemies, so as far as I can see, it's perfect, as Bazdia thought this, Vandali, 
who was sharing the vision of the undead insects he had set up nearby, shook his head. There's one wooden dummy that has only had its legs crushed. Its torso is completely unharmed. Even though I ordered the golem to kill. To inflict damage in ways that would be fatal to humans. Vandaly. It would be impossible for a human to enter a battle with two broken legs unless they were treated first. However, it would be possible for vampires to continue fighting even with both legs broken. Vandaly wanted the golem to crush their heads just in case. You've got a high amount of bloodthirst, don't you, Van? Bazdia. Hag. Poor Vina. Poor Vina threw Vandaly directly overhead. It seemed that she had reacted to the word high in Bazdia's sentence. She had once done this inside a room, causing a stain of Vandaly's nose blood to appear on the ceiling, so she had been forbidden to throw Vandaly into the air indoors. She seemed to be intent on enjoying herself as much as she could today. Poor Vina caught Vandaly as he fell onto her with a smacking sound. There's a big impact when I land, so do it more gently. Vandaly. Okay. Poor Vina. I'm begging you. I really am. Leaving that aside, I'll be starting the test firing of the special projectiles now. Vandaly. Vandaly spoke somewhat lifelessly, and then the catapult loaded a large barrel this time. And then it was launched. It drew an arc in the air. And then split into two. What? Did it fail? Bazdia. A transparent fluid spilled from within and splashed onto the ground in front of the target. No. It was quite successful. That was a barrel-shaped gillum I made for spreading poison and pathogens among the enemy. After it's launched, it splits at a certain timing and spreads its contents in front of the enemy. Vandaly. Pea poison? Bazdia. Yes, poison. It only had water in it just now, though. Vandaly. Poison and pathogens could be created as long as Vandaly had the mana for it. He could carry out biological terrorism anywhere, anytime. He did have to be careful not to be affected by his own poison and pathogens, however. If he was afflicted by the deadly poison and disease that was powerful enough to overcome his status effect resistance skill, he would collapse immediately without even being able to cast any spells. Poison and disease. Is that alright? Bazdia. It's more of a problem of what I spread than how I spread it. The undead and gillums will be fine, but poison and diseases will affect you and the other ghouls, after all. Vandaly. It was a truly difficult problem to solve. If he was planning to spread disease, it would be best to use pathogens with high infectious capacity, but it would be pointless if Bazdia and the others, especially the children with weak immune systems, were to be affected by them. It would be fine if he could use sterilization and disinfect right away but it was impossible to know what could happen during battle. So then would poison be better after all? But if Vigro and the other warriors were in the battle, it couldn't be used. Maybe it will be fine if I use the same components that are in the ghoul's paralyzing venom. I wonder if there are any deadly airborne diseases that are difficult to treat, highly infectious and only affect humans. Vandaly. Wait a minute, that's not what I was trying to ask. I'm trying to ask if it's really alright to do that. Our enemies might be humans, right? Bazdia. Yes. And? Vandaly replied as poor Vina threw him up and down slightly more gently than earlier. It seemed that he was still unsure as to why Bazdia seemed concerned. No. I'm not going to say that I have a problem with killing people, either. But won't it cause problems to kill too many? Bazdia. Ah. It would be problematic to kill more than necessary, wouldn't it? Vandaly. Vandaly nodded a few times in agreement. Probably. It was difficult to tell due to him being thrown up and down. It's fine. I'll be careful not to kill more than necessary, and it's not like these weapons have to be used. Mom wouldn't be happy about it, either. Vandaly. Darsa wasn't a peace advocate in particular. However, she wouldn't approve of a massacre. Either she would definitely hate unnecessary murder and try to stop Vandaly from performing such murder. If he actually did it, she would likely be heartbroken about it afterwards. Bazdia was a ghoul who had been raised in a village where she had been taught not to fight with adventurers. It was possible that she felt very reluctant to kill humans because of this. And Vandaly had no recollection of becoming a murderous fiend. He considered himself to be a normal person. People are creatures with societies and as long as that is the case, 
The happiness of humans lies in those societies. Vandalie's objective was to become happy and stay happy. Unnecessary murder would simply be an action that would lead him further from this goal. That's why I'll try not to kill any more than necessary. Vandalie. Yeah, we won't kill, you know? Poor Vina. Vandalie and poor Vina made this declaration together, but Vandalie continued speaking. But if I need to slaughter every single enemy to protect everyone, I'm going to do it. So don't get angry at me if it comes to that, alright? Vandalie. You got it? Poor Vina. He wouldn't kill people he didn't have to. However, there was a god and a religion that taught that killing every member of their races was justice. And this religion was the official religion of an entire empire. In order to survive in this world, there would be times where he would be forced to kill all of his enemies in order to survive. As Vandalie told Bazdia this, she seemed to get a little haughty. That's a given. If it were necessary to slaughter all of the enemies in order to protect this child and you and all the others, Van. I wouldn't hesitate. I'd gladly swing my axe at them. Bazdia, what a reliable mother you are. Vandalie. I am, aren't I? If you ever want to give me my child, let me know any time. Bazdia. That will be at least another ten years from now, Vandalie. As Vandalie gave Bazdia this response, poor Vina gave Vandalie a particularly large throw towards the sky. Falling from this height would cause quite the impact, so he used flight to float gently in the air. And then he reflected upon the events of the past few months. Chapter 21 it seems I've become a place for insects. Vandali and his companions had built their walls, solidified their defenses and prepared their weapons. Undead and Gillums had been successfully placed for surveillance purposes at locations where vampires and humans were likely to cross the boundary mountain range. Vandali had personally tried stepping into the entrances of the route that had been used by Elinora's party and the tunnel that led to the Hartner Duchy after the surveillance golems had been placed at these locations. There had been no particular problems on the route that Elinora's party had used. But things had been strange at the tunnel, from the outside, the tunnel looked as if it had simply caved in. But Vandalie had used Gillum transmutation to turn the rubble into Gillum's and spirit form transformation to go inside and investigate. He had found that the inside of the tunnel had been destroyed too thoroughly. According to what he had heard from Nuaza and the other undead titans, 200 years ago, the first Princess Lavia and the other undead titans used this tunnel to escape and then used some hidden mechanisms to seal the tunnel. But the inside of the tunnel was had been like an impossible puzzle. There hadn't been a single large rock among the rubble, only large amounts of soft dirt and sand. When he had tried to remove the rubble to rebuild the tunnel, more and more dirt and sand kept falling from above. That was the state the tunnel had been in. Vandalie hadn't investigated through the entire tunnel to the end but the first few hundred meters were all in this state. Even though the tunnel was covered by mountains high enough to reach the clouds, it was as if someone had used sophisticated earth attribute magic to turn the boulders and hard bedrock above the tunnel into tiny grains of sand in order to make it impossible to rebuild the tunnel. With this being the case, the tunnel would remain sealed forever if Vandalie's Gallant transmutation skill didn't exist. It would have been completely impossible for the MIG Shield Nation army of 200 years ago to reconstruct the tunnel. Nobody knew how Princess Lavia had collapsed the tunnel. It was possible that the mechanism or magic used to collapse it, which only Taylor Shime's royal family knew about, was just that incredible. However, Vandalie found this suspicious. He wondered whether the vampires had something to do with this. If he thought about it, the commercial trade between Taylor Shime and the Hartner Duchy would have been nothing but an eyesore for the pure reed vampires who worshipped the evil god and feared the pure reed vampires who worshipped Vida that lived in the southern regions of the Ban Gaia continent beyond the Boundary Mountain range. If trading had become very prosperous in Taylor Shime's geographical location, the people there would have eventually started exploring the southern regions of the continent. This could have caused the vampires worshipping Vida to possibly make a move. That might have been why they had chosen to mobilize the Amid Empire and the MIG Shield Nation without making any movements themselves. They had probably wanted to reduce the strength of the Empire and the MIG Shield Nation around then anyway, and with the vampires' influence extending into the Empire, starting a war would have been a simple matter.
Eleonora knew nothing about this, she seemed to have been considered an individual with great promise, but she hadn't been in an important position in the community as a whole, and not even a decade had passed since she had even become a vampire. Since the vampires in the same faction that worshipped the evil god didn't seem to be on good terms with each other, it was only natural that she didn't know. Vandalie stopped his speculations here no matter how much he investigated. The truth wouldn't be clear unless he were to talk to some person or spirit who knew about the events of two hundred years ago. For now, he just needed to increase his intent to kill the vampires who worship the evil god and the remaining tunnel in the mountain range leading to the Mig Shield Nation was found. It had been covered by a large boulder, however, as Vandalie had suspected. A tunnel had been built a hundred thousand years ago on this side of the mountain range as well. Borcus's party had slaughtered earth dragons, rock dragons and scattered a goblin king's large pack to find it. The dragon materials that they had brought back as souvenirs were currently in Terra's hands, being processed to create equipment. With this, Vandalie's surveillance network was complete. And though they didn't possess enough fighting strength to stand against the pure reed vampires, Everyone was improving both individually and as a whole. His powerful companions like Borcus, Eleonora and Vigro had leveled up in the past few months, but their ranks hadn't increased. However, prior to this, Vigro had undergone job change from warrior to axeman, a job specialized in using axe techniques. He had apparently even acquired the deforestation skill as well. He had acquired it during the search for the tunnel by cutting down trees that were in the way with his axe. Nuaza had become a rank 5 lich. I have finally lost the lesser from my race title. I will no longer allow Borka Stoner to call me a weak youngster. He said, smiling with his face that was only made of skin and bones. Braga had become a rank 4 black goblin assassin, while the other black goblins had become black goblin scouts. They were quite the team of scouts. It seemed that Braga was walking along the path of a ninja that he had heard about from Vandali. Zemado and Mamadiga had increased their ranks as well, becoming an Anubis rider and an Anubis monk respectively. Zemado had successfully tamed a monster he had captured in a dungeon and become able to fight while using it as a mount. Mamadiga had apparently increased in rank while studying magic and martial skills simultaneously shortly after she began going on dates with Berg in the church of Veda. Was this the goddess's blessing? The Orcus Gorba hadn't increased his rank yet, but his body had grown enough for him to stand shoulder to shoulder with the three meter tall Borcus and he had grown even stronger and sturdier. Most importantly, he had found a Giga in a forest and captured it alive. Because of this, Taylor Shime now had a supply of fresh eggs. Everyone was becoming stronger by increasing their ranks, leveling up and improving their skills. With this, unlike when they had been forced to escape the Devil's Nest forest, they were capable of fighting. Vandalie wanted more anti-vampire weapons prepared if possible, but he lacked time and, more importantly, skills and technology for those. However, Fortunately, it seemed that pure reed vampires and noble-born vampires who had lived a long time had an unusually slow perception of time, so when they made a move, they would use a plan that would take years, or several months at least to carry out. Vampires had long lifespans and surrounded themselves with the company of other vampires, so their sense of time was very different from that of humans. They often referred to events over ten years ago as, a little while ago. It was still unlikely that Vandalie would be left alone for ten years, but Eleonora estimated that they would take two to five years to make their next move as long as there were no special reasons to act faster. And so Vandalie decided that he should start taking action to achieve his own goals. He would acquire Vida's legacy, the resurrection device beneath Taylor Shime's royal castle, and resurrect Darsa. I have to become stronger for that as well. Vandalie. In order to do that, the half-destroyed dragon golem that still protected it needed to be defeated, but if that was all, Vandalie wouldn't need to become stronger, he would simply need to stand at the back and support Borcus, Eleonora, Vigro, Zadiras and the others. Darsa's resurrection was at stake, but there was no need for him to be positioned at the front. However, 
Only Vanderly was capable of melting the ice that sealed the chamber guarded by the dragon Gollum, and when he had gone to melt it, he had felt a powerful response from his constantly active danger sense, death. That was proof that the dragon Gollum had noticed Vanderly and was preparing to attack him the moment he tried to enter the chamber. In other words, even if he was planning to leave all of the fighting to Borkas and the others, there was a high chance that he would receive some kind of attack as soon as he opened the chamber and be killed immediately. Of course, Vanderly had become much stronger than he was the first time he had seen the dragon Gollum through the wall of ice. He had gone through a job change and leveled up his attribute values and his skills had increased, the soul break that he had acquired after destroying Sir Grant's soul was a particularly powerful skill, upon careful inspection, it had turned out to be a skill that dealt damage to mana equal to the amount of damage to vitality that Vanderly inflicted. If he dealt damage to vampires with this, their mana would stay damaged even if their vitality recovered immediately so this skill would be effective to use in battles against vampires, he would even be able to drain the dragon golem of the mana it used as its power source, if he could damage it, but even so, he still felt a powerful reaction from danger sense, death. That was why he needed to become stronger, that was why he decided to resume his dungeon clearing that he had put on hold, the dungeon we're going into is a C-class dungeon, It'll be on another level from the D-class dungeons you've already been in, kid, don't let your guard down. Borkus Borkus was doing his best to make a strict face, but the remaining half of his lips were raised in a smirk. Vanderly didn't comment on this. Yes, I'm relying on you to guide me through. Vanderly The dungeon they would be clearing was Borkus's sub-dragon Savannah. It was a dungeon discovered by Borkus's ancestors, countless generations ago. TLN I initially mistranslated this as Borcus's evil dragon Savannah due to the kanji for sub and evil being similar, and fixed now in the previous chapter where this dungeon was mentioned. Unlike the D-class Grins Valley and Durin's aquatic cavern, nobody usually entered this dungeon other than adventurers. No matter how strong titans were, this dungeon was too dangerous for anyone other than a genuine adventurer to venture into. That's right, this place is really harsh. There are a lot of flaws and the monsters are strong. There aren't many monsters that use attacks that inflict status effects or problematic traps, but the monsters are strong. Vigro, you have said the same thing twice. Are you drunk? Zadiris, but the monsters really are strong. Even though our ranks increased, it's tough for us from the third floor onwards if Vigro-san isn't with us. Saria, Jayu, from the eleventh floor onwards. It was difficult battle after difficult battle. Bone Man. The members of this exploration party were the rank 6 members Vigro and Zadiris, as well as Rita, Saria, Bone Man and Bone Bird who had become rank 5. Other than the inclusion of Borkus, their guide, they had a suitable amount of fighting strength for clearing this dungeon, as its name suggested. Borcus's sub-dragon savanna was a dungeon with many savannas in its drain. Some floors had forests, rivers and lakes, but they were mostly savannas. The scenery was dash, just like in a movie. Vandaly Vandaly whispered these words as he released a mana bullet. Dinosaurs roamed across the ground that was covered in thick, verdant grass that looked like a green carpet. It was as if Vandaly had traveled back in time to the Cretaceous period. It was a truly moving sight. Even as he noticed the groups of dinosaurs coming to attack, Vandaly's sense of wonder didn't disappear. Oi, if you don't hurry and crush that raptor. Oh, you've already done it. Borkus. As Borkus relaxed at the back and watched, one of the raptors that had slipped through the front line tried to attack Vandaly, only to be turned into mincemeat by a mana bullet. Normal mana bullets weren't this powerful. They were slower than arrows and attacks of other attributes of magic, difficult to fire in a controlled trajectory and easy to predict. It was a spell full of flaws, but Vandaly had poured 10,000 mana into a single bullet to release a projectile larger than himself that should have been called Super Mana Cannon. Its size made it hard to avoid and lately he had been twisting the shape of the mana to alter the projectile's trajectory. Because of this. It was even able to bring down a fast-moving raptor. I suppose the others won't have any problems on the first floor since they've been in here before. Borkus, 
Vovagro, Zadiris, Bone Man and the others were still inexperienced in his eyes. They were slaughtering the raptors with ease. The boss of this group of raptors was a rank 4 huge raptor that was larger and more intelligent than the rest, but they were fighting it safely. If there had been a few less raptors, Vandali would likely not have had to do anything. Well, this is where it starts. Borcus. The monsters appearing in the earlier floors of Borcus's subdragon savanna were mostly similar to the dinosaurs that Vandali knew or large reptile-type monsters such as crocodiles and turtles. It seemed that these monsters that had scales like dragons and yet weren't dragons had been named subdragons by the people of Taylorsheim. Incidentally, wyverns and similar monsters were apparently also categorized as subdragons. Indeed, it wouldn't be strange to think of them as being related to pterosaurs. TLN, the Japanese word for dinosaur is slash kiriyu, which literally means fearsome dragon. Subdragon is slash eriyu, so it's actually fairly similar to the actual word for dinosaur. As they descended from the first floor to the second and then from the second to the third, the battles with the monsters naturally became harsher. From the fifth floor onwards, there were no rank 3 monsters appearing at all and there were rank 5 monsters among the monsters that did appear. Jai Un. Oh. A Tyrannosaurus Rex. Vandali. An enormous, triangular silhouette, fangs sharp and long enough to be used as tips of spears, powerful rear legs and short front legs. Probably the most well-known carnivorous dinosaur on Earth. The Tyrannosaurus Rex. This was an armored Tyrannosaurus, a monster with a higher rank. It was a dinosaur covered in hard scales and a carapace like an ankylosaur, but it was apparently a rank 5 monster in Lambda. Vandali found it strange to think that this enormous carnivore was weaker than Bgogan and only as powerful as a wyvern, but it turned out that this wasn't so strange after all. Jayu, you will become provisions for my lord. Flowing water. Slicing moon. Bone Man Bone Man avoided the armored Tyrannosaurus's biting attack with flowing movements and half-severed its neck with a slash that drew a circular path in the air. After successfully increasing his rank, when Vandali had added more spirits to his body, he had drained even further and become a rank 5 skeleton baron. His swordsmanship skill was level 5, while his other skills such as archery and shield technique had reached level 4. The armored Tyrannosaurus was supposed to be of the same rank as him, but it was only capable of simple movements, perhaps due to its overly active instinct to attack. Bone Man performed complicated, mysterious movements that seemed to ignore the normal rules of motion as if they came naturally to him. This was the difference between them, my lord. What shall we do with this corpse? Bone Man I already have a Tyrannosaurus zombie, so I suppose we'll use it for materials and food. Which parts of the Tyrannosaurus monsters were tasty, again? Vandali I believe it was the area around their legs. Bone Man They took the armored Tyrannosaurus's magic stone, stripped it of its scales and carapace and then took a break as they ate the meat of its legs. The mid-boss on the 10th floor was a herbivorous dinosaur. But it wasn't the enormous, long-necked brontosaurus that Vandali had been hoping to see. It was a ferocious triceratops that even a wild boar would flee from. Boo! Flashes of lightning appeared around the horn on the tip of the triceratops's nose and the pair of horns on its forehead as it let out a roar that sounded somewhat similar to that of a cow and prepared to charge. <laughs> as to be expected from a creature of another world. Vandali. This Triceratops had undergone a fantasy-like evolution. It is a trihorn that has increased its rank and contains wind attribute mana in its horns. Leave this to us. Saria. We have defeated it before. Rita. Saria and Rita, the living armor sisters, stepped forward. They looked significantly different from how they had looked before. They had increased their ranks to become a rank 5 magic high leg armor and magic bikini armor, and finally acquired the spirit form skill. As a result, they had visible bodies instead of just being suits of armor. Bodies that were like clouds of white mist with no outline that were just barely human shaped. Their spirit form was vague and seemed as if it would be blown away by a strong wind, but their other skills had increased as well. Though they were rank 5, the two sisters could hold their own against rank 6 enemies. The promising looking pair charged directly at the trihorn from the front dash. Kaya, Saria, Rita. As they leapt up, 
their gauntlets that were still clutching their weapons. Their greaves and their iron boots separated and flew into the air. Huh? Vandali. Th they died? Have they died? Vigro. J G E E. Bone bird. Hey, hey. Isn't this looking bad? Borkus. Vandali was surprised. The two men and Bone Bird began to panic. However, Zadirus didn't panic or make any noise. Instead letting out an exasperated sigh. Another of their ill-humored jokes again. Zadirus, as she whispered this, retwin Saria's gauntlets and iron boots and turned in the air and they gripped their weapons, the halberd and the glaive, once more. boo -oo -oo. As the Trihorn who believed it had defeated them let out a roar of victory, they thrust their weapons into its neck, back and belly and cut it to pieces. And then the Trihorn stopped breathing and the pieces of armor that had separated reunited once more, restoring Saria and Rita to normal. We're done here. This method is effective against the Trihorn. Saria, I suppose it thinks that it has defeated us once we separate our parts. Its movements stop and it's full of openings. So it's a piece of cake, Rita. Ah, I suppose you're getting thirsty now. Here, it's freshly squeezed, Botchin. Saria. Vandali took the wooden cup full of fresh Trihorn blood from the two sisters who showed no signs of shame. I understand why you did it. But wasn't the screaming unnecessary? Vandali. R. That's. The electricity of the horns shocked me more than I expected, so I couldn't help it. Saria. Nasan. You're weak to electric shocks, aren't you? Rita. Rita. I believe I heard you screaming as well. Zadiris. Th. That was. I was just feeling a little playful. Rita. That kind of playfulness is unnecessary. And more importantly, tighten your spirit form. You look like a log. Zadiris, you're mistaken. This isn't because I had a child's body or that I had excess flesh when I was still alive, but because I'm still experienced, Rita. Don't play around in battle when you're still inexperienced. You scared the hell out of me. Vigro. Yeah, you've got some bad hobbies, Juchan. Borkus. Vandali was watching Rita being scolded by the senior members. It seemed that he had decided not to say anything to her himself. But Saria, you should be careful as well, okay? Even if you're going to do something like that, do it better next time. If you don't, I'll let my enemies cut my flesh and organs in battle again. Vandali, it's unfair that I get scolded for being reckless while others can get away with it. It should be fine to say at least this much. P please don't. Really, please don't. I'll think of a better way to do it. Saria with her face turning pale. Or not. Saria hastily made this promise. Things would probably be fine from now on. Though this is another topic. How did you do that thing where you separated into pieces while attacking? Vandali. Though Saria and Rita's pieces of armor were separate at first glance. They had generally moved together as if worn by an invisible person up until now. However. They had acquired the spirit form skill. Though it was still level 1 which had granted them misty bodies. Yet they had separated the pieces of their armor in battle. Shouldn't it have been the other way around? That's because we have acquired the long distance control skill. Saria. Long distance control? Vandali. Yes, it is a skill that lets us move parts of our bodies such as our gauntlets and boots separately from our main bodies. Saria. Apparently, Saria and Rita had wondered whether something like that would be possible and acquired the skill by practicing together. That seems like quite a useful skill. I would certainly like to acquire this skill myself, Jayu. Bone Man. G.E. Bone Bird. Bone Man and Bone Bird spoke up after hearing this story. Since Bone Man had flesh and cartilage made of spirit form and Bone Bird was made entirely of bones other than its wings. It was likely possible for them to acquire the long-range control skill with practice. If they controlled their spirit form, they would simply be separating their bones without any risk. It was likely that the long-range control skill was a special skill possessed by undead such as living armors, skeletons and zombies to begin with. Vandali hadn't seen it in this world yet, but scenes where a zombie or skeleton severed limbs would move and attack on their own had been almost obligatory to include in horror works on Earth. There were things like severed lizard tails that regret, but they didn't move on their own so that was probably different. I'd like to acquire that skill, too. 
Vandaly. A. Eh? Though the skill was a specialized skill for undead, Vandaly didn't see this as a reason that he couldn't acquire it himself. But as he said this, the atmosphere around everyone froze. You um, I don't know about Botchin separating himself into pieces. Saria. If you do not put yourself back together afterwards, would you not be forced to become an undead yourself, my lord? Bone man. No, I'm not planning to cut my own arms and legs off to practice. Vandaly. It would indeed be problematic if he didn't put himself back together afterwards. He thought that it might be possible if he used spirit form transformation beforehand, but if not, he might cause irreversible damage to himself. He had put himself back together after allowing Bgogan to cut his torso, but that was because he had repaired the damage immediately after being cut. There was no telling what could happen if he delayed the repairing process to practice for acquiring the skill. For now, let's try doing it with my hair. Vandaly. Zadirus and Bazdia had called Vandaly's long hair truly manly hair. It seemed that he had wanted it to be like the lion's manies of the ghoul men. Darsa had thought of it as being cute, so Vandaly was growing it out. Thinking that it was fine as it was, it would likely reach waist length soon. He did plan to cut it before it reached his ankles, however. Well, if it's your hair, then. Saria. My lord. If it does not work well with your hair please do not attempt to make changes to your fingers or anything of the sort. Bone man. It seemed that Vandaly had made them worry, but he had no intentions of giving up on the acquisition of the long-range control skill that seemed as if it would have a variety of applications. Even if he did acquire it, he had no plans to cut of his arms and send them flying to perform rocket punches or anything like that, however. Things got even harsher from the 11th floor onwards. The monsters appearing were all rank 5, and from time to time a rank 6 monster would appear on its own, but it's from the 11th floor onwards that this dungeon becomes a good hunting ground. There are a lot of usable materials other than those that come from monsters. Borcus. The fresh leaves of an enormous fern the size or a large tree could be crushed to make medicine, and if dried and boiled, they made a bitter but healthy tea. Apparently, adventurers in the past had ventured into this dungeon with the aim of reaching the floors containing plateaus in which amber could be found, and cliffs whose rocks would produce whetstones that made it more difficult for weapons to rust. And there were many experience points to be gained here. The dinosaurs here are on the verge of death, so please finish them off. Vandaly. As you will. Bone Man. Nasan. An octopus-like one went that way. Rita. Botchin. What is this flying monster that seems to be related to snails and octopuses? Saria. I think it's an ammonite. Though the ones I know didn't fly in the air. Vandaly. A knight of the ammo race. In that case. I shall be its opponent. Bone man. No. It's not really a knight. Vandaly. Bone Man stepped forward to challenge the flying ammonite with a shell as large as a bear to an honorable one-on-one -on -one duel. Including this ammonite, all of the monsters appearing here were individually of the same or higher rank as Bone Man. Of course, by defeating them, he could gain large amounts of experience points. You Iron Slash. Vigro. Facing a hard-headed herbivorous dinosaur's headbutt attack. Vigro used his newly learned axe technique martial skill. With a loud smashing sound, it split the dinosaur's oval-shaped, bony head in two, continuing down to its chest. Now that Vigro had become a ghoul berserker in the battle in the Devil's Nest Forest and acquired a job in Taylorsheim, his strength was equivalent to that of a B-class adventurer. As he had acquired the axeman job that provided bonuses to the axe technique and deforestation skills, he would likely continue to grow even stronger. You I've even split the magic stone in half. Vigro. What are you doing? Zadiris. Vigro felt the sensation of cutting through the magic stone among the flesh and blood and raised his voice. Zadiris sighed as she fired a spell at another dinosaur. Zadiris had reached level 100 long ago but had lacked the skills to increase her rank. Due to the training that she had done after coming to Taylorsheim. She was now a rank 6 school high mage. Her appearance hadn't changed significantly, 
but a red jewel had appeared on her forehead like a third eye. It was apparently some kind of organ that assisted her in the use of magic. Zadiris's light attribute attack spells were fearsome, cutting the ankylosaur like dinosaurs like hot knives through butter. The chant revocation skill is working well. Boy, can you give me a little of your mana? Zadiris. Yes, yes. Vandali. Her mana pool had increased as well, but it was certainly still nowhere near Vandali's. It was only natural for her to run out of mana if she used it carelessly. The most valuable materials that could be harvested in Borcus's sub-dragon savannah, other than the materials obtained from the dungeon's boss, were the honey and beeswax of the cemetery bees. They were Ankh 5 B-shaped monsters, around 30 centimeters in length. Each of them weren't individually threatening, but they were fearsome in that the whole swarm attacked together like a single unit. Their large jaws were capable of shredding plate armor like paper, and their sharp stingers couldn't be blocked by the average shield bearer, and the most vicious weapon they had was their deadly venom. The potent neurotoxin couldn't be resisted by average resistance skills and was capable of causing death by shock in minutes. It was said that countless corpses of adventurers desiring the exquisite honey and the beeswax that could be turned into the most extravagant candles and soap could be seen surrounding the nests of these monsters. So their nests were just like cemeteries, that's what I heard, but could it be that they're surprisingly friendly to people? Vandali. There's no way, kid, could it be that those bees are undead? Borcus. I think they're healthy and very much alive. Vandali. Borcus was astonished by the sight of Vandali being swarmed by so many bees that he appeared to be made of them. You wanted sweet things, so when you asked me to find some for you, this is what I thought of. The cemetery bees are the rarest monsters in this dungeon. Borcus, considering that, there are a lot of them, aren't there? Vandali. The cemetery bees buzzed around Vandali licking him with their tongues rather than biting him with their jaws or stabbing him with their stingers. Vandali didn't get the sense that they were surrounding him to increase his body temperature and overheat him to death, so it seemed that they were simply attached to him. Amazing, Botchin, even the bees are madly in love with you. Saria Jayu, is this really alright, my lord? Bone Man Probably? Vandali if Vandali had been someone who hated insects, he would probably have fainted, but he didn't dislike them that much. As a child, he had admired rhinoceros beetles and stag beetles. As he reminisced about this, a conspicuously large cemetery bee, leading countless other bees, flew towards him. It made a creaking sound with its jaws as it landed on Vandali's head. Boy, is that not what is known as a queen bee? Zadiris, it looks like it. Vandali. And what is it doing? Zadiris, probably being tamed? Vandali. Boy, is it possible that you can charm not only undead, but monsters with things like death and cemetery in their names? Zadiris, that's pretty amazing. I've heard that insectoid monsters have powerful instincts that makes it impossible for anyone to tame them. Borcus. Yeah, that's amazing, Vandali. This could be the first time anyone in the world has done this. Vigro, I'm guessing you're praising me, but I can't hear you over the sound of their wings. Vandali, it seemed that death attribute charm also worked on a certain kind of insects. Or perhaps he had used undead insects so much that even living insects had started to become attached to him. Monster explanation, vampires. This is the race born between the goddess Veda and the undead champion Zakat. While not technically monsters, many nations and societies treat them as monsters, and thus they are explained as monsters here. There are currently three kinds of vampires, pure breed, noble born and subordinate. Their communities are built and managed as strict vertically structured societies. The majority of vampires encountered and reported to the Adventurers Guild are subordinate vampires. Encounters with noble-born vampires are very rarely reported. Although vampires are monsters, they are capable of possessing jobs as they are also blood-related to the goddess. Due to this, the skills they possess vary significantly compared to other monsters. Subordinate vampires alone are powerful adversaries and noble-born vampires are a threat equivalent to or even greater than dragons. Because of this, 
The Adventurers Guild recommends that adventurers report any sightings of vampires to the guild rather than try to defeat them on their own. There are large differences between individual vampires, but according to the Adventurers Guild, subordinate vampires are a minimum of rank 3. Noble-born vampires are defined as vampires of rank 7 and above. Subordinate vampires only possess physical vampiric powers, but when their rank increases, they gain skills such as beast transformation and clone, making them extremely dangerous beings. It has been confirmed that they have race titles such as Vampire Slaves, Vampire Lycans and Vampire Rebels after their rank increases. Noble-born vampires possess magical powers, and depending on the individual, may even possess some kind of demon eyes. They tend to place importance on studying magic diligently, but that does not make them physically inferior to subordinate vampires. Because of this, superior individuals master both magic and martial skills and possess high base attribute values, making them nightmarish creatures. Incidentally, there is a misconception that all noble-born vampires have demon eyes of charming, paralysis or mind reading. But demon eyes are in fact a unique skill that only a handful of individuals possess. This misconception is likely caused by those witnessing noble-born vampires casting spells that have similar effects to such demon eyes. Most noble-born vampire race titles follow the aristocratic system used in human societies. Inexperienced rank 6 vampires are just vampires, but they are vampire leaders at rank 7, vampire barons at rank 8 and so on. All of these vampires have a common weakness to sunlight, silver and attacks of light attribute magic, which is governed by the god of law and fate, Elder. Depending on their family and the evil god they worship, they may possess additional weaknesses such as not being able to enter buildings they are not invited into and weaknesses to garlic and running water. There is almost no information available about pure-read vampires. The only thing that is known is that even the highest rank noble-born vampire with the race title of Vampire Emperor would bow and swear loyalty to a pure-read. Furthermore, Sir Grant was a rank 7 vampire leader, his talent was clearly inferior to that of Eleonora, who became a rank 8 vampire baroness in the space of a few years. Chapter 22 The victory against the mid-boss was unfulfilling. But the dragon golem is next. Insectoid monsters have no ability to think and move solely on instinct. Upon hearing this, one might think that this would make it easier for tamers such as those with the animal trainer skill to control them. However, the reality is that their instincts are too powerful for humans to manipulate. There have been those who came up with ways to use special herbs, incense and certain sounds to control them to a certain extent but the final result was too unstable to be called taming. It was a dangerous method where one mistake would end with the would-be tamers being eaten, and thus, the fact that insectoid monsters and undead cannot be tamed became widely known. Is that how it's supposed to be? Vandaly asked after listening to Borcus's explanation. Buzzing, it is, replied Borcus. More buzzing. I find that hard to believe. Vandaly had been captured by the countless cemetery bees and was now being carried around by them. They're so friendly, though, it apparently happened to be the time of year where the cemetery bees would change the location of their nest when Vandaly had found them, and then they had been caught by his death attribute charm. There had been a previous incident where the undead in a dungeon were friendly towards Vandaly, but he hadn't managed to tame them and bring them outside the dungeon back then. However, these bees had followed Vandaly's party even down to the next floor. It was likely because the level of Vandaly's death attribute charm skill had increased since back then. Or perhaps it was simply that cemetery bees were more compatible with Vandaly. Ghouls, vampires, and cemetery bees. This death attribute charm works on a lot more things than I thought, said Borcus. Cemetery bees were originally one of the types of monsters created by the Demon King to fight against humans and take over this world. It is possible that they were actually created by an evil god who rules over death. Either way, if death attribute charm levels up any further, it might be a good idea to start avoiding dungeons and devil's nests where there are lots of undead. It would be pandemonium if I was followed by hordes of undead each time I entered and exited such places. It might be an effective way to gather forces quickly, though. So what are you going to do about that guy? 
asked Vigro, pointing at the mid-boss on the 20th floor of Borcus's sub-dragon savannah. Jai Uun, the rank 6 venom wyvern spread the wings that were attached to its front limbs as it let out a roar. It was a wyvern that had grown older and increased its rank, becoming larger and evolving to gain the ability to secrete deadly venom from its claws and the enormous spike at the end of its tail. Its intelligence was still just at the level of being relatively intelligent for a beast, and it was still incapable of spitting some form of deadly breath. However, the speed and mobility of normal wyverns couldn't compare to those of the venom wyvern. It was said that it would be impossible even for C-class adventurers to defeat this monster in close-range combat without being able to fly themselves. I'll try fighting it alone, just as we planned at the start. Vandaly had been planning to use the mid-boss that appeared before the boss of Borcus's sub-dragon Savannah as a test for himself. Even if he leveled up and his attribute values increased, it would be meaningless if he couldn't put them to use in real battles. He wouldn't be able to confidently say that he had become strong enough to not be killed instantly by the dragon Gillum. For that purpose, he was to fight the Venom Wyvern one on one and see if he could defeat it. Of course, without using a mana absorption barrier to remove the mana from its wings and bring it to the ground. Of course, even if he was able to defeat the Venom Wyvern, there was no guarantee that he would be able to avoid an instant death at the hands of the half destroyed Dragon Golem. That dragon golem was overwhelmingly superior to the weak dragon that was currently flapping its wings threateningly in front of Vandaly. Well, this is just to get an idea of how strong I am. I know I am not going to gain any special abilities or anything from beating this mid-boss. If I win, I'll try going down to the dragon golem again and if it's still not going to work out, I'll just have to come back and do more training. Make sure you don't die, Borkus warned him. Do your best. Boy, do not forget that we are all watching over you, said Zadiris. Receiving this encouragement, Vandaly stepped forward to challenge the Venom Wyvern on his own. I failed this time, too, said Vandaly. Well, it can't be helped. I heard that C-class adventurers need to have a lot of talent or put in an incredible amount of hard work. Vandaly works hard for his age, but it's one-on-one. -on -one. You're a tamer, so you don't need to worry about it right? After failing for the fifth time, Vandaly had returned to Taylor Shime and was resting while developing more weapons, making catch a bushy and doing other various things. He was currently attending a meeting between Bilder and the other mothers who were busy raising their children, where ideas regarding childcare were being exchanged. He was also practicing death attribute magic at the same time. The food menu was mostly Japanese consisting of miso soup containing kachibushi and wild vegetables, acorn powder udon and agar soaked in honey for dessert. He had first tried making kachibushi around this time last year, mass producing failed products that had been made using a process based on his knowledge from Earth of over 20 years ago, but he had finally become able to make it successfully and reliably recently. I should have learned more about kachibushi and smoking food. Well, I'd never imagined that I would be making kachibushi in another world. He had tried to connect the pieces of his vague knowledge of the process from television and whatnot and executed it as best as he could, producing large quantities of failures as a result. He got the feeling that the fillets were supposed to be smoked near a charcoal fire, but it was likely that he remembered it incorrectly or the method he remembered was some kind of unorthodox one. As for the udon, it had been made using acorn flour that was smoother than wheat flour with the eggs of the giga bird that Gorba had captured to bind the flour together. He had originally wanted to make ramen, but he had been unable to make lye water TLN. Apparently this is something that is necessary for acidity regulation in the ramen making process. Sodium carbonate and potassium carbonate are the main ingredients of lye water, in other words, it is a special kind of alkaline solution. Vandaly was currently trying to think of ways he might be able to make it. Even the spirits of the researchers in origin that Vandaly had listened to hadn't made their own lye water. He was trying to devise a method, so he would likely be able to make it in a few years' time. Vandaly had been surprised to learn that noodles didn't exist in Lambda. There was no Udon, Soba, Raymond, not even Pasta. So when he had first made Udon, everyone's impressions had been something along the lines of, this bread is quite long and thin, 
It's interesting that you've used boiling water to make it. Well, that was why spreading the Japanese custom of slurping when eating udon and soba seemed like it would be fun. He had thought that there would be at least udon or pasta, but considering that there was no smoked food either, perhaps there were only simple foods and recipes in this world, perhaps the reason was that the people hadn't had the freedom to invent them, or the fact that delicious monster meat and produce could be obtained from devil's nests, eliminating the need to invent such food. And the agar used for the dessert was something that Vandali had made from tengusa, while the honey was, of course, from the cemetery bees Vandali had tamed, or rather, been forced to tame the cemetery bees, who were now building an enormous nest in Taylor Shime's royal castle. Even though it was winter, worker bees were being sent into the devil's nests to produce honey. Incidentally, the cemetery bees mainly ate meat. There was no problem with giving them the meat of monsters that wasn't suitable for eating, such as that of goblins. The honey of the cemetery bees had a powerful scent and rich taste. The combination of agar with this honey had become very popular with things like tengusa and kombu being major food ingredients. The inhabitants of Taylor Shime were forced to reconsider their opinions on the value of seaweed. They required effort to make, however, as they couldn't be created through the cast of a spell like miso and fish sauce. Come to think of it, Van. Isn't it a bad idea to give honey to the children? asked Bazdia. This is honey that has had everything harmful to the body removed, so there's no problem, said Vandali. Vandali had used sterilization and disinfect to remove any components that could cause harm to the body from the honey while preserving its quality. It would be impossible for anyone to collapse from eating this honey, though he couldn't change the fact that one would gain weight if they ate too much of it. So I suppose it's fine for them to eat. You Tilda. The baby in her arms made a strange noise, but it's still too early for you to eat baby food, Jiddle. Bazdia readjusted the way she was holding the baby, who was reaching a hand out towards a plate full of honey-covered fruit, so that the baby was further away from it. Jiddle was Bazdia's daughter who had been born towards the end of summer, perhaps in return for Bazdia having gone through so much trouble getting pregnant, the birth and delivery had been surprisingly straightforward. Now Jiddle was growing quickly. Her grey-brown, puffy cheeks were very adorable. Jiddle Chan has grown big, hasn't she? said one of the other mothers. Ah, are you trimming her claws properly? No, it seems like she hasn't grown any yet, replied Bazdia. When did Vabi start growing them? For Vabi, I suppose it was just before she turned a year old. But sometimes they can grow them as early as three months after they're born so make sure you trim them properly. Children can hurt themselves with their own claws. After all, said another mother. Did that happen for you, King? Vandali started growing his claws after only three months, but he was already very smart by then, said Darsa. Really? Smart at the age of three months. That's amazing. He was only a year old when he came to our village, so I think it's a bit late to be surprised. Darsa was smiling as she joined in on the conversation between the ghoul mothers. She had only been visible to Vandali and the undead up until now, but now she was able to be seen by Bazdia, Bildu and the others as well as converse with them thanks to the visualization spell that Vandali had invented, though it did make her appear rather transparent. He had thought that Darsa would be less stressed if she could communicate with others more smoothly. So he had created the spell with that in mind. Well, since it also made the whip marks and burns on her spirit visible, it would be difficult to use in human societies, unlike in Taylor Shime where everyone knew about her circumstances. Vandali wanted to resurrect her and make this spell useless before entering human societies. Meanwhile, Vandali was playing with the ghoul children nearby. Now Tilda. Another of the ghoul babies made a noise. As ghoul boys had the heads of lions as soon as they were born, they looked just like kittens at this age. They didn't have paws, but they were very cute. Bone Man didn't seem to be able to deal with them, however. Vandali was really glad that he had instructed him not to harm any cats without thinking. Papa, I'm not your papa, said Vandali. I know you're really attached to me. But I'm not your papa, let's make this very clear, Nin- That's right, Nin is correct, if by Nin you mean Nana-chan, you're absolutely right, I'm three years older than you. Nay, 
Not nay nay, nin I'm not your Anichan, the king is kind of girlish, I guess. One of the ghoul mothers commented, like the shape of his head. You're right, if he had the same skin color as us, you'd never think he's a boy, said another, as ghoul men had the heads of lions. From Bildu and the other mother's perspective, Vandali had feminine features and a girl's head. However, it seemed that this didn't apply for the undead titans like Borcus or Zran who had large, robust bodies with beautiful muscles. Mew. Once my voice changes and I hit my second growth period, I'm sure I'll be like them, too. And by the time I'm an adult, I'll have a cleft chin, arms like logs, a broad chest. Abdominal muscles like the caterpillar tracks of a tank and thighs thicker than a woman's waist. I'll definitely be as macho as a Hollywood star. I have the superhuman strength skill that increases my muscle strength, so I'm sure of it, probably, I hope. Poor Vina, with the other children riding on her back as if she were a horse, passed happily by Vandalie as he was feeling strangely insecure about his future self. She was almost one year old, but she was already big enough to look five or six. She was currently obsessed with letting the other children ride on her back. She was definitely not showing off her future promise of becoming a muscular individual right in front of Vandali. Come to think of it, what happened with clearing the mid-boss? Asked Bazdia. Once I'm finished with this break, I'll be going to challenge it for the sixth time replied Vandali. Vandali had repeatedly lost to the mid-boss on the 20th floor of Borcus's sub-dragon Savannah. Of course, it wasn't as if his life was put at risk during these fights. In a fight to the death, he would win, but simply based on the rules he had set. He was losing. He fought the mid-boss one-on-one. -on -one. This included the restriction of the use of gilems created through gilem transmutation. On top of that, he wasn't allowed to use mana absorption barrier to rob the mid-boss of its mobility. The time limit he had set was determined by an hourglass, which took roughly five minutes for all of its sand to fall. Vandali had fought the Venom Wyvern under these rules five times. He couldn't land his attacks on the Venom Wyvern, and even if he did, they were ineffective, and five minutes would quickly pass. He had repeated this process several times. Using disinfect removed the venom inside the venom wyvern's body, which meant that he didn't need to worry about being poisoned until it produced the venom again. His impact negating barrier was more than enough to stop the venom wyvern's direct attacks, but Vandalie's attacks hadn't been able to deal a decisive blow, either. At first, he had tried using the no attribute spell, Flight, to match his opponent but he had been completely unable to keep up. If it were just a matter of speed, he would have been able to move faster by simply spending a great amount of mana. But the Venom Wyvern was far superior when it came to performing tight turns. To begin with, the no attribute spell, Flight, was simply a spell that used telekinesis to move the caster's body. It wasn't a match for the skillful, complicated flying techniques of the Venom Wyvern that employed the use of wind attribute mana in its wings. And then he had tried defeating it from a distance, he had tried aiming at it with mana bullets, but this had failed due to their problematic range and projectile speed. At any rate, mana that wasn't affected by any attribute dispersed easily. The mana bullet spell was a spell that gathered such mana to prevent its dispersion as much as possible. However, there were limits to how much he could prevent it from dispersing, their range was only several dozen meters normally, and even when Vandali poured 10,000 mana into a single projectile, it didn't even last a hundred meters. Even using multicast to release multiple mana bullets at the same time had the same result, their speed was inferior even to arrows, never mind bullets fired from the guns on earth, and their trajectory was linear making them very easy to avoid. Dodging them was child's play for the Venom Wyvern that could fly in any direction at high speeds. Vandalie had tried methods like twisting the shape of the mana bullets to alter their trajectory, but still none of them had managed to hit. If they did, they had enough destructive power to burst the Venom Wyvern's flesh and organs. However, in any case, as Vandalie was unable to engage it in close quarters combat and mana bullets were ineffective, this meant that he was left with the indirect methods of poisoning it, infecting it with disease, using soul break to somehow take its mana away and distracting it with a lemur to create an opening. 
But even when he had managed to get poison created using his deadly poison spell into the venom wyvern's eyes and mouth, it wasn't effective as it seemed to possess the poison resistance skill. Things had gone well when he had done the same thing with disease, but five minutes passed before the disease began to work. Soul break was a skill that had no effect if Vandalie couldn't land any physical or magical attacks on the enemy, and since the mana drained by the skill was equal to the amount of damage dealt to the body, he couldn't drain any of the Venom Wyvern's mana. Though Liam Yours had worked on lesser Wyverns, the Venom Wyvern hadn't shown any large openings despite being surprised by the bloodthirst that the Lima suddenly produced. And then Vandalie had remembered his battle against Sir Grant and amplified his impact negating barrier at the moment of the Venom Wyvern's attack, managing to trap its claws and tail in the barrier and creating an opening for the first time. But before he had managed to move into an attack, it twisted its long neck to bite off the tip of its tail and its trapped port to escape. It was even more resolute than Sir Grant had been. This wasn't something that even a wild animal would be able to do immediately. It was only its fighting instincts as the mid-boss of a dungeon and the knowledge that it would die instantly if one of Vandalie's mana bullets struck its torso that allowed it to do this. And after that, the five-minute time limit passed again, after their battles. Borkus and the others had quickly dealt with the Venom Wyvern, continued on to defeat the dungeon boss on the 30th floor and taken the loot in the treasure chamber. This had given him experience and caused him to level up. I can definitely win next time, said Vandalie. Vandalie, you don't have to be in such a hurry, you know? Said Darsa, if I'm resurrected five years, ten years or even a hundred years from now, I don't mind. It's all right, said Vandalie. I say this every time, but it'll be all right this time. Darsa seemed uncertain, but Vandali knew he had a chance to win this time. He had gotten an idea for altering the mana bullet spell to create a new death attribute spell. Vandali had thought that death attribute magic had limited ways to deal damage directly to enemies, but if there were limited ways, he just had to invent some. He had postponed the invention of such a spell because he didn't gain any experience from defeating enemies himself, but he could devote his efforts to it if necessary. As a result, he had successfully finished developing a new spell yesterday. This spell was a projectile affected by the death attribute with long range, high speed and a difficult to read trajectory. I'll definitely win next time. There won't be a seventh time, Vandali declared confidently. Unlike the regular monsters, Mid-bosses and bosses that appear in dungeons are produced by the dungeon's core. That is why no matter how many times a boss is defeated, once a certain amount of time passes, a monster of equal strength appears in its place. Shea, Shwa, seven enormous snake heads large enough to swallow a cow whole were coiling around each other. However, there was only one tail. It is one of the dragon races, a serpent with multiple heads. When this creature hatches from its egg it has two heads and is the size of a Japanese rat snake, but the number of heads increases as it develops, as does the size of its body, the hardness of its scales, its regenerative abilities and the potency of its venom. And once it matures to adulthood, it becomes an enormous seven-headed serpent known as a hydra. It is rank six, superior to wyverns among the dragon races. Its intelligence is not much different from a normal snake and it is far less mobile than wyverns. However, its powerful body can mow down a human with ease, and it is difficult to wound it through its scales with normal methods, and the substance secreted from its fangs is a potent venom that cannot be removed without a special antidote, and what makes this creature difficult to kill is its resilience that keeps it alive unless all of its heads are cut off and its heart is destroyed. If only one of these two steps are taken, its regenerative ability will allow it to make a full recovery in a matter of days. Incidentally, hydras can develop even further to grow an eighth head, becoming known as an Oki. Its name was no doubt given to it by one of the champions from another world. I want a rematch, said Vandalie seeing the hydra that had appeared for his sixth attempt at fighting a mid-boss of Borcus's sub-dragon Savannah. No, that's probably impossible, said Borcus, denying him immediately, but I just invented a new spell to deal with the Venom Wyvern's mobility. The hydra was less intelligent and less mobile than a normal wyvern. Of course, 
it couldn't even compare to the higher rank version, the Venom Wyvern, there's nothing to be done about it, Borkus told him, it was actually really unusual that the same monster spawned five times in a row as the mid-boss in the first place, normally, the race of mid-bosses and bosses that appear in dungeons are not fixed, they tend to be of around the same general strength, but they are generated randomly by the dungeon, this dungeon would generate rank 6 dragon or dinosaur type mid-bosses, the Venom Wyvern was probably one of the stronger monsters that could have been generated, the reason it had appeared 5 times in a row was due to Vandalie's bad luck, it's not like that Hydra's going to back down now, said Borkus. try it out, that new spell of yours, sure, death bullet, as Vandalie lifted a hand towards the Hydra that was raising its curved necks, a black object resembling shimmering hot air appeared at his palm. He fired the death bullet at the Hydra that had sensed some extraordinary presence and was trying to escape. The death bullet consisted of death attribute mana capable of draining an enemy's life force, condensed using the same principle as the mana bullet. He couldn't fire them consecutively because he still wasn't used to casting the spell, but their range and speed were on another level. They also had a homing ability that allowed them to chase targets to a certain extent. Shijia. However, the death bullet's projectile speed and homing ability proved unnecessary as it hit the Hydra with ease. A scream rose from the Hydra as its vitality was drained, and its heads began lowering towards the ground one by one. Vandalie fired multiple more death bullets, and once all of its heads were lying on the ground, he fired one last death bullet at its heart to deal the final blow. What remained was the corpse of a Hydra that was dead despite being completely unwounded. Oh, that's pretty amazing, said Borkus, considering that the amount of mana I spent was equivalent to the entire mana pools of a hundred first-rate mages. Not really, said Vandalie. That might be true, but that's less than one percent for you, isn't it? Anyway, you should be happy. You beat a mid-boss in less than a minute, never mind the five-minute time limit. I did, but you don't need to be so focused on the Venom Wyvern. The main thing is, you just need to become strong enough that the Dragon Golem won't kill you straight away, Borkus reminded him. Isn't that right? You're right, but I still can't feel satisfied. Still, as Borkus says, clearing this dungeon repeatedly until the Venom Wyvern appears is wandering too far away from my goal. So I guess this will do. The Dragon Golem is next. The levels of the Death Attribute Charm strengthen followers, no attribute magic, mana control, cooking and unarmed fighting technique skills have increased. You have acquired the long distance control skill. Name, Vandali. Race, Damp, Dark Elf. Age, 4 years old. Title, Ghoul King. Job, Death Attribute Mage. Level, 100. Job History, None. Attributes, Vitality, 90. Mana, 204,506,933 Strength, 67 Agility, 46 Stamina, 71 Intelligence, 233 Passive Skills Superhuman Strength, Level 1 Rapid Healing, Level 3 Death Attribute Magic, Level 5 Status Effect Resistance, Level 5 Magic Resistance, Level 1 Dark Vision, Mental Corruption Level 10 Death Attribute Charm Level 5 Level Up Chant Revocation Level 3 Strength in Followers Level 6 Level Up Automatic Mana Recovery Level 3 Active Skills Blood Sucking Level 3 Surpass Limits Level 4 Golem Transmutation Level 4 No Attribute Magic Level 4 Level Up Mana Control Level 4 Level Up Spirit Form Level 2 Carpentry Level 4 Engineering Level 3 Cooking Level 2 Level Up Alchemy Level 3 Unarmed Fighting Technique Level 2 Level Up Soul Break Level 1 Multicast Level 1 Long Distance Control Level 1 New Curses Experience gained in previous life not carried over Cannot learn existing jobs Unable to gain experience independently Chapter 23, The Battle Against the Dragon Golem that was 70% destroyed by the hero. 
Since Vandalie's death attribute mage job had reached level 100 after his sixth clearing of Borcus's sub-dragon Savannah, he headed for the job changing room in the Adventurer's Guild for the first time in over a year. Give me some fish sauce for this, miso as well, catch a bushy and kombu for me. Is there any honey? I want some wasabi, too. Give me some acorn powder, the giga eggs are sold out, huh? Then at least give me some eel. Ammonite is fine as well. The Adventurer's Guild had been turned into a place where the food that Vandalie had invented, including the flavorings and kombu, was being distributed and traded. People would come here to receive a rationed amount, and if they wanted any more than that, they would have to barter using materials that they had gathered from the devil's nests. Requests for goods had been posted on a board so that the goods in short supply would be replenished so it appeared as if the Adventurer's Guild had begun operating again. If real Adventurer's Guilds were full of ghouls and undead like this, going in and out would be easy, Vandalie said to himself. Leaving that wishful thinking aside, the ghouls and undead titans would be able to make acorn powder themselves without having to trade for it, though the flavorings would be impossible for them. When asked why they came to trade for it instead, these were the responses they gave. Hey. Hey, we get miso, fish sauce, kombu and agar distributed for free and if we want more, all we have to do is pick up monster materials, magic stones and ingredients like acorns and bring them into trade. Why should we have to spend time making it on our own? You have to break acorns, soak them in water for three days and then dry them before turning them into powder, right? Killing monsters is easier. It seemed that the undead titans and ghouls' sense of manual labor was very different to that of the humans on Earth. Well, it's much easier to go into a devil's nest and hunt an orc than raise a pig from birth for its meat, so I understand how they feel. Vandali seemed to have been raised into quite the hunter himself. Incidentally, the amount of products Vandali was producing had increased, so he had built a special manufacturing facility for things like acorn powder and walnut sauce. He had used his alchemy skill to make magic items imbued with spells like withering for drying and decomposition to decompose the flesh of the walnuts. Golems were set up in lanes to perform tasks like smashing, cooking and powdering the ingredients, so there was a lane of golems for making acorn powder and one for making walnut sauce. Seeing the golems shaped like mortars and other equipment at work reminded Vandali of factories on earth. The only fuel required was mana so it was very economically and environmentally friendly. And in an emergency, the golems would change shape to participate in battle. It was a wonderful, environmentally friendly factory that didn't require any maintenance. I wonder if I can industrialize the Norai and Dagar as well. If I made more labor necessary, it would create more jobs in the future. But the ghouls and titans are hunters so maybe I don't need to worry. But in a few decades from now, there will be black goblins and Danubizes who have aged and can't fight anymore. Vandalie contemplated these truly complicated factors. Well, let's leave thinking about the societal system for later on. So, the job change. I suppose I'll be a golem transmuter now. Vandalie could only acquire undiscovered jobs due to the cannot learn existing jobs curse. During his previous job change, Golem Transmuter was the available job that had appeared alongside Death Attribute Mage, so he would definitely be able to undergo a job change now. He calmed himself down and coolly reached out to touch the crystal ball in the job changing room. Jobs that can be selected, Golem Transmuter and Dead Tamer Soul Break of Venom Fist User Insect User. There's a lot more. Vandalie whispered in astonishment at the five jobs displayed in his head. It seemed that among the three curses Rod Gorty had placed on him, this one was the most pointless. Well, it will probably cause trouble for me in the future. The reason Undead Tamer hadn't appeared previously is probably because I wasn't aware that Undead can't normally be tamed until I heard about it from Eleonora. It's strange to think that whether the job is displayed or not is dependent on whether I'm aware of this fact, but it's probably something like that. It seems self-explanatory that this job will provide bonuses to undead related skills, but many tamer type jobs apparently don't provide a lot of bonuses to attribute values. 
Soul Breaker is clearly a job that was appeared because I acquired the Soul Breaker skill after destroying Sir Krent's soul. Soul Break is a skill that applies its effects to all of my attacks. Wouldn't this job probably give me bonuses to a wide range of both magic related and martial type skills? As for its attribute value bonuses, I have no idea. It seems like it would increase strength and intelligence, though. And Venom Fist user, what is it? Could it be a job that appears for someone who uses death attribute magic after reaching a certain level with the unarmed fighting technique skill and killing a certain number of enemies with poison? It seems like it would probably give bonuses to unarmed fighting technique, strength, agility, and stamina, but it seems like the kind of job that would make people refuse to shake hands with me. It would break my heart if people refused a handshake or wiped their hands with a handkerchief after shaking my hand. There's no doubt that insect user has appeared because I tamed the cemetery bees. Its bonuses to skills and attribute values are probably the same as undead tamer except applying to insects instead of undead. It would be a good job if it increases the amount of honey the bees produce. It might even be interesting to tame rhinoceros beetles and stag beetles so I can call myself the king of insects that I couldn't become on earth. But I'm going with Gillum Transmuter this time because the opponent I'm fighting next is Dragon Gillum. There were no stories telling what kind of inorganic mineral the Gillum was made of and appraisal couldn't be used through the ice. There was a chance that the Gollum transmutation skill would be useful against the Gollum that was made of an unknown substance. Controlling it directly would be impossible, but the place where Vandalay would be fighting it was a large yet finite space. There was a floor, walls and, most importantly, a ceiling. In addition, the Gollum's wings had been broken. There was no chance that it would be able to fly freely. If I turned the floor and walls into Gollum's and manipulate them, I should be able to rob the dragon Gollum of its freedom or at least slow its movements down. Gollum transmutation was useful when I killed Sir Krent and his subordinates. I've used it to develop Gollums that manufacture acorn powder and walnut sauce as well as repair Taylor Shime's walls and royal castle. This skill should become important in helping me survive longer and making my life richer. You have selected Gollum transmuter. The levels of the strength in followers and Gollum transmutation skills have increased. Name, Vandaly. Race, Damp. Dark Elf. Age, 4 years old. Title, Ghoul King. Job, Gollum transmuter. Level, 0. Job history, Death attribute mage. Attributes, Vitality, 90. Mana, 204,506,933. Strength, 67. Agility. 46. Stamina, 71. Intelligence, 238. Passive skills, superhuman strength, level 1. Rapid healing, level 3. Death attribute magic, level 5. Status effect resistance, level 5. Magic resistance, level 1. Dark vision, mental corruption, level 10. Death attribute charm, level 5. Chant revocation, level 3. Strength in followers, level 7. Level up. Automatic mana recovery. Level 3. Active skills. Blood sucking. Level 3. Surpass limits. Level 4. Gollum transmutation. Level 5. Level up. No attribute magic. Level 4. Mana control. Level 4. Spirit form. Level 2. Carpentry. Level 4. Engineering. Level 3. Cooking. Level 2. Alchemy. Level 3. Unarmed fighting technique. Level 2 Soul Break Level 1 Multicast Level 1 Long Range Control Level 1 Curses Experience gained in previous life not carried over Cannot learn existing jobs Unable to gain experience independently When Vandaly checked his status, he found that his attribute values hadn't increased as much as they had when he acquired the death attribute mage job. Well, that's probably just how the difference between a first job change and a second one is. Now then, time to go below the royal castle. Vandaly paused and reconsidered. Before that, I need to test out my Gallant transmutation skill now that it's leveled up, and I should ask everyone how they're feeling now that my strength in followers skill has leveled up as well. Vandaly inspected the Gillum transmutation skill to find that it cost him less mana than before to create Gillums. 
If he were to cross the boundary mountain range again, he would be able to create the paths to do so at twice the speed that he had managed the first time. In the future, I might be moving the mountains out of the way rather than creating paths or digging a tunnel, though I won't do it that carelessly, because it would be troublesome if I happened to come across some magma. I don't know anything about this world's geographical structure, anyway. Also, his gillums had become stronger. It seemed that his gillums had started being affected by strength in followers. They wouldn't be able to put up a fight against the dragon gillum, but they would probably be useful in the future. You really mustn't push yourself too hard, said Darsa. If you think it's too dangerous, you have to run away immediately, okay? That's what I intend to do. Mom, Vandali assured her. Botchin, may fortune be with you, said Sam but it is also courage to escape when the situation calls for it. If the situation calls for it, I'll open a hole in the wall and come running back. Vandali and his carefully selected companions headed below the royal castle as Darsa and the others saw them off. The enemy they would be facing was the Dragon Gillum, the hero who had been said to be destined to become S-Class, a hero so powerful that he had killed Borcus with a single attack, had not been able to defeat this enemy. Its head, right arm, wings and tail had been destroyed, cracks were running all across its body and the magic spear was even still embedded in its chest, but even so, this was a powerful enemy for Vandali and his party to face, that was why Vandali had only chosen those who were rank 6 or above, those who could be revived by being placed in a new body if their current one was damaged and those that Vandali was using to soak up damage. The rank 9 Borcus and the rank 8 Eleonora were obvious choices, next were Zadirus and Vigoro, who were rank 6. And then there was Bone Man, Bone Wolf, Bone Monkey, Bone Bear, Bone Bird, Saria, and Rita. They were still only rank 5, but their bodies were made of bones and suits of armor. Even if they were smashed into tiny pieces, they could be revived once Vandali prepared new bones and suits of armor. And as for meat shields, or rather, stone shields, Vandali was bringing ten stone golems with him. This was a precaution that he was taking just in case the available materials in the dragon golems chamber were brittle or they had been magically altered in a way that would make them difficult to turn into golems. They would sacrifice their bodies to slow the golems movements and act as shields. They were made of the spirits of the orcs and goblins from Bgogan's village, so Vandali intended to exploit them fully. Depending on what the dragon golem is made of, I'm afraid that it might be able to attack spirits, so please be very careful, Vandali warned his party. The wall of cursed ice is still in place, so I still don't know what the dragon golem is made of, I'm sure it's not going to be made of simple lion. If it's made of mithril which has strong anti-magic properties, it will be hard for me and Zadirus to make an impact with our spells, said Vandali. Mithril can damage spirits as well. If that's the case, will be completely reliant on the physical attacks of Borcus and the others. It would be a relief if it were made of adamantite, since we wouldn't have to worry about it damaging spirits. But if it's made of adamantite, my sword won't be able to cut it. The situation would be reversed. We'd be reliant on your magical attacks, kid, said Borcus, tapping his fingers against the handle of Bgogan's magic sword that he had received from Vandali. His sword was simply a magic sword with enhanced sharpness and strength, but its attacks were quite powerful. With this sword in hand, Borcus would be able to slice through the scales of an earth dragon with ease. Is it really that hard? asked Vigro, swallowing nervously upon hearing that even Borcus's sword wouldn't be able to cut through it. You bet, said Borcus. It's a magical metal so hard that even the scales and bones of inferior dragons are nothing like it. If you tried comparing iron to it, the iron might as well be slime, but if that is the case, Vandalisama's spells will be effective, said Lenora. There is also the option of pulling that spear out and using it. Also, we have no choice but to aim for the cracks in its body, Zadarus added. Well, if its movements are slow, the boy simply needs to bury it in the floor. There are other options, like using the broken pieces of the dragon golem that are lying around. Since they'll be made of the same material as the golem itself, they should at least serve as shields, said Vandali as he and his companions walked through the underground passage.
There were still broken fragments of ice littered across the ground, despite this being the one place in Taylorshire that not even a single undead entered for two hundred years. It was the most ominous place in the city. However, Vandalie had melted all of the walls of ice that served as barriers to enter. There was now nothing in their way. Then they arrived in front of the dragon golem's chamber. They could see a dragon made of a black metal through the ice. The danger of death is less than it was before, but... It's still there, said Vandalie. What will we do? Shall we postpone this venture? Asked Saria. No, we'll press on, replied Vandalie. It's a golem that defeated someone who almost possessed the power of an S-class adventurer. There's no way that we'll defeat it without facing any danger. In order to defeat the golem that was carefully made by the goddess herself without facing any danger, Vandali would either need to become more powerful than an S-class adventurer or make Borkus and the others all as strong as S-class adventurers. Vandali had gone from being a powerless baby with nothing but a large mana pool to becoming this powerful in a little over four and a half years, but there was no telling how many years, how many decades it would take him to achieve that power. Darsa had told him not to push himself, but Vandali had no intention of waiting that long. I want to celebrate my birthday this year with a mother who has a physical body, Vandali thought as he cast enchantments on his party members. Zadirus and Elinora cast their own spells as well. Everyone had their physical and magical damage resistance increased by Vandali's energy absorption. Their weapons had their attack power increased by Zadirus's blade of wind enchantment and their agility enhanced by her blessing of wind. Just in case, she cast arrow evasion which made it easier to dodge projectile attacks and offensive spells. It was a little regrettable that many of the party members were undead, so she couldn't use light attribute enchantments on them. Eleonora's time attribute spell, acceleration, allowed them to move even faster. Finally. Vandali transferred mana to Zadirus and Elinora until they were full and then their preparations were complete. Other than Borcus's magic sword and Vigro's axe, everyone's equipment had been enhanced by monster materials and items obtained in the treasure chambers of clear dungeons. Many pieces of their equipment were enhanced by earth dragon or rock dragon materials, or made of black steel, a lower value magical metal. Bone Wolf let out a growl. He and the other undead were the ones making the most extravagant use out of those materials, all of the major bones in their bodies had been replaced by those of dragons whose shape had been changed to match their skeletons. Even an ogre would be incapable of breaking their bones now. Well then, let's go, said Vandali. He raised a hand and began sucking the mana out of the wall of ice. It was thicker than the other walls of ice he had removed but the difference wasn't great and the ice began melting steadily. The dragon golem sensed this and made a loud, slow movement sideways. One second, two seconds, three seconds passed. It wasn't retreating or approaching. It simply continued sideways and stopped in front of its own severed head that was on the ground. Could it be? It's going to pick it up and put it back on. This is bad. Everyone, split left and right and retreat. Vandali ordered. Vandali obeyed the warnings his instincts gave him and stopped his spell. Everyone followed his command and split into two groups. The shining black head of the dragon came flying through. The dragon golem had kicked its own head to launch it as a projectile weapon. It's quite the smart golem. Borkus spat as he avoided the dragon's head that had smashed the ice-like brittle glass and destroyed all the stone golems that were supposed to be their meat shields and that's the metal of the gods, all right Jilkum. The fact that it destroyed the cursed ice that only Vandali Sama should have been able to remove is proof of that. Eleonora said in a slightly trembling voice, making it clear what the dragon golem was made of. All right Jilkum, Mithril, Adamantite, Damascus Steel, Black Steel, all of these magical metals are high quality materials, the most precious metals in this world. It is said that only the gods can handle them. One of these precious metals made up the entirety of the dragon golem's 30 meter long body. Using it for weapons and equipment is one thing, but what an amazing goddess, using it for a golem larger than a dinosaur. Said Lenora. You are, if we brought all of that back, we'd be able to buy a country, said Rita. Well then, please bring it back, 
said Vandaly. A. Rita, Saria, Bone Man, everyone, please gather the pieces of that gillum, Vandaly ordered as he dashed into the chamber behind Borcus and Eleonora. Letting out a noise that was difficult to tell whether it was a roar or the sound of creaking metal, the dragon gillum thrashed around with dull but powerful movements. You, -oo -oo -oo, Dragon Slayer! Borcus struck the dragon golem with his prided, most powerful martial skill, but though it made a loud impact against its cracked arm, he didn't manage to cause any new damage. Shit, gah. Borcus swore as he was repelled by the dragon golem's arm and sent flying like a ball in a sports match. The enchantments that had been placed on him broke like fragile glass. There's no way you can get through or right you'll come that's even harder than adamantite. Is there? Eleonora said in exasperation as she flew through the air, trying to find an opening. Her objective was, of course, the spear embedded in the gillum's chest. I'll pull it out and use it as a weapon. Even if I can't do that, if I thrust it deeper into the gillum, it should deal some damage. Vital spots exist for gillums other than those created by Vandaly. Their heads or bodies contain cores that are the source of the mana that powers them. A golem hand made by a goddess should be no exception. Since the golem already has no head, the core should be somewhere in that body. If it's broken, the golem will stop moving. If I'm going to aim for anything, it has to be that. The current situation. Borcus was being stopped by Vandaly's impact negating barrier before he hit the wall. Vigro had decided to give up on attacking after seeing Borcus's sword have no effect, and it seemed that he was now devoting himself to acting as bait. Zadares was attacking with wind and light attribute spells, but they were having no effect against the mass of Orichalcum that had even greater anti-magic properties than Mithril. The ones who were playing the biggest role were probably Bone Wolf and the other undead. You -oo -oo -oon, roared Bone Bear. They had been unable to increase their ranks to surpass being rotten beasts, but Vandaly had flooded them with his mana to cause them to become rank 5 hell beasts and, in Bone Bird's case, a hell bird. All of the bones of their bodies were now the crimson color of fresh blood. Their crimson bodies were picking up broken pieces of the dragon gillum in their jaws, scooping them up in their arms and dragging them along with their claws to gather them up. This was to make sure that the dragon gillum wouldn't use them as projectile weapons like it had done with its own head, and also so that they could be used. Botchin, do you think that you could make a gillum with this? Rita asked incredulously. It's repelling my mana, turning it into a gillum is impossible, replied Vandaly. It seemed that it would be difficult to use directly. Vandaly Sama, stop the gillum's movements, shouted Lenora, as if to say that this would be her time to shine. Vandaly answered her request by using gillum transmutation to turn the floor into a gillum. You -oo 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 -oo. Countless arms extended from the floor and grasped the dragon gillum's legs. However, the dragon golem moved with a creak and they broke like twigs. Its movements were slow, but its power was extraordinary. However, it began focusing on trying to destroy the floor turn golem at its feet. Its decision-making ability seemed to be flawed from having lost its head, or perhaps it found the floor golem extremely irritating. This is it. Eleonora used super acceleration to accelerate the flow of time around herself and flew towards the dragon golem's chest. She forcefully took hold of the spear's handle, and pushed dash. Gah? Eleonora let out a gasp as an icicle made of cursed ice appeared from the magic spear she had grasped and pierced her chest. She had been aware that artifacts often rejected anyone other than their owners when touched. Impossible, even after two hundred years. However, she hadn't expected that this weapon would still respond over two hundred years after its owner had perished. The icicle had pierced Eleonora's heart magnificently. There was no saving her, but Vandaly would likely raise her as an undead after her death and make use of her. In that case, I should push this magic spear even a little deeper into the golem while I'm still alive, for the sake of my master who is the most fearsome being in this world. For this purpose, Eleonora produced mana bullets behind her and released them at both herself and the magic spear. Even if the magic spear itself is made of orichalcum, even if it's covered in cursed ice that won't let anyone near it, I should be able to push it at least a little deeper with this. But the mana bullets she had created with the last of her strength vanished. New Oriwa, 
Dragon Slayer, Iron Tear, Circular Axe Whip, Borkers and Vagro, wielding misshapen lumps of metal that couldn't be called swords or axes, struck the Dragon Golem with them. The Dragon Golem's body creaked and the cracks in its surface began to spread. Even as Eleonora felt surprise at this sight, her consciousness became distant, and then the icicle was broken and tossed away. The next thing she knew, Vandaly was looking down at her. I'm sorry, I could sense the danger, but I couldn't stop you in time, he said. But please don't try to accomplish things at the cost of your own life, car. I, Apollo. Eleonora tried to apologize while coughing blood. It would be best if you don't talk, Vandaly told her. And then his claws grew longer right before her eyes. Because my body is small, this is all that I can give you. Vandaly's blood dripped onto Lenora's face. She reacted instinctively to the smell of its rich mana, opened her mouth and accepted it. Her heart began to regenerate rapidly. It should have been impossible for her heart to recover after being destroyed to this extent. I kept your death away, Vandaly explained. As long as I have my mana, no wound is fatal. I'm sure it hurts. But please do your best to heal. It's already healed, said Eleonora. Thanks to your blood, she added. To think that I made a complete recovery after having my heart pierced through. Eleonora could feel power flowing throughout her entire body just from licking the remainders of Vandaly's blood on her lips. If Vandaly hadn't ordered Eleonora to use her normal tone of speech, she would have been praising him as her lord and expressing her gratitude and loyalty by kissing his feet. However, this was a time where she should express her loyalty through her work. Give me a sword as well, she said. Um, please wait a moment. Vandaly was unable to create a sword for her right away. He was currently casting three spells simultaneously. He had attached handles to broken Norichalcum fragments that Bone Bear and the other undead had gathered and barely managed to alter the shapes of the lumps of metal so that at least the swordsmanship and axe technique skills could be used with them, forming crudely made Norichalcum weapons. They were trying to return to their original shape like a memory alloy, so the two instances of Gillum transmutation that he was using for the two weapons to prevent that were two spells. Transforming the floor into a golem to impair the dragon golem's movements was another spell. Making Eleonora's weapon would be the fourth. Maintaining the shape of the Orichalcum fragments was using up a particularly large amount of his mana. Boy, you are so hot that my hands are almost burning, Zadares warned him. She was helping alleviate his symptoms by casting healing magic on his head. Please bear with it for a little while longer, said Vandaly. No. Won't you worry about yourself a little more? Zadirus sighed. It's all right, surpass limits is still taking effect. Boy, surely you are not under the impression that you can surpass your limits endlessly? Zadirus showed her anger while wearing a smile. I don't need a sword anymore. I'll sit here quietly and watch. Said Lenora, taking back her request. Vandaly decided to obey their wishes and stay put as well. And it seems that things will be fine even if we just watch from now on. With each swing of Borkus and Vigro's crude weapons, the cracks in the dragon golem's body grew larger and deeper. The stone golems that Vandaly had rebuilt were acting as decoys for the dragon golem's counterattacks. And each time more pieces of Orichalcum broke off its body. Bone Monkey and the other undead gathered and discarded them so that the golem couldn't use them as projectile weapons. The dragon golem that had limited options for attacking and dulled movements after being more than half destroyed by Mikhail wasn't even an enemy now that a method of inflicting damage to it had been found. The only thing to be careful of now was the self-protecting mechanism of the magic spear that had pierced Eleonora's heart. Borkus and Vigro simply needed to make sure they didn't accidentally touch it, so it wasn't a substantial threat. With a loud sound, the dragon golem's right leg collapsed, half of its one remaining arm dropped onto the ground, and then its torso followed, crumbling as the dragon golem fell. They had won. Everyone believed it. The only casualties were the stone golems. Borkus, Vigro and the undead let out a shout of victory. Vandaly didn't doubt their victory either. He looked towards the door on the wall far behind where the dragon golem had stood. The resurrection device that he had been unable to search for up until now was likely behind that door. With this, he would be able to resurrect Darsa. But then that confident belief turned into fear. Run. K. 
countless icicles exploded outwards from the dragon golem, drowning out Vandalis shouted warning. Chapter 24 You're an enemy. Icicles extended with explosive force from the cracks in the dragon golem's torso. Vandali and Elinora were far away, but Vigro and the others had been caught up in it with no chance to react. Bone Wolf and Bone Bird let out screams as the icicles pierced them while bones and pieces of armor flew and rolled across the ground all the way over to Vandali. Vandalie's eyes met with those of a skull that had landed nearby. Bone Man. What about your other parts? He asked. Jayu. My lower half is on the other side and my left arm has been swallowed by the ice. The rest is all around this area. Replied Bone Man. His lower jaw and teeth clattering energetically. It seemed that he had split himself into pieces to escape the icicles. Ears expected of an undead, said Zadiris. I've started to lose confidence in my own immortality, said Elinora. The two of them smiled bitterly with relief and looked up to see Ritu and Saria, who were combining their armor pieces to make up a single suit of armor now that they lacked the parts to make two. Vigro was unharmed and Borcus was getting onto his feet. Despite having now properly lost half of his head rather than just his face, it seemed that there was surprisingly little damage done. Those icicles, that cursed ice moved with the dragon golem's fragments that cover it like armor, said Vandali. The surface of the ice has orichalcum fragments in it, so it nullified my energy absorption and Zadiris's arrow evasion. On top of that, the cursed ice was a special substance that only Orichalcum and Vandalie's death attribute magic could break down. Bone Man and some of the other undead had managed to avoid the icicles by splitting themselves into pieces, but Bone Monkey and Bone Bear had instinctively tried to stop the ice to no avail. Bone Bird, who was missing a leg, gave a sorrowful cry. Vandalie saw the crimson color of Bone Monkey's femur fade away, returning to its original white color, my lord. Bone Man began, I know. Vandali used spirit form transformation on his right hand, connected it to the spirits of Bone Monkey, Bone Bear and Bone Wolf and poured his mana into them to preserve their damaged spirits. Their spirits had been gravely wounded by the Orichalcum, and though it was possible to heal them, it would be difficult to have them return to fighting shape right away. Is everyone alright? shouted Vigro. TCH. My good looks have been ruined. Borcus lamented. They were both still holding their weapons, which were crude and barely weapon shaped at all. But they were still weapons made of Orichalcum. They had managed to block the Orichalcum covered icicles with these to protect themselves. Here you are, Rita Jouchin, said Borcus. Thank you, replied Rita. While Vigro was unharmed, the skull like right half of Borcus's face had been broken. Because he had immediately grabbed the bra portion of Rita's bikini armor. I was thinking about how embarrassing it would be to fight in front of everyone with my chest exposed, she continued. Chest, you say? There's nothing there, said Borcus, seemingly disappointed at the fact that Rita was still just a spirit other than her armor, but it seemed that she had no intention of being upset by his remark. Once my spirit form skill levels up like father's, you will be able to see it, she told him. Botchin, what will we do now? Let's see. Is there anyone who can explain this situation? Vandalie asked. I can speculate, said Elinora, pointing a finger towards the combined mass of the ice and the remains of the golem. It had begun writhing and creaking after icicles had exploded outwards. She was pointing at the magic spear that was still embedded in the dragon golem's chest. That magic spear, Ice Age, has probably gone wild. The dragon golem has been stopping its functions up until now, but I'm sure it took mana from the dragon golem's court to release that explosion of ice. I couldn't have imagined that it would be capable of doing something like this, nor that its self-protection mechanism would still be functioning. In other words, it seemed that it was all Mikhail's fault. Then do you know what's going to happen to it now? Asked Vandalie. I don't know what has caused the magic spear to go wild or how exactly it is receiving power from the golem's core, but if it's just on a rampage with no purpose it will keep thrashing around indiscriminately until it runs out of mana. Indiscriminately, Vandalie repeated. I see. Into the walls or the floor, or perhaps towards the resurrection device beyond the door. 
the headless dragon Gillum whose legs had sprouted or I Chilcom tipped icicles like the legs of an octopus or a squid or rather, the magic spear, Ice Age, was doing something far more terrible than Eleonora's prediction. It was moving directly behind it, towards the resurrection device. We must stop that rotten spear, said Vandaly. There was now no other choice. There would be no point in reorganizing another party to come back. The resurrection device would already be destroyed by then. Yeah, leave it to me, shouted Borkus. He and Vigro began running, crude or Ichilcom weapons in hand. Since the ice was cursed ice, only they and Vandaly could deal a decisive blow to Ice Age. Their attacks landed in an interesting way. The legs made of ice made no attempt to avoid the attacks. They were broken and pieces of ice scattered across the floor. However, no matter how much they broke, the amount of ice wasn't decreasing. New you you you. There's no end to this, said Vagro. It's the mana. As long as that Golem's core still contains mana, that spear will keep making more ice, said Borkus. As Ice Age's ice was not a part of its body like a Golem, no matter how much of it broke, there was no damage to Ice Age itself. Since it was using the ice as limbs, breaking it would slow down its movement, but that would be nothing more than stalling for time. Vandaly was trying to stop it as well by turning the floor into a Golem, but the ice crushed it easily and continued onwards, slowly but surely. Then I'll smash the spear itself. Instant response. Borkus moved with a speed that was difficult to imagine possible for his enormous body, running up the ice and closing the distance to Ice Age itself. However, before he could get close enough for his weapon to reach it, countless icicles appeared and were launched towards him. Shit! The ice near the spear is damn fast. Faced with this machine gun fire of icicles, even Borkus had no choice but to stop and fall back, but as the icicles were being fired straight after being created, there were no Orichalcum fragments included in the attack. Even if they hit Borkus, they wouldn't really cause any serious damage as he was a zombie. However, it seemed that the icicles stayed under Ice Age's control after being fired. He could see that they writhed unpleasantly after being repelled by his sword. If they hit him and pinned him down, he would be immobilized until Vandaly melted them for him. Damn it, I couldn't defeat the weapon's owner and now I can't even win against the weapon itself? Borkus bellowed. He wasn't giving up. He began looking for another opportunity. Vandaly, we need more help. Vigro was still breaking the legs made of ice away from the spear to buy more time. Both of them were probably aiming to make it run out of mana. However, the ice being generated by Ice Age showed no signs of weakening. I can't bear to watch this any longer, said Lenora, picking up a Norichilcom fragment and flying into battle. Rita, we're going to said Saria. The two of them picked up one of the Orichalcum fragments that were shaped more appropriately and followed Eleonora's lead. And then they began attacking Ice Age's legs with that Orichalcum fragment. Its shape wasn't very good for using as as a weapon, but fortunately the two of them possessed considerable physical strength. Smashing the Orichalcum into the ice with all of their strength was enough to break it. Eleonora used her large Orichalcum fragment as a shield as she moved to join Borkus. She blocked the icicle projectiles as she looked for the smallest chance. Even the one-legged bone bird was screeching as it fired its spirit form feathers. It knew that it couldn't break the ice, but it wanted to buy as much time as possible. Everyone was fighting with everything they had so that Vandaly could acquire the resurrection device. But it seemed that Vandaly could do nothing more. He was already managing six spells simultaneously. He had stopped turning the floor near Ice Age's legs into Gillum's as it was completely ineffective, but he was maintaining the shape of two Orichalcum weapons, and the spirit form transformation on his right hand to protect each of the fallen undead spirits made four more, six in total. Even with a multicast spell, he was past his limits. His surpass limits skill was already active, as was his rapid healing skill. Zadirus was murmuring the incantations for light attribute healing spells. But even so, it felt like his brain was boiling. No matter how big a leg is, there is only so much water that a bucket can draw from it at a time. In same way, no matter how large Vandaly's mana pool was, there was a limit to how many spells he could cast at a time. What should I do? What was happening now wasn't a fight to the death. 
If Vanderly left it like this, nobody would die. Only the resurrection device will be destroyed. That spear was clearly moving with some kind of intent. It would have been unnatural for it to head in a straight path towards the place where the resurrection device was likely to be if it was simply on a rampage. It was the spear once wielded by Mikhail, the divine spear of ice, the spear forged for heroes by the god of ice who served Peria, the goddess of water and knowledge. It was unmistakably a legendary class, or maybe even mythical class artifact. In that case, it wasn't strange to think that it had a mind of its own, and that mind considered Mikhail. The justice of the champion Bellwood and the justice of the god of law and fate, Alda, as true justice, the champion who didn't accept things from other worlds, denying and destroying existing prosperity for the sake of this world's own culture and civilization despite not knowing how long those would take to develop. The god who doesn't acknowledge the lives of those who don't obey his laws, who still passes on discriminatory teachings against the races created by Veda even after a hundred thousand years have passed. The hero who dealt the fatal blow to the nation of titans in their name. The crazed magic spear of that hero was trying to destroy the resurrection device that Vandalie desired. There was some truth to their beliefs. It couldn't be said that they were completely wrong. So then, was Vandalie the one who was wrong? Was his desire to resurrect his dead mother an absolute evil? That wasn't right, was it? Treating the wounded, curing the sick. Extending the lives of creatures who will eventually die one day is always a good thing, so why should only the resurrection of someone who is dead be considered evil? I won't acknowledge their beliefs, so I have no choice but to win. How can I do that? I have mana, I have mana, but I can't win like this. I don't have enough brains, I have too few brain cells. What should I do? Boy, you are at your limit. Zadirus's voice was full of a sorrow. Vandalie was at his limit. He couldn't do any more. Could he only watch as the battle was lost, as the hope he had gained was taken away from him? There was one way. If he gave up on the spirits of Bone Monkey and the other wounded undead, there would be less burden on his brain. But he couldn't do that. The resurrection device was his hope to gain something. What use would it be if he lost something to get his hands on it? At first, Bone Monkey and the others had been nothing but tools to him but now they were his important servants that he had raised up to this point. He could replace their bones no matter how many times they were broken, but he couldn't replace their spirits. That's right. Their spirits are, are, right. I do have another brain, don't I? Realizing this, Vandali began to split into two. Boy Dash, at least. This is how it appeared to Zadiris. However, she quickly realized that this wasn't the case. Spirit form? Vandalie was now separate from his physical body. He was having an out-of-body experience. Normally, a body with no soul would collapse and stop moving, like a dead tree. However, Vandalie was still using his body throughout magic. The spirit form Vandalie was controlling the physical Vandalie through the long-distance control skill that he had acquired. With this, I have two brains, said Vandalie. Zadiris. Please take care of my physical body. Why yes. Leave it to me. Zadirus was startled by the fact that Vandalie was speaking through both his spirit form and his physical body, but she quickly focused on her healing spells. With this, he could split the six spells he had barely been managing to maintain, with each brain managing three, but it was still not enough. In order to stop that miserable, God made stick. He needed more, but what more could he do? My brain is. I'm in spirit form right now. Then do I even need to worry about my shape? Vandali looked at his physical body to see his right arm under spirit form transformation, split into three to preserve the spirits of the wounded undead by providing them with mana. When he used spirit form transformation on his physical body, he was able to freely change its shape like he was doing with his right arm. With that being the case, he would certainly be able to change his shape now that he was completely in spirit form. Vandalie's vision expanded, manipulating his spirit form with his spirit form skill, his head split into two at the neck. Now he had three brains. It still wasn't enough. He quickly added more. Now he had five brains. Using his new brains, he made gillums. He made more, more and more. He embedded orichalcum fragments in the gillums he made. In short, 
He was now doing the same thing as that stick. He mixed our Ichilkum instead of ice into his gillums that he made from the floor and walls so that it could be used as a weapon. Stone men with black metal protruding from their bodies roared as they rammed themselves into the octopus of ice, one after another. Botchin? exclaimed Rita. Why is your appearance like that? There are two of you and you have so many heads. I didn't see nothing. Shouted Vigro. Ah, how terrifyingly beautiful! remarked Eleonora, as Gullum reinforcements appeared one after another as if Vandali was trying to use up all of the walls and open a giant hole in the floor. Everyone had turned around in surprise to see two Vandalius, and one of them had a rather grotesque appearance. They were surprised. But for some reason, Eleonora's A's showed signs of awe and excitement. Everyone, pay no attention to my lord's appearance. You must fight. Bone Man shouted from the ground near Vandalie's feet. Move your hands, not your mouths. Borkers said, reprimanding them. Bone Man and Borkers's voices returned them to their senses. And they returned to work once more to destroy the ice. Indeed, this was simply work now. The magic spear was indeed a legendary class artifact. However, it would normally never have the power to fight battles on its own. It was merely using some method to utilize the huge amount of mana contained in the dragon golem's core in order to produce and manipulate ice in order to make its struggling movements. That was why the movements of the cursed ice were slow and stiff. If it were made of normal ice, Borkus and the others would have broken all of it long ago even without Orichalcum weapons. That cursed ice was being swarmed with countless gillums, with Orichalcum fragments attached, broken by Vigro and the Armor Sisters and even directly melted by Vandalie's death attribute magic. It couldn't even maintain the shape of its ice even though it had stopped firing projectiles, let alone repel Borkus and the others. This damn spear is so annoying. Borkus struck the spear as it struggled in vain, sending it flying out of the thick chest of the gillum that it had been embedded in and spinning onto the floor. The ice stopped moving at that instant. Is it over? Vandalie wondered as he returned to his physical body. He felt dizzy for a moment as his extra fields of vision disappeared, but Zadarus stopped him from falling to his knees. Whoa, thank you, but why are you holding onto my head so tightly? He asked her. I was just thinking that it would be terrible if this head were to split into multiple as well. Zadirus had both arms wrapped around Vandalie's head. It seemed that she had been very shocked by the division of his spirit form head. Vandalie had frequently branched his arms out into tentacle-like shapes with spirit form transformation, however, did dividing his head make more of an impact than his arms? More importantly, the first thing I need to do is prepare bodies for Bone Bear and the others. Vandali really wanted to rush to the resurrection device, but that could come last. Reviving the undead came first. He could heal their wounded spirits after putting them in bodies. It wouldn't take much time or effort, but as Vandali attempted to return them to normal, their spirits growled in protest. They had become burdens to Vandali. They were weak. They didn't want to be returned to normal because they wanted to become stronger. Bone Bird let out a cry. It seemed to be in agreement, intending to join them. I think it's possible, but are you sure? Vandalie asked. If I do this, I don't know if I can undo it. Bone Bird nodded, as did Bone Wolf and his companions. Their spirits had already lost the appearance of when they were alive. They were now skeleton-shaped. They had originally been the wandering spirits of animals and insects, they had no memories of how they had appeared when they were alive, and they already had almost no memories of before they were turned into undead, their loyalty to Vandalie was the most important thing to them, it was because of him that they were now immortal creatures with no limited lifespan, no need to eat or reproduce, without the chains of animal instinct binding them. I understand. Bone Bird's spirit came out of its body. The spirits of the others lost their shapes, and all the spirits mixed together. The bones of Bone Bear and the others that had been scattered around rolled across the floor to gather in one spot. And then the spirits that had combined with each other and lost their shapes entered that spot. A monster made of bones let out a roar as it was born. It was built like the pieces of different puzzle sets had been forcibly joined. The bones of a bear, a monkey, a wolf and a bird were combined together. It was a chimera with a body consisting of bones, 
a Japanese person might think it was and made only of bones TLN, and was a Japanese chimera with a monkey's head, tanuki's body, tiger's limbs and a snake tail. This is a bone chimera, a creature born of a single malicious entity trapped in the bones of multiple animals, humans and monsters. This is the first time I am seeing one, said Zadiris. Bone bird, bone monkey, bone wolf, bone bear, bone man. This is a splendid display of loyalty. Um, I am still here, said bone man. Ah, that is right. Bone man's skull was still lying on the ground. The magic spear's rampage was over so his bones were steadily gathering together, however, Bone Man, please let me know if there are any bones you are missing, said Vandaly, as you will, Vandaly headed towards the magic spear lying on the floor, bringing Bone Chimera with him, Vandaly Sama, it's dangerous to approach that spear, Eleonora said, trying to stop him, but he waved her down with his hand, as to be expected of an artifact, there wasn't a single scratch on the magic spear. Vandaly enveloped it in dark, death attribute mana and then touched it. Do not touch me! shouted a voice echoing inside his head. It seemed that this magic spear had a clearer personality than Vandaly had expected. A weapon with conscious intelligence. Should this be called an intelligent weapon? Filthy damp. I do not know what your intentions may be but they will certainly be crushed by Mikhail's successor, my future owner. Enjoy your brief victory while it lasts. Ah, uh, I'm not interested in that stuff, so can I ask you to tell me some things regarding the current situation? You were a spear originally created to serve Peria, not Elder, weren't you? Asked Vandaly, judging from the angry, distressed tone of Ice Age, he could guess that Upeon, the god of ice had similar views to Aldo and the champion Bellwood unlike Tristan, the god of the seas who had mated with Vida to become one of the ancestors of the merfolk. I Sage, an artifact created by Upeon, shared his views, and the hero it had acknowledged as its owner over 200 years ago was Mikhail, the divine spear of ice. He had been a devout believer of Aldo, a hero who believed in the justice of the Amid Empire and Mig Shield Nation from the bottom of his heart. However, he had been narrowly defeated by the goddess May Dragon Gillum and Ice Age was left embedded in the Gillum's chest, separated from its owner. In this world, those who lost their lives can never come back. In Mikhail's absence, Ice Age had decided to use his cursed ice to seal away the resurrection device that overturned this law of his own accord so that nobody would ever touch it. Normally, he wouldn't have been capable of doing this without his owner despite being an artifact. But by coincidence, he had been able to use the Dragon Golem's core that was lightly touching its tip and receive the necessary supply of mana from there. He had built multiple walls that only Mikhail could pass through. The wall that contained Zandia's hand was not Mikhail's doing, but Ice Age's. But it was not Mikhail or the one who bears his will, but you who came to this place, an insolent creature such as you who toys with life, accompanied by two filthy undying creatures. How regrettable it is that I was only one step away from completely crushing your ambitions! Screamed Ice Age. That's, what? Vandaly was about to say, that's a shame, but then he had noticed something strange about Ice Age's words. Two, he said, two. Even if you exclude Rita and Saria, there's Borcus, Bone Man, Bone Bear. Six in total. I'm sure this guy wouldn't use a different counter between undead people and animals. So why too? The first time I came here, it was me, Borkus and Nuaza, the three of us. Is that what he means? TLN, I Sage used the counter for animals rather than people, i.e. two undead animals. Using this counter while referring to undead like Borkus would be a way to show disrespect towards them. Vandaly didn't know how good this magic spear's five senses were but it seemed that it had been working even while embedded in the dragon golem's chest. It was obvious once he thought about it, in this state, Ice Age had created walls of ice at the entrance to this chamber, the distant corridor and the entrance leading to this underground area, after all. 
It wasn't strange to think that he had noticed Vanderlee and his companions when they had visited this place around two years ago. So what has this guy been doing up until now? When Adamp who was able to melt his cursed ice appeared in the company of two undead instead of Mikhail's successor, what did he do in this period of over a year? Vanderlee, what's wrong with you all of a sudden? Are you talking with that spear? Hello, Botchin. What's the matter? Taking no notice of Vigro and Sarius' voices, Vandali began to run towards the door that the dragon golem had been protecting. The door, which was made of the same material as the wall and difficult to spot, opened on its own as Vandali approached. It had probably been set to open once its guardian, the golem, was defeated. On the other side of the door was a large pipe made of some unidentified glass-like substance, a magic circle a monolith with indecipherable characters engraved on it and something that resembled a flat screen television from earth. All of them had been pierced by icicles, damaged and broken. Foo, foo ha 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 ha. It seems that it has worked well. I could obtain mana from the golem's core, but I had become unable to move an exchange for that. I was unsure whether I had managed to destroy the device with the ice that I created in that distant space, but it is a relief to see that I succeeded. Your evil plans have fallen apart, Damp. Ice ages harsh, loud laughter sounded repulsive to Vandalie's ears. Behind him, Bone Chimera let out a sorrowful cry while Vigro and the others stood there, frozen in place. And then Vandalie turned his wide open eyes towards Ice Age. If it's broken. I just have to fix it, and if that's impossible, I just have to find another way. I'll never give up on resurrecting mum, but before that, I have to dispose of this thing. You would destroy me, Damp. It is indeed likely possible for an insolent creature such as you who is even capable of manipulating Orichalcum, something that only the gods should be allowed to do. However, doing so would be meaningless. I am an artifact created by your peon the god of ice. I am essentially a clone of him. Even if this spear is destroyed, my consciousness will return to you peon and one day I shall stand before you once more in the hands of another hero like Mikhail. And then I shall sever the thread of your evil life, along with your filthy undying creatures. Vandalie felt nauseous as he listened to the repulsively confident voice that had absolute belief in its own righteousness. I'll ask you just to make sure. Are you serious? Despite his nausea, Vandalie asked the spear this question, just to be absolutely certain about his upcoming decision. Of course, if you should regret anything, regret your own cursed birth, then I will destroy you. Vandalie stabbed his spirit form fingers into the magic spear. He felt the orichal come resist, tearing off his skin. He felt pain, as if his exposed flesh and bone were being scraped away by a file. I Sage's voice turned into a screaming noise. It sounded so pleasant to Vandalie's ears that he forgot his own pain. It seems that you're a clone of a great god, but you're one of our genuine enemies, he said. Since you've said that you will curse us and deny us with all of your might, with not a single shred of mercy, with no exception, then I have no choice but to do this. It was possible that Ice Age didn't know why Vandalie had wanted to obtain the resurrection device. But it didn't matter. In that case, that would simply mean that Ice Age had said, evil intentions, while not knowing anything. If that was the case, dampers were an absolute evil to him, worse than insects that caused only great harm while having no benefits to existing whose intentions were not even worth listening to. That was to be expected. This spear believed Mikhail's actions had been those of justice, the actions of the hero who had believed his home nation was good for obeying the orders of the Empire to invade the Titan nation that was doing nothing more than prospering in the area surrounded by the mountain range. The hero who had put an end to that nation, and he even called those who had turned into undead after being killed by that hero filthy, as long as this magic spear existed. He would continue cursing Vandali and his companions for being evil and watch vigilantly for an opportunity to tear out their entrails with his tip. That was the kind of existence he was. If I left someone like you alone, I wouldn't be able to calmly look for a way to resurrect my mother, and I would definitely be unable to become happy in the future, said Vandali. R. There it is. I thought it would be here since you said you're a clone of a god. I'm glad I found it. Even I can't destroy something that doesn't exist. I Sage continued screaming unintelligibly. You, 
bastard. You would turn a god into your enemy. No, we're enemies of your god no matter what we do, aren't we? So it doesn't matter what I do, does it? What was I Sage trying to say after he had already destroyed any opportunity for negotiations, reconciliation, harmony or a truce, all on his own? Had he said and done all of these things with so little resolve that he expected to remain unharmed afterwards? If so, Vanderly couldn't help but admire his nerve. He would find it impossible to be so bold. I think it's impossible for you to do this, but if you can, please tell him something for me, said Vanderly. Tell him that he's my enemy. Chech, Gar, Emka, I Sage's wonderful song stopped and the clear sound of a cloned god's soul being destroyed rang out. The levels of the Gillum transmutation, spirit form, multicast, soul break and long distance control skills have increased. You have acquired the unique skill, God Slayer. End of Volume 2. Next will be a side chapter and then a character summary page. In the space between worlds, Rod Corti, the god who ruled over the circles of transmigration for multiple worlds including Earth, Origin, and Lambda, had created a place that could be called a divine realm and was currently sitting in there. TLN, in Japanese. Singular and plural nouns are often impossible to distinguish unless specified. It becomes clear in this chapter that this is plural. Each world has its own circle of transmigration. This was also the place that the souls of the 100 people who had died on Earth had once gathered. Rod Corti was currently observing Origin's present state as a god. He was capable of seeing many things happening there from outside the world. He was far from omniscient, but he could gain a general picture of things. The lapsing of origin into chaos is inevitable. I suppose the cause lies in the existence of Amamiya Hiroto and his death, he said, speaking to himself. The world where magic and science coexisted, where Vandali had lived during his second lifetime, where Amamiya Hiroto and the others who were reincarnated there were still living. Rod Gorty considered this world to be as far developed as Earth but it was falling deep into chaos. The cause of this was Vandali, Amamiya Hiroto's death attribute. The military nation that had used him as an experimental animal extorted death attribute mana out of him and produced a large number of magic items that exceeded common sense. Cook were capable of fermenting food to make it reach the optimum level of maturity in an instant. Storage cabinets that kept food preserved almost permanently. Medical equipment that removed any poison and illness from the body without causing any harmful effects. Pills that restored the organs with impaired function due to aging, illness or injury. Hairy growth medicine that restored lost hair. Things that had been impossible through other attributes of magic and previous science. Things that had been theoretical theoretically possible but almost impossible to actually create in practice. Such things had been created at unbelievably low costs. That death attribute mana had created dreamlike produce and domestic livestock, led to the announcement of cures for previously incurable viruses, pathogens and hereditary diseases and even made cryogenic sleep possible. Research had almost reached the secret behind immortality. If one were to ask whether such things were possible with death attribute mana alone, the answer is that it really was. At a glance, the death attribute may seem like a simple counterpart to the life attribute. Indeed, the things both attributes were capable of were similar, and if the life attribute transcends its highest limits, it can achieve exceedingly close results. However, they are not completely the same. The reason is because life is energy. No matter how much energy one adds, no matter how much one tries to limit its consumption, it will run out eventually. In other words, death occurs. The death attribute is the one that governs over death. It is able to remove the phenomenon of death from living things. It is free to accelerate or stop decomposition. In the same way, it is simple to produce things that can eliminate poison and illnesses. It is not even difficult to return failing organs and cells to a healthy state. However, the military nation that discovered the death attribute had caused Amamiya Hiroto to die in their reckless experiments, and the others who had reincarnated in this world had thoroughly destroyed him. Not even a single fragment of his mana had been left behind. Nobody could create death attribute magic items anymore. The research could not continue. The produce and livestock that had been created still remained, but those alone weren't enough to satisfy mankind. 
the military nation was internationally condemned for the existence of the research laboratory that had conducted illegal experiments that completely ignored human rights. Its president and the high officials that had been involved with the laboratory resigned. But that was only the beginning. The dreamlike magic items that the military nation had been producing and selling were now completely impossible to create. The largest nation in the international committee that had condemned the military nation for its actions immediately began research on the death attribute. Amamiya Hiroto had killed most of the researchers in the original laboratory and consumed much of their spirits. Their souls were just barely intact, but their memories and personalities were not in a state for them to be useful, so even methods such as necromancy were useless. The few survivors, the remaining research materials and the death attribute magic items possessed by each nation were all gathered for analysis in a desperate attempt to reproduce the death attribute. The people in power had been lured by the industrial and medical advances offered by the death attribute, or rather, the word immortality which had almost been achieved. The military nation had become much weaker, but as long as the powerful men of the world continued to desire immortality, the secret feuds between the federal states, commonwealths, republics and new nations would surface in a large way. War could break out and cause the loss of millions, tens of millions of lives. I don't really care about that, but Rod Corty had no interest in calculating those numbers. In fact, people being killed in war would be a wonderful thing. He would welcome them with open arms. He was the god who ruled over the circles of transmigration. After all, it would be problematic if people didn't die and come to be reborn. Even if tens of millions of people were to die all at once, Rod Corty's transmigration system wouldn't have any difficulties in dealing with them. It could process up to a trillion people at a time. There would be no problem at all. Origin had a population of 10 billion people. Only a small number, not even 1% of them, would die in war and their numbers would soon increase again afterwards. Things would be back to normal in less than a hundred years. In fact, people's life expectancies in Origin had surpassed those on Earth by too much due to the existence of magic in Origin in addition to science, so this was just perfect. Rod Corty did indeed desire the world's development, but a society capable of sustaining a population of billions of people without falling to ruin could already be considered nothing but a good result. Even if a population of 7 billion were to shrink to 5 billion, he would consider it as only a minor decrease. Rather, if humanity underwent some kind of spiritual evolution or reached some next stage, then they would really be beyond his control. He wouldn't mind if they advanced into outer space, however. With that said, Rod Gorty had no intentions of directly intervening with the world and his ability to do so was limited so he couldn't do anything about the situation anyway. If he wanted to stop the conflict and war in origin, it was possible for him to send a divine message to those who had been reincarnated from Earth in order to guide them and give them information. However, he had no intention of doing that, either. The reason he had sent them to Origin rather than Lambda in the first place was so that they could gain experience. He had helped them by giving them cheat-like abilities, fortunes and destinies, so he would have them do as they liked, whether they chose to stop the conflict, participate in it or simply stay uninvolved. If war began, some of them, maybe even dozens of them, could die. That would be an experience for them in itself. There were a hundred of them after all. There would be no problem if some of them failed. For Rod Corty, a god who was not directly believed in by humans, humans were nothing but bits in a computer, just information flowing in a system. Good and evil, tragedy, happiness. None of that mattered. Everything would be fine as long as the system continued working with no problems. The problem is immortality. I suppose. The thing that would cause Rod Corty trouble was immortality. As he was a god ruling over the circles of transmigration, creatures that don't die would be nothing but beings who denied his authority and hinder his system. It would be even more problematic than undead who continued moving after death and the resurrection of the dead. Undead are a result of souls lingering in the world without being reincarnated, but they would still return to the system eventually. The resurrection of the dead was problematic. But if the soul was already transmigrated, 
Only the body would be resurrected and the soul would never return. Only a small error would be caused. However, immortal beings would never return. If undead were small errors that wouldn't cause any problems even if left alone for a while and the resurrection of the dead was a bug that was slightly more difficult to fix, immortal beings would be a critical bug that would require the system to be brought down for maintenance in order to eliminate. Even considering that, it's good that Amamiya Hiroto died. If Amamiya Hiroto had continued to live, the research had gone on and immortality had become a reality. Rod Corti would have been racking his brains over how to deal with it. Even if he were to send those reincarnated from Earth a divine message, he possessed no way of forcing them to obey his commands. He couldn't even send divine messages to humans other than them. This was also because Rod Corti's existence wasn't known and he wasn't worshipped by the people of any world. This was to ensure that if something serious were to happen in one world, it wouldn't affect the circles of transmigration of other worlds. But, he was now regretting not preparing another being like a subordinate god or collaborative god. Gods are not omniscient or omnipotent, their direct influence extends only as far as their authority allows and to those who believe in them. No, for now, Origin would be fine. Rod Corti would let it be. Mankind would not self-destruct or decrease in numbers too drastically. Coming to this conclusion, Rod Corti shifted his gaze away from Origin. And then he suddenly realized something. It has been five years since Amamiya Hiroto reincarnated in Lambda. His memories may have returned by now. Memories of previous lives returning while still in the body of a breastfeeding infant would have placed a huge mental burden on reincarnated individuals. In order to protect their minds, Rod Gorty had set things up so that their memories would start returning from the age of five onwards. As long as nothing hugely troublesome and unexpected occurred, memories would not return to a breastfeeding infant. The fact that Amamiya Hiroto's soul has not returned here means that he was unfortunate enough to not die within the first five years of his life. It may be some time before his memories return, but I should check to make sure. If Amamiya Hiroto's memories had indeed returned, Rod Gorty had to drive him to suicide so that he would die before it was discovered that he could potentially make immortality a reality. He had three curses placed on him but even Rod Corti had been unable to erase the death attribute that had soaked into his soul and become a part of him. If he struggled and refused to give up, he would learn to cast death attribute magic in Lambda as well. For this purpose, Rod Corti used his system to investigate Amamiya Hiroto's life following his reincarnation. Through this system, it was possible to look at a reincarnated soul's past and present situation. However, there was no information about Amamiya Hiroto. What is this? He searched again, but there was no information. There were records of his reincarnation from Earth to Origin, but the records stopped suddenly following his death in Origin. Could it be that he wasn't reincarnated? That isn't possible. Amamiya Hiroto was definitely reincarnated, but the fact that there are no records in the system means, oh no, he fell out of my system and entered a circle outside of my control. For Rod Corti, there were three irregularities in Lambda. The first was the undead that even appeared from time to time in Origin. The other two were the monsters that the Demon King and his subordinates had created in ancient times and the new races created by the goddess Veda. Those two weren't managed by Rod Corti's circle of transmigration system. When the Demon King created the monsters, if their transmigration fell under the categories of Rod Corti's system, the Demon King would have been unable to reincarnate monsters' souls and have them be reborn. For this reason, he had somehow managed to imitate Rod Corti's circle of transmigration system and created his own transmigration system. That was why monsters were still rampant in Lambda to this day. This was also the reason bosses and mid-bosses were unnaturally generated inside dungeons. Humans and other races who worshipped the evil gods were now falling outside of Rod Corti's system and being incorporated into the now fallen Demon King's system instead. This was another thing causing slightly problematic errors in Rod Corti's system, and the problems caused by the races created by Veda were due to the hostility between Veda, or rather, all of the gods of Lambda and Rod Corti.
When the Demon King first appeared, the gods of Landa known as Veda and Alda had asked Rod Corti for help. Rod Corti had refused all of their requests and simply observed carefully. If he were to get involved and the Demon King destroyed his soul, this would have effects on all of the circles of transmigration of the other worlds that he managed, not just Lambda. This was a decision he made to prevent that from happening. To Rod Corti, Lambda was but one of many worlds. If it were destroyed, Rod Corti would feel pain equivalent to several bones being broken, but it wouldn't be a fatal wound. He wasn't willing to risk a swift death in order to avoid his bones being broken. After that, Rod Corti had protested against the decision of the gods of Lambda to summon champions from other worlds in order to turn the tides of the battle. Because the champions had only been summoned from worlds whose circles of transmigration Rod Corti ruled over. This had caused errors in his system. He requested that they quickly send the champions back or simply exploit them until they died. Back then, Rod Corti had thought that Lambda's destruction was inevitable. So he hadn't wanted more trouble to be caused by a meaningless struggle. As a result, a deep gulf formed between Rod Corti and the gods of Lambda. Rod Corti himself didn't think much of it, but Vida in particular held a profound distrust in him. With this as one of the reasons, Vida made an imitation of the system created by the Demon King with her own original functions included, creating her own circle of transmigration system, and then gave birth to new races including the vampires. As she ruled over the life attribute, her divinity was quite close to Rod Corti's. It would have been impossible for her to rule over the circles of transmigration of multiple worlds, but she probably thought that she would be able to manage one worlds once she built a system for it. It was likely that she intended for not only the races she created, but all of the future races of people that would exist in Lambda to be managed by her own circle of transmigration system. However, despite being hostile towards Rod Corti as Vida was, Alda, who prioritized the strict preservation of law and order above all else, defeated Vida and her followers. As a result, only the new races created by Vida were being reincarnated through Vida's system. There was a high chance that Amamiya Hirota's soul had been swallowed up by either the Demon King's system or the Goddess's system and he had become reborn as either a monster or a member of one of the races created by Vida. Mew. He isn't here after all. Using his system, Rod Gorty looked up all of the people who had been born around the time of Amamiya Hirota's second reincarnation but no information on Hirota was to be found. But just why has something like this happened? The probability of this happening is less than 1 in 10 quadrillion. Unless I am just terribly unlucky. Oh no. It's because of that. Rod Corti remembered that the things Amamiya Hirota hadn't been given included not only cheat-like abilities, but a fortune and a destiny as well. As he had no fortune and no destiny, there was always a constant danger that he would go along a path that even Rod Corti himself wouldn't be able to predict. On top of that, three curses had been placed on him just before he was reincarnated. Rod Corti had done this in order to encourage him to end his own life. But the possibility that this had caused flaws in Rod Corti's system couldn't be ruled out. I have no choice, it will take some time, but I will investigate if there are any people who have encountered Amamiya Hiroto's reincarnated soul. I should at least be able to learn of his current situation. This is a damp. There was a damp appearing in the memories of a certain merchant. It seemed that Amamiya Hiroto had indeed reincarnated as a member of a race created by Vida. But this wasn't the problem. Impossible. Why have his memories returned? On top of that, he is already using death attribute magic and controlling the undead. Rod Gorty couldn't even tell whether the damper in this memory was even a year old or not, and yet he was already using death attribute magic and speaking with a childish voice. His memories had clearly returned. I suppose this is because I did not give him a fortune. In that case. I have to improve my method the next time I have a chance. Rod Corti regretted the mistakes that he had made during the process of reincarnating Amamiya Hiroto and the others from Earth. Back then, Rod Corti had prepared enough cheat-like abilities, fortunes and destinies for a little over a hundred people. He had prepared plenty, so that he wouldn't be lacking any even if there were many people to distribute them to. And just as he finished preparing the ferry had sunk with good timing and around a hundred people, 
not including the evil people responsible, had died, among them, all but one chose to be reborn in another world, thinking that it would be a waste to not use everything he had prepared, he had distributed it all without leaving a single item remaining, only to find that he had overlooked one person, to think that this one remaining person would become so troublesome as a result, now then, the question is what to do with the Mamiya Hiroto Vandali. Should I warn Alda? I suppose it would be better to set the evil gods on him. Alda was the only attribute god who was still currently properly active in Lambda, the god who possessed the most power. However, his relationship with Rod Corti was as terrible as it could be. Alda had no choice but to overlook Rod Corti's actions so that the order of the circles of transmigration would be preserved, but that did not mean that he forgave them. Rod Corti's decision to reincarnate these people had been made without Alda's knowledge. Because of this, if Alda were to find out about Vandali and the others, he would be infuriated with Rod Corti. From Alda's point of view, Rod Corti had abandoned him in a time of need without offering any assistance, and now he was doing these things on his own. And a hundred more people would be reincarnating in Lambda with Jinxes cheat-like abilities that defied common sense that Rod Gorty had given them on a whim. It was more than likely that Alda would order his subordinate gods and followers to murder those 100 reincarnated individuals. With that said, leaking information to the evil gods to have them kill Vandali would also be a poor move. The evil gods had sense of values so twisted that Rod Gorty couldn't understand them. It was possible that they would make Vandali their ally instead of killing him. As a result of much contemplation, Rod Corti decided to watch and wait for a while. A few of those reincarnated in origin should die in the next few years. I'll ask them to kill Vandali. Undead had always appeared in Lambda, so the number of undead increasing by a few wouldn't have any effect on the system now. And for Vandali whose curses would prevent him from turning his experiences into skills, reaching immortality without the assistance of the science of origin would be an enormous task, it would be impossible to do so in decades, centuries or possibly even millennia, in a few years time, once the second of the reincarnated individuals died in origin, he would ask that person to kill Vandali and then there would be no problem, that person would have cheat-like abilities created by Rod Corti himself, while Vandali had only death attribute magic and the 100 million mana contained within his empty frame. When Rod Corti analyzed the records from the merchant, it seemed that Vandali had succeeded in leveling up, but the other two curses should still be functioning with no problems. He would probably not become any stronger than that, there was no problem. Coming to this conclusion, Rod Corti turned his gaze away from Lambda. If he had searched the memories of the adventurer Luciliana who had encountered Vandali through his life dead, he might have felt a greater sense of danger. If he had made contact with the evil gods, he would likely have learned that the soul of the vampire Sir Grant had been destroyed by Vandali and made a move before the souls involved in his own system were destroyed. But instead, Rod Corti remained oblivious to the greatest mistake that he had ever made. Vlam 1 and Volume 2 Character Summary Page. Note from the author, this is an introduction of the major characters that appeared in Volumes 1 and 2 and will be making an appearance in the next volume. It is no relation to the story, so you can enjoy the third volume even without reading this, and it is quite lengthy. However, please take a look if you wish. Vandali, a damp, nearly five years old, his name on Earth was Amamiya Hiroto, and in origin his serial number was D01. He has learned to use magic of the death attribute, an attribute related to death that was undiscovered in origin when he was reincarnated there. He is a damp born between a subordinate vampire who was born as a human, and a dark elf. His appearance is that of a boy with white hair, crimson and purple heterochromatic eyes and skin as white as candle wax. Also, his ears are pointed though this is difficult to notice as they are covered by his hair, his expression doesn't change and the tone of his voice stays flat unless he makes conscious effort to change these, his eyes are constantly lifeless, like those of a dead fish, making it difficult to tell where he is looking, as a result, it is also difficult to tell what he is thinking unless one is very familiar with him, he possesses a cheat-like amount of mana, he was born with 100 million mana and it now exceeds 200 million. 
but as the only magic he can use is no attribute magic and death attribute magic, he is under the strange assumption that he cannot make the best use of that mana. Because he suffered terrible treatment at the hands of his luxury allergic uncle, he possesses a complex when it comes to luxuries. When he is told that something is owned by rich people, he desires it even if he does not need it. In addition, he has developed a mother complex since coming to Lambda. As a result of the trauma caused by Darcy's death, he feels an intense desire to kill those who attack women. He yearns to have muscles, doesn't care for monster girls or undead girls and has a sinful personality that causes him to hold unforgettable grudges against people he resents until he resolves the grudge in a way that satisfies him. He tends to prioritize his emotions and makes decisions without paying any regard to the benefits or losses to himself. He also has a soft personality. Though he is not aware of it himself, he has gone insane. He doesn't feel a shred of guilt or doubt when taking the lives of others. However, he does not particularly enjoy murder, either, as he was not blessed when it came to friends and family on earth or in origin. He has deep feelings for those he has in this world and treasures their lives. He learned various pieces of information including information regarding Japanese food from the spirits in origin, but since that information is only things he heard from them, he has struggled to reproduce Japanese food. His dream for the future is to become a muscular man that resembles a mass of male hormones. He wants to have a warm family, rich relationships with others and live an easy, luxurious life. However, Darcy's resurrection and his own vengeance must come first. Amemiya Hiroto The young man who was mistaken for the main character, appearing only in the prologue in origin. He uses cheat-like abilities such as all attributes affinity, excluding the time and death attributes, and simultaneous multicast chant revocation, grants the abilities of both chant revocation and multicast, and works internationally as the leader of those who reincarnated from Earth. He only knows of Amemiya Hiroto as, the student who was on that boat that has a similar name to me. He is unaware that Rod Corti mistakenly gave him Amemiya Hiroto's portions of cheat-like abilities and the other blessings, and that the undead that he and his companions destroyed was Amemiya Hiroto. Naru's Narumi mistook him for Amemiya Hiroto and thanked him. A misunderstanding was established and various things happened, leading to the two of them being in an intimate relationship. Incidentally, Amemiya Hiroto is very handsome. Rod Corti the god who rules over the circles of transmigration for Earth, Origin, Lambda and multiple other worlds. He is not worshipped in any world, but thoroughly maintains the transmigration systems for these worlds. From his point of view, the people in his worlds are data flowing through his system, computer bits that need to be processed, while he sees the gods of each world as people who work for the same company but in branches of other districts. Because of this, he generally views each world with indifference disguised as impartiality. But this story began when he tried to interfere with the worlds for the first time. However, the gods of each world would summarize Rod Corti's actions as unnecessary. Frelda, the god of law and fate in particular. The situation is as if he were the only remaining manager of the company trying his best to restructure it, only to have the nation certify personnel with unknown personal histories as being excellent and sending them over to him without contacting him for consultation or notification. The only one welcoming the new individuals is the goddess of life and love, Veda. Darsa, Vandali's mother. She was a female dark elf adventurer. She met Valen by coincidence while she was completing a request and fell in love at first sight. Valen was also charmed by her, and the two of them wed. In other words, she has a soft personality. She possessed D-class ability as an adventurer, using spiritual magic and archery as her weapons. After she became a spirit, perhaps because she had been burned at the stake or perhaps simply as a policy for raising her child, she stopped Vandalie from using fire for a while. However, other than that, Vandalie is mostly free to do as he likes. Darsa is under the influence of his death attribute charm, but as Vandalie doesn't disobey her, her personality is mostly as it was in life. In other words, she is also soft on her son. At first, she tried to move on to the next world for her son's sake, but now she has no desire of doing so and hints at Vandalie from time to time to make her an undead. 
the blue-flamed sword, Heinz. In chapter 1, he was 17 years old. He is now 21 years old as of chapter 51. An adventurer of commoner background, he reached B-class status in his teenage years, holding a title and serving as leader of the Five Colored Blades. He has a strong sense of justice, believing that any wall can be overcome as long as he has strength and bonds with companions that he can trust. However, at the end of chapter 2, he didn't stoop so low as to participate in the torture of Darsa who was trying to protect her own child, as he watched Darsa being burned at the stake. Without letting out a single scream, he began to doubt Elder, the god of law and fate that he had believed to be an embodiment of justice up until then, and questioned what he should do. He has now reached a class status. He turned down Earl Palpapek's offers and is now working in the Orborn Kingdom. Bormac Gordon, a high priest of the Church of Alda, the god of law and fate, and a fanatic believer, a vampire hunter who wields his war club at the forefront of battle despite having aged considerably, he has exterminated numerous vampires, and possesses prowess in combat exceeding that of inferior B class adventurers. Because of these achievements, the Cathedral of Alda in the Amid Empire has nominated him to become the Cardinal many times, but it is his principle to act where he is needed. He believes that the extermination of not only vampires but all of the new races created by the evil Vida will bring about a world full of Alda's order, leading to salvation for all. He learned of the main character's survival when he was included in the extermination force sent into the Devil's Nest Forest. As the main characters escape beyond the boundary mountain range marks the second time he has failed to exterminate him. He considers this the greatest regret of his lifetime. He is praying to Alda for a third opportunity. Bone Man An undead created when the spirits of rats that had died in the forest near of Bigia, where Vandalie was born, were placed into a skeleton that was lying on the ground for some unknown reason. As he was just one of many pawns that Vandalie used back then, he was simply named Bone Man, he possesses a loyal personality, and though he is made of rats, he has such talent that he is able to wield a sword and shield and use a bow. Considerable talent for rats, anyway. Vandalie transplanted additional spirits into him in Taylorsheim, giving him the ability to have conversations like a normal person. He considers himself to be Vandalie's first knight, possessing a chivalrous sense that causes him to feel a fiery rivalry with Ammonites. He is not good with cats, but Vandalie has ordered him not to kill or harm them without reason, so he does not lay a hand on them. As of the end of chapter 51, he is a rank 5 skeleton baron. The bones making up his body are earth dragon bones reshaped to be like human bones, so he is harder than he appears. Bone Chimera, not Chen a rank 7 monster created when Bone Monkey, Bone Wolf, Bone Bear and Bone Bird, the other undead made at the same time as Bone Man, were combined. His name, Notchen Dash which means Bone in German, was given to him afterwards. It is loyal to Vandalie, and its favorite game is to have Vandalie throw a frisbee for it to catch and then throw it back for him to go and fetch. Sam, while alive, he served as a caretaker for horses and a coachman for a certain noble family. He has a very difficult past. He was dismissed from his position in the noble family and attacked by bandits during his journey to a new land. His daughters were violated before his very eyes and then all three of them were killed. Vandali killed those responsible, and Sam swore loyalty to him as his new master. He presently occupies a carriage, and is now an undead known as a blood carriage. Perhaps because he was once an excellent coachman, he offers pleasant, comfortable rides that other blood carriages cannot compare to. His main body is the carriage, but due to his high-level spirit form skill, he is able to produce a clone of himself that resembles his body when he was alive other than having pallid skin and crimson eyes. He is even capable of eating. His hobbies include running over living creatures to kill them beneath his carriage wheels, but he is weak when it comes to reversi. His record of consecutive losses against his daughters is growing longer and longer. Saria, Sam's daughter, a young woman who was burned alive after being violated by bandits alongside her sister. She currently resides in a high leg leotard shaped suit of armor that is a magic item. She is a living magic high leg armor. Until recently, she was nothing but a suit of armor, but as she has acquired the spirit form skill, it is now possible to see her directly. 
However, she has the appearance of mist shaped like a stick figure with no outline or features. She resembles the silhouettes depicting the criminal in mystery manga, where it is difficult to determine the criminal's age or gender. Of course, she has no sex appeal or anything of the sort. Unlike her younger sister, she has a firm personality. However, she chose a halberd as her weapon and seems to possess heroic qualities as well. She has recently taken a liking to her long-range control skill, and works hard to train it. She believes her sister is joking when she tries to tempt Vandalie from time to time, including the perverse behavior she shows when she is refused. Saria's future dream is to become a slaughter maid who can clean up both dirt in the mansion and the enemies of her master, Rita. Saria's younger sister. Like her sister, she is a maid girl who met a difficult end. She presently resides in a bikini-shaped suit of armor that is a magic item. She is a living magic bikini armor. Her spirit form appearance is like her sister's. She has a bright, playful personality, but she actually also has a dark side. She chose a glaive Ive as her weapon for a simple reason, it looked strong. She is half serious when she tries to tempt her master, Vandali. The bandits that assaulted her were little more than male beasts, she has taken a liking to Vandali because he is the exact opposite of them. That is why she is aiming to increase her spirit form skill, but as she was forgotten what she looked like while she was alive, she secretly tells herself constantly, I am beautiful, I am sexy in an attempt to hypnotize herself to believe it. Zadiris, the most senior of the ghouls, currently 293 years old. However, due to Vandali having used youth transformation on her, her physical age is almost the same as her physical appearance. She has the appearance of a beautiful girl with a small build. She uses washi to refer to herself and adds no at the ends of her sentences, but perhaps due to the influence of her physical appearance, her mental age isn't as high as her real age. TLN. I've mentioned this before, but washi is a pronoun is typically used by elderly males. Similarly, the no other Zayda resents her sentences in is also typically used by elderly males. She is a hard-working person, having become a ghoul mage through considerable effort despite not being able to undergo a job change and receive bonuses to her skills. She met Vandali who reversed her aging and solved the fertility problems that ghouls faced as a race. Though she was forced to escape from her homeland, as a result she and the other ghouls moved to a more comfortable place to live where they could have more substantial diets and baths. She was even able to undergo a job change and increase her rank to become a ghoul high mage, so only good things came of it. She is very pleased that she managed to see the face of her first grandchild. She feels a great deal of gratitude to Vandali. She is training mages so that one can take her place in the next generation, in the hope of being able to follow Vandali to the Orborn Kingdom as a tamed familiar once he becomes an adventurer to build up his achievements there. She has recently taken a liking to the massage gillums that have been installed in the changing rooms of the bathhouses. Vigro. He was once supposed to become the young chief of the ghouls. He is currently serving as the chief of the ghoul warriors in Taylorsheim. He is an established individual, very popular among groups of ghoul women and respected by the young men. However, the undead titan women have also tried seducing him, and he has caused trouble for Vandali by asking for advice about various things. He has a muscle brain personality, but he has the flexibility to ask for advice from his more intelligent companions on things he doesn't understand. He considers himself to be Vandali's older brother, and he has a rivalry with Borkus, who also considers himself to be Vandali's older brother. Incidentally, he had sexual relations with Zadarus in the past, and Bastia was born as a result. However, as he only knows ghoul culture in which there is no marriage system, he believes, the past is the past, now is now. He cares for Bastia more than he would for other women, but not enough for him to tell her that he is her father. His favorite food in the past was human flesh, but now it is acorn cookies with plenty of honey poured on top. Bazdia, Zadares's daughter. She is currently a rank 5 Gulamazanas. Her physical appearance is that of a beautiful woman in her late 20s. She has a muscular, 190 cm tall body while having abundant, feminine curves. 
There are red patterns running across her entire body like tattoos that Vandaly thinks of as cool. Due to the special characteristic of the ghouls that causes their physical appearance to become fixed when they first become pregnant, she had been troubled by her infertility, but thanks to Vandaly, she successfully became pregnant and gave birth. Incidentally, the father of her child is unknown. She has liked Vandaly ever since she met him and she has promised that he will be the father of her second child once he becomes an adult. She likes men who are the strong type, and her personality leads to her pursuing strength herself. The reason she brings up the topic of child making with Vandaly from time to time is actually because she feels a risk that if she doesn't do that, he will start viewing her as an older sister replacement rather than as a woman. Bilder a ghoul woman. Her physical appearance is that of a beautiful woman with short hair in her late teenage years or early twenties. She was the reason Vandaly became aware of the ghoul's fertility problems. She is the first among the ghoul women to successfully give birth after receiving his death attribute magic treatment. Her personality is like that of a bright Nissan, and as far as abilities go, she is an average ghoul but as other ghouls have been improving their abilities, she is on the relatively low end in that regard. However, she is currently not paying any attention to that and devoting herself to raising her child. She has recently been cooperating with the other mothers, taking care of her daughter Vard and training herself in magic for several hours every day. Terra, originally a human, she is an elderly armsmith who creates equipment using monster materials. She has walked a difficult path in life. She was sold by her family and became a slave. Feeling despair and being unable to see any future for herself as she worked as a prostitute, she killed one of her customers and ran away. She entered a devil's nest to escape her pursuers, only to be captured by ghouls and turned into one of them. However, she is an indomitable, brave woman. After becoming a ghoul, she used her smithing skills to produce equipment, use techniques she had learned as a prostitute to entice the men, taught her smithing skills to the women and rose to the top of her village to rule over it. Though she holds a folding fan, has her hair in ringlet curls and speaks in an elegant tone in an attempt to appear elegant, she actually comes from a commoner background and and her actions only serve to make that apparent. She has a luxury complex second only to Vandalies. She has a strong ambition to improve her position in society, she sees herself as a king's vassal for Vandaly for some reason and devotes herself to trying to gain his favor, for this reason, she views Zadirus and Bazdia as her rivals. Hearing that Vandaly destroyed the subordinate vampire who tried to kill her, she has become even more enthralled by him. She has recently completed treatment with youth transformation, which reversed her physical age to her appearance of being less than 20 years old. She enjoys bathing in the bath houses. Incidentally, among all of the characters who have appeared up until chapter 51, she possesses a bust that competes for number one in size. Her competition is Bazdia, and if Darsa is included as well, it becomes a three way competition. Ranked fourth are Ali Nora and Mamadiga, fifth and below belong to Bilder, Kaka, and others whose sizes are not outstanding and Zadirus comes after them. Last, Aritu and Saria, who have none, Kuka, a former D-class adventurer with a difficult past. She was captured alive by Bgogan and personally raped by him to bear his children. After that, Vandaly rescued her and she fell under the effects of his death attribute charm because she had lost a hope to live and desired death. In the end, she chose to become a ghoul. She became impatient when she realized she was not progressing as quickly as the other adventurers that were her companions and that impatience continued even after she became a ghoul. However, this has been solved after Vandaly gave her some advice. She has now become accustomed to her increased physical strength as a ghoul, and is presently training in magic. Braga, a black goblin born between a goblin and one of the ghouls who were held captive as breeders in the orc village led by Bgogan. He was originally supposed to become a slave after birth, but Vandaly interfered in various ways while he was in the womb and exposed him to death attribute mana. He and his companions were born with superior intelligence and a better personality than normal goblins, so they were welcomed into the community. It has been around two years since he was born, but he has already become an adult and started living on his own. He has a good relationship with his mother, visiting her from time to time with meat that he has hunted. 
he has been taught the basics of being a scout by the undead titans Ran. After hearing stories about ninjas from Vanderly, he is currently training with the goal of becoming Lambda's first ninja. TLN, there is furigana over this that says a thief, so to speak, but the dictionary meaning I get is scout, patrol, spy and I'm pretty sure I translated something else to thief before so I'm leaving this as is. He is particularly good friends with the Anubises Zemado and Mamadiga, and the Orcus Gorba, Thomas Palpebeck, a Noel who served as the MIG Shield Nation's Marshal. He has connections to the faction of vampires led by the pure reed vampire Gabaman, who worships High Hyrush Hukaka, the evil god of joyful life. He is an abundantly talented individual in his mid-thirties. He believes that any methods should be used as long as they produce favorable results. His connection with the vampires is but one of those methods. He is resented by Vandalie as he was indirectly involved in Darsa's death. But the only information he has on Vandalie is that he leads several hundred ghouls and that he can see spirits. For this reason, Palpebeck doesn't see Vandalie as a particularly great threat. He is served by a former member of the Five Colored Blades, the Green Wind Spear Riley, who is also Vandalie's enemy. Nuaza, a young man who was an apprentice priest warrior in the Church of Veda in Taylorsheim. After dying, he became a lesser lich with a mummy-like appearance, being made of only skin and bones. Because of this, he appears to be an elderly person at first glance. However, back then, he was stronger physically than with magic, and not very much like a lich, though he was not particularly religious in life. He became fanatically so after becoming an undead upon receiving a prophecy. Through the power of religion, he became one of the key individuals among the undead titans. He believes Vandalie to be the prophesied holy son and the second coming of the vampire's ancestor while making no attempt to certify these facts. He has become a rank 5 lich as a result of Vandalie's training, and is continuing to become more and more of a fanatic. Borcus an A-class adventurer bearing the title of Sword King in life, weakened upon becoming an undead and currently a rank 9 zombie hero. He is a little over 3 meters tall, and has a characteristic appearance of being bald with one side of his face being only a skull. He has a rough but helpful personality and eats and drinks a lot. He is the embodiment of a titan man, and was idolized when he was alive. However, he had a daughter who apparently saw him as a simple doting parent. Because he can now gain experience points simply by devouring the meat of creatures that he kills, he thinks, being a zombie isn't so bad. He competes with Vigro for the position of being Vandalie's older brother. He feels no shame in frequently creating easy-to-understand schemes to try and make Vandalie sit on Taylor Shime's throne and marry the second princess Zandia of whom only a severed hand is left without the permission of Zandia herself. Poor Vina, the spirit of a fresh female corpse that Viscount Balchus prepared in order for the life attribute mage adventurer Luciliana to turn into a live dead and scout the orc village. Her name and personal history are unknown. She herself has forgotten most of her previous life. Thanks to Vanderly, she was reborn as a half-noble orc. Though she has a face resembling the one she had in her previous life, she was born with golden hair and the ears and tail of a pig. As of chapter 51, she is a year and a half old. But as noble orc blood runs in her veins, she is developing quickly and has reached the size of a three or four year old. However, the size of her body has already surpassed that of Vandalie who is almost five years old. If she continues at this pace, it can be expected that she will become over two meters tall. But like Dampers, she is more like a person in nature, so there is no rank on her status. She is emotionally attached to Vandalie and has taken a liking to throwing him in the air. Eleonora, a noble-born rank 8 vampire baroness. A beautiful woman around 20 years of age, she has a height of around 170 centimeters, long red hair, a beautiful face that looks strict at first glance and a well-defined figure, she had a difficult past, as a human, she was sold by her family around the time she became old enough to know what was going on in the world around her, and then was sold to the mines as nobody wanted to buy her due to the black skin she had at the time. There. She was taken in by Burkine after he saw that she had an affinity for the time attribute, and as a result of surviving the cruel environment she was placed in with other children with similar backgrounds, 
she became a noble-born vampire. Not even ten years have passed since she became a vampire, but even so, she is a talented individual who has acquired the unique skill charming demon eyes, with ability surpassing Sir Krent, who had been a vampire for more than a century. She has a calm, pragmatic personality, but she is essentially a coward. She is under the influence of death attribute charm, and even acknowledges Vandalie as the most fearsome existence in the world due to his ability to break souls. Believing that she could feel at ease being in his service, she changed sides. Though she is not really aware of it herself, she is clingy and, contrary to what her appearance may suggest, has some masochistic tendencies. When Vandalie tried to remove the piercing in her tongue that is a sign of her loyalty, she cried in protest. Because of her skill set, she is more adept in covert movements than in direct combat, because she is a noble-born vampire that her vampire parent Burkine created hastily. She has not acquired some skills that she should possess already. Burkine, a pure-reed vampire who has lived for over a hundred thousand years, he turned his back on the goddess Veda and the vampire ancestor who were defeated by Alda, the god of law and fate. He worships the evil god of joyful life Hi Hirish Hukaka, creates evil schemes and indulges in repulsive pleasures. His appearance is that of an eloquent, pleasant young man and his behavior is elegant. He could pass for a young nobleman if he does not show his fangs. In fact, his normal behavior is much more decent than that of the other pureed vampires. He always shows his face at the meetings that occur once a year and often decides where they are held. However, his true personality is one that desires to monopolize and rule over things, and he is so hot-tempered that if he becomes mad with rage, he can rampage haphazardly and be out of control for up to ten days straight. His main hobby is torture, but the thing he enjoys the most is to discover and raise superior individuals and then gradually destroy them with his own hands. Several slave traders and orphanages are under his control without being aware of this. He was outraged when Vandalie stole his new favorite, Eleonora, but he has cleared his head after going on a rampage and now no longer holds any grudge towards him. He is now more concerned and curious about why the evil god would go as far as to personally send a divine message instructing the vampires to kill the Dambra. Ternisha, one of the pure reed vampires, her appearance is that of a woman in her mid-twenties with a well-featured, beautiful face and an excessive amount of sex appeal, but her vulgar, violent behavior often gives off the impression that she is a prostitute from some run-down district. Her personality is just as short-tempered and violent as her behavior would suggest. She is not incapable of being calm, but she does not hold back her emotions as long as she sees no need to do so. As a result, she disposes of her own subordinates most frequently among the three pureed vampires. Due to the divine protection of the evil god of joyful life, she is able to turn corpses into undead and control them. She feels a sense of superiority from doing so, and it has already surpassed being a hobby, being more in the realms of being an addiction. Her recent themes have been parent and child and families, so she is indulging in the wicked pastime of sewing the corpses of twins brothers and sisters together to create a single zombie. She has recently been hit with a twisted inspiration and now desires to use the grey-brown skin of the ghouls in her work. Gubberman, one of the pure reed vampires, his appearance is that of an old man who looks like a withered tree, featuring large, staring eyes and an abundant beard. His personality is as eccentric as his appearance. He shows little interest in things outside of his own hobbies. Because of this, the management of his subordinates is sloppy and this is one of the reasons the damp Vandalie was able to survive. He is the one who turned Vandalie's father, Valen, into a subordinate vampire, and used him as a convenient spy who could move around during the day. However, again due to the poor management of his subordinates, not only did he not notice the relationship between Valen and Darsa until they eloped, but he told the other subordinates who tried to warn him not to interfere with his hobby and killed them with his bare hands without listening to them. However, since he is completely indifferent towards his subordinates as long as they do not interfere with his hobby, those in his faction had the highest survival rate. Until recently, the hobby of his lifetime is to turn the corpses of heroes into undead and collect them. He has stolen the corpses of some of Taylor Shime's heroes, 
the Saint Gina and the tiny genius Zandia, and turned them into undead. He is also thinking of turning Vandali into an undead once he is killed. Note from the author, the green wind Spirali appears frequently in the third volume, so please stay tuned for his appearance.